water is there after the rain last night. Of physics here. Um, so our speaker, uh, first speaker today is uh, Philip Fong. Uh, he's from uh, ECE department from this university southeast of us. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Philip uh, has done a lot of interesting work uh, on using 2D materials for uh, NEMS devices, and I assume that's what he's going to talk about today. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And thank you, Mike, and uh, Steve, and all of you for organizing this very important workshop for Florida. And, sorry. There's some calendar reminder popping up. <laughs> it doesn't come up on here. I have to kill that. So, so, for giving me this opportunity to speak here. It's uh, good morning, everyone. It's really my uh, privilege and pleasure to meet you here and to give you a report on what we have been doing in 
electrical engineering and a little bit beyond electrical and computer engineer at UF. Um, I just represent, uh, first I try to talk about my own research and then I will expand to talk about uh, what uh, a multidisciplinary effort at UF has been directed toward the quantum engineering research and ed education and open up for discussions with you mostly. We hope to connect with you and create uh, future collaborations in Florida. And not limited to Florida. We need partners from uh, Northeast, like from people like Kyle. <laughs> and a little bit about the background, uh, why uh, transducers are relevant for quantum science and quantum engineering. <coughs> I'll step back because we have a lot of uh, physicists and chemists here in this audience, or including online. Everything moves that we can agree on, right? And in, as small as uh, molecules, uh, what Mike has been doing, as large as galaxies, there's a lot of motions. But I want to just focus on this one tone. In all these motions, the dynamic, collective motions of all the atoms or elements in that system together are fundamentally important and ubiquitous. We are mostly looking at this collective motion. Collective motions are resonant mode, can exist in molecules and also very large systems, right? As small as a molecule like a C60 buckyball, its coherent uh, mechanical motion, breathing mode, so the buckyball is becoming larger or smaller, can be coupled to the transport of a nanoscale transistor called a single electron transistor. This motion can be leveraged to mod modulate the, the channel conductance. So this is an interesting electromechanical system. As large as stars, planets, and galaxy, following Einstein's general relativity, this collective motion or the modes actually defines our time at different uh, stars, right? The times uh, of different planets are different. So that's from a large picture of uh, physics perspective. And now zooming to a little bit into what uh, the field I came from, we work on transducers. Transducers are now give human beings a lot more control. That means we can use engineering methods established in recent hundred years to, to design, manufacture, test, integrate, assemble systems that can perform functions that we want the system to do. Specifically, uh, important transducers today include something called resonant microelectromechanical systems. I'm holding my phone to count time, but in this device you have many interesting resonant MEMS devices that's doing your signal processing uh, all the time. You have like a dozen of filters in this type of device, and the, the timing of this device in a GPS denied environment really will give you uh, uh, navigation positioning in combination with other MEMS devices in this device called accelerometers, gyroscope. You also have a bunch of this type of devices in your car. So the first MEMS device was actually indeed already a resonator. Showing here, it is a two kilohertz resonant gate transistor. Basically, it's a, it's a, it's a gate that's a mechanical gate overhanging the source and drain channel and vibrating. But this two kilohertz mechanical motion was used to modulate the conductance, transconductance of the transistor that was done by uh, researchers like Harvey Nathanson, uh, who just passed away during the pandemic, at, his work was done in 1965 at Westinghouse in Pittsburgh. And you can see, if you look at the parallel uh, timelines I draw here on this slide, this is uh, a very interest. This was a very interesting time. It's overlapping with the birth of integrated circuit 
uh, Jack Kilby, Bob Noyce, independently, simultaneously almost, around 1960, uh, developed the first integrated uh, circuit that uh, inspired uh, the prediction of Gordon Moore's paper, uh, later established as Moore's Law. And then this also was following, in the physics domain, uh, Richard Feynman's lecture, there's plenty of, time, uh, plenty of uh, room at the bottom. Now many of my circuit friends and architecture friends are saying there's plenty of room in the middle. Uh, not only, oh, the, some of them even say there's no longer plenty of room at the bottom. The more room in the middle. <laughs> so at that time, the question and driver for this field is how to develop a miniaturized tuning method to tune or frequency control your integrated circuit so that your integrated circuit can have frequency selectivity. To do that, you use this micromechanics because they can offer a miniaturized system much better than inductors and capacitors to give you high quality factor, uh, which is built upon high coherence collective mode of mechanical motion. Basically, the atoms and molecules in this mechanical structure moving together, but this type of motion can sustain very long ring down time, uh, suffer from less dissipation compared to other conventional electronic, uh, all electrical components. So this inspired a bullish uh, several decades of development of micro-machining leveraging the semiconductor manufacturing technologies, mostly lithography and etching. So you can actually pattern um, suspended or mechanically movable and resonant mode uh, rich type of devices on chip. So this further led to many startup companies. Uh, a lot of them now, uh, like Avago, now Skyworks, uh, Broadcom, producing uh, acoustic signal processing devices in, in your portable electronics. And in parallel, in the physics world, uh, Feynman actually re revisited his lecture in 1983 at the JPL to talk about infinitesimal machinery inspiring people about the fundamental limit toward miniaturization and the fusion of the physical world and the cyber world, basically in this uh, highly miniaturized structures, how to encode information by using uh, mesoscopic physics. So along that line, there is a parallel story. The, the story I told you in the previous slide was engineer's story of MEMS transducers. The story I'm going to tell you in this slide is, is more like a condensed matter physicist story of uh, nano or micro electromechanical transducers. Early in 1980s, in Bell Labs, people were looking at uh, quantum transport in so-called quantum wires. You can see these are early days of sub-50 nanometer, some down to sub-10 nanometer quantum wires patterned by back then the best e electron beam lithography structures. They were trying to measure electron transport to make uh, single electron transport measurement in this type of devices, but suffer from uh, phonon um, electron coupling. And that also inspired people to look at the phonon transport in this type of structures. But soon people realized it is very meaningful or very interesting to remove the substrate so that you make this quantum wires freestanding. The quantum wires freestanding, you will at least remove the heat dissipation to the substrate and then you can confine the phonon transport in, in this one dimension. And this led to a lot of interesting work uh, in marrying phonon transport in these uh, uh, nanostructures. Simultaneously, uh, removing the substrate, suspending the structures enables mechanical degrees of freedom in this type of structure, and then people can excite very high frequency mode in this type of structures because uh, they are very small uh, nanoscale devices. So this has led uh, some of uh, 
many people's work, including myself, during uh, PhD and postdoc work in really pushing to realize ultra high frequency to gigahertz mechanical resonance mode by using hard or very uh, strong materials like silicon carbide and diamond. So the question at along this direction was really to, for physicists in this field, was to drive or realize ultra high frequency and gigahertz nano electromechanical resonators so that this macroscopic device, because the device still contains billions of atoms, but will behave like one atom, one artificial atom, so that this type of structures can be directly employed as a quantum object. So this is under the, the vision called putting mechanics into quantum mechanics. This is a very influential article written by uh, Michael Lucas and Keith Rob at that time. So now there's an even golden conference called uh, Mechanical Systems in a Quantum Regime. Uh, it's already like 10 plus years uh, in representing the latest advancement in this field. So my own research in the past 15 years has mostly been uh, trying to bridge physics uh, apply physics and engineering by using electromechanical devices and systems while adopting new materials in this field. Uh, so counting from here, we have a few thrust in my, in my research group. Uh, roughly a half of the group is working on uh, electromechanical devices enabled by atomic layer, uh, 2D materials and heterostructures, and roughly another half of the group working on a wide band gap materials, mostly silicon carbide, aluminum nitride, aluminum scandium nitride enabled electromechanical and optomechanical systems. And then on top of the device engineering, we also seek to uh, integrate with state of the art integrated circuit based on CMOS mm -hmm. and the photonic integrated circuit. So we have some higher TRL level uh, projects that's for the integration. In recent years, since 2016, uh, we have also used some of this device platform to, to engineer atomic, uh, artificial at atomic systems for uh, doing quantum engineering, but hoping to do mostly toward the chip scale. So for example, if we zoom in to thrust two, that's silicon carbide plus uh, wide band gap materials. Uh, in recent 10 years, we have multiple PhD student graduates from different projects, ranging from silicon carbide for harsh environment device and sensors for cancer cell study and for optical metrology, because silicon carbide is an interesting optical and nonlinear optical material where we use uh, silicon carbide nano machining to enable chip scale optomechanical and photonic devices and collaborating with uh, uh, color center physics groups to enable quantum information processing element on a chip using silicon carbide thin film on uh, uh, silicon. So after that introduction, I will give a few examples toward uh, from my group and collaborators uh, engineering devices for mostly toward miniaturization of today's quantum systems. And uh, this mostly include uh, a silicon carbide boronitride device for cavity QED, a phononic waveguide, and also uh, a proposal for uh, making a quantum harmonic, aharmonic oscillator by using a NAMS resonator. So today, uh, it is very uh, encouraging and inspiring that uh, quantum supremacy, as illustrated in this diagram, this diagram, this diagram is based on some computer architecture research results. Uh, what's showing in a blue curve, solid blue curve, is classical computing uh, in terms of computation time versus number of uh, size of the problem. 
And the dashed line shows if we continue Moore's law, uh, today's classical computer can get better, but it's still on a similar trend. But in solving certain problems as Google and other USTC in China and IBM and others have been showing that you saw in certain type of uh, problems, quantum computer already beat classical computer, set into a disruptive uh, new curve uh, showing by the red curves. The solid line represents today's quantum computing capability in solving that type of problem but with limited number of qubits. If we scale up the number of qubits, it will go through th this trend, further lowering the computation time. Um, of course, this is only looking at the time. Uh, it does not consider the, the power and other resources required, because this is a quantum workshop. I think I can conveniently skip the details of the benefit of, uh, to the society that uh, quantum technologies are promising. These are mostly the, the promises. It's not really harvested yet. It's interesting, some people in Florida was talking, uh, can we use quantum machine to simulate uh, weather in Florida to mitigate or prevent, uh, I mean, at least predict and mitigate the impact of uh, uh, hurricanes, for example. That would be great, I think, relevant for uh, this state. So today, quantum computer and even supremacy is already uh, uh, existence. Some of my colleagues uh, from uh, the core, I think, similar background maybe with our next speaker, uh, Kyle, from RISI on BBN was telling me, uh, superconducting qubits based on uh, Joseph's injunction and this uh, transmog qubits are, are the transistors of today. That's a... Uh, very interesting uh, uh, viewpoint. Today's quantum systems, for example, superconducting con uh, computer, we can see the pictures compared with ENIAC. They are very similar. So some people also say uh, today's quantum computing devices are like vacuum tubes of that time. So what, is it like transistors of that time, or it is like vacuum tubes of that time? And for engineers like us in the electrical uh, computer engineering department, uh, either by very creative ideas or by brute force or by a combination, we are always tasked to do miniaturization, like I mentioned <coughs> earlier, to put everything in on trip if possible and uh, build integrated uh, smaller systems. So naively, uh, if we could be inspired by the previous revolution of uh, miniaturization of ENIAC into uh, personal computer in the 1980s, uh, today's portable devices that are even higher performance, even more miniaturized than the PCs. And we should uh, have the courage to think at least how to shrink today's quantum computers into portable or smaller desktop systems. So the overarching goal for electrical engineers uh, and computer engineers are to reduce the requirement in the operating temperature, a vacuum, and hardware peripheral systems that are bulky today, and also increase the level of miniaturization and uh, integration so that we can move today's system from the left, uh, lower left range in this plot, in this diagram, to the upper left, upper, upper right direction. So that's a goal. We think that's possible. We think the essence of the second quantum revolution is really about engineering devices and systems into quantum regimes. The first quantum revolution laid the foundation, but with uh, less experimental advancement. And in today's uh, electron uh, photonic devices, we rarely use the intrinsic quantum properties in our signal processing devices. 
The second quantum revolution is really about how to fully utilize human-made structures and devices that obey, obeys quantum mechanics. And uh, how to put a lot of such devices that already obey quantum mechanics on chip and retain their quantum properties. So uh, if I remove that block in my slide, you can see the encouraging uh, news is that over the past uh, several decades, in uh, electromechanical trans transducers, in optomechanical transducers, and in other systems, people have already made many candidates that are functioning uh, as human-made devices but obey quantum mechanics in certain conditions. So to sum, s sum it up, all these different modalities uh, are artificial atoms in different frequency uh, ranges. If you look at uh, Mother Nature enabled atoms and uh, trapped ions, their energy diagram look like this, their emission spectrum look like this. They're mostly in terahertz optical domains. So we use laser to uh, manipulate an interface with this type of quantum objects. Superconducting qubits, mostly in tens or maybe even higher or fewer, a few gigahertz to tens of gigahertz. This is their atomic, arti as an artificial atom, a superconducting loop has emission lines like this. They are already made with uh, uh, effective quality factors probably higher than million or 10 million, gives them significant, uh, significantly long enough and much. There's a Morse law of coherent time for, for superconducting qubits. I think uh, Sholkov's uh, talk has that. And then in parallel, but at lower frequency, if you look at the megahertz range or sometimes the gigahertz uh, range as well, we have electromechanical transducers that also function as artificial atoms. So this is why uh, people from my uh, field are still relevant, because these transducers can work as translators between optical photon, microwave photon, and between disparate quantum elements in a quantum circuit uh, and future integrated quantum systems. If you look at the solid state, inverse atoms, basically uh, defect center based uh, single photon emitters that can be engineered into room temperature quantum qubit candidates, we have been examining diamond, which have already been heavily studied, and silicon carbide, which we have a lot of device platform, and boronitride. So in recent years, we have mostly been working on silicon carbide and boronitride uh, color centers to enable room temperature uh, quantum information processing devices. So this, show, this cartoon shows our uh, dream systems in the uh, coming years. Some of, a lot of these are not fully realized yet. We're just starting to build um, individual compon components that will lead to this uh, uh, chip scale quantum processing uh, system. This includes quantum emitters that, are, that will be the quantum uh, source that also needs to be enhanced many, in many occasions by cavities, so we need to build uh, uh, photonic device that work as cavities. The cavities and the, the quantum emitters needs to be integrated, so we can have cavity enhanced uh, QED type of operation. And then uh, on a circuit level, we need uh, optical fiber, optical chip to fiber interconnect that needs to have good coherence and also photonic waveguide and a phononic waveguide uh, as a mediator. So we, if we've came a long way since uh, a decade ago. We have been working with several groups uh, funded by NSF's, uh, I think the precursor of Quantum Leap project uh, program in NSF, looking at using silicon carbides, nonlinear photonics, and the quant 
color center properties to develop di rudimentary device platforms, uh, micro disk uh, resonators and uh, ring resonators, photonic crystal cavity resonators based on silicon carbide. So this type of effort in earlier projects paved the way for manufacturing process development of this type of devices. And also, uh, another promising or encouraging message from the earlier effort was that silicon carbide's major industry-compatible uh, polytypes, 4-H silicon carbide, 3-C silicon carbide, both offered room temperature coherence as shown in this Rabi oscillation uh, measurement uh, in this uh, ODMR. Our 3C film uh, in this collaboration with David Arshlom's group uh, was the only system among the materials from Japan, Europe that enabled this type of uh, Rabi oscillation coherence measurement at room temperature. And this diagram shows this uh, typical defect centers in silicon carbide, and this, uh, this colored picture actually shows this uh, focus ion beam or ion plantation enabled uh, intentionally planted color centers. Uh, I should point out that in this device, most of these uh, color centers are not individual uh, defects. They are still ensembles of defects. So build upon that type of work, we have uh, you, we have been in collaboration with Air Force Research Lab in developing wafer scale single crystal 3C silicon carbide on insulator platform because in many of these photonic devices, they actually don't want single crystal silicon carbide on top of silicon substrate. They want a silicon oxide to, to confine the, the optics mode more in the silicon carbide domain to prevent the leakage of optical mode going down to the bottom silicon. So that's why, but this is incompatible with the, uh, the, the film growth uh, system. We cannot grow single crystal high quality silicon carbide directly on oxide. That's why we need a wafer scale bonding and uh, etching process to enable silicon carbide on uh, insulator. And then from the earlier research result, we, we seek to find a method to in, integrate those color centers now on top of or somewhere on this micro RAM device. So first we do material level characterization. Now after we identify those color centers, we really need to actually intentionally make the color centers onto this micro RAM and then put them into a optical circuit. So we have done quite a lot of design uh, work in this uh, domain. And you can see here, I remind you this uh, optical transition from this silicon carbide center of interest is about 11, 10 nanometer, 11, 100, 10 nanometer. And we do this uh, dispersion relationship calculation and we can design the micro ring radius there are a lot of technical details. I will only speak to the key point to keep the flow going. And then imagine we have that color center onto this micro ring. In the cavity QED language, that micro ring is now this cavity. That color center is a two level system inside the cavity. Our earlier comprehensive calculation was focused on computing all the cavity QED important parameters, including the decay rate and the coupling and the defacing rate uh, from the emission of the two-level system. And we have found by tuning or designing different uh, diameters of the micro ring based on our materials calibration of the silicon carbide uh, oxide platform with a radius around two and higher, two micron and higher, we can realize good uh, cavity QED uh, performance or coupling. So this device is now in collaboration with Rochester uh, and Air Force is still in progress of 
uh, making. And we also have proposed using this silicon carbide platform doing cavity-enhanced cavity enhanced second harmonic generation and cavity and different frequency generation because the the quantum emitters uh, wavelength is not naturally always matched to this optical fiber, which is 50, 50 uh, nanometer uh, transmission wavelength. So in order to match that, not just for silicon carbide system, very many quantum, uh, quantum uh, optical emitter system need this frequency conversion. So this color-coded <laughs> cascade of devices just illustrate how we do the frequency translation on chip by using uh, the nonlinear properties of silicon carbide to enable on chip nonlinear photonic devices to do the translation of uh, input and output, but using the, the device quantum emission wavelength that's different, that's at 11, 10 nanometer. And we also build single photon characterization system <coughs> to look at uh, quantum emitters in less mature materials. These are more emerging materials like uh, 2D flakes of boronitride. Boronitride is less mature than silicon carbide. Silicon carbide is less mature than diamond in this uh, uh, understanding of their uh, color center based uh, uh, quantum emitters. So this shows luminescence and uh, quantum emission line that in our home build uh, optical single photon characterization measurement, and we could do this uh, uh, well-known time correlation measurement uh, for this uh, second order correlation function. When this correlation function goes below 0.5, it's a signature of uh, individual photon, uh, sorry, individual photon emission. And we have identified many of such uh, quantum emitters in our boronitride devices. And these line widths of the emission lines are on par with what's limiting, uh, what's reported in literature, the full width half maximum. The challenge is that um, this could be similar to some of the defects, but silicon carbide defects is already known. Diamond is also well known and established. The mechanism of silicon uh, boronitride uh, col color center emissions, their emission lines are invisible range, but sometimes at different wavelengths. So the atomic nature of such emissions are still being proposed and studied in literature. So for example, these are four characteristic different uh, emission lines we measured in our system. And we counted actually many with, their, uh, with different counts at different wavelengths. We also have done similar designs for this type of cavity QED system with, with quantum emitters uh, enhanced by cavity based on the boronitride platform. And using both silicon carbide and uh, boronitride, we have engineered phononic waveguide devices. This shows the phononic wave number versus frequency. So this is 90 degree rotated dispersion curve, but you can see the band, band gap. And then in the frequency response, you can see the band gap, uh, acoustic or phononic band gap is blocking the transmission of selected uh, frequency signal. So these are interesting or useful for the future uh, defect center based integrated hybrid quantum system because we need not only photonic waveguide and also uh, we need a phononic waveguide and a strain engineering to tune the different quantum emitters so that they can align. Also in blue and red detuned systems, we always need a coherent uh, operation. This is very similar to Raman system. We need a coherent coordination between the pumping laser and the device phononic mode and the phononic transmission so that uh, 
the extra energy from the photon excitation can either go enhance the photon mode or absorb a photon mode. What's shown here is the on-chip quantum emitter enabled network with a phononic waveguide. And the green side shows that if the drive laser match the phonon uh, passband phonon mode, you can actually do coherent transfer. And the quantum state in long-lived spin state can be converted into propagating phonon wave packet and transfer by the phononic crystal waveguide. And then when it does not match, and you can design a stop band phononic crystal here, it can be it can be stopped. Uh, so these phonic transducers can work as a, a translator between two level systems that are in different uh, modalities and also enable mechanical cavities that can also interface with microwave cavity through optomechanics. This is also well known uh, because we already have microwave acoustics and we also have optomechanics. So these are where mechanical systems can play a role. And we have another uh, example from my group, but I will skip that. This is basically mimicking the Josephson Junction's strong nonlinearity to define, to use mechanical nonlinearity to define a potential all mechanical, electromechanical, uh, quantum aharmonic oscillator as a qubit device. The the attraction of this is really to miniaturize the today's qubit. So I'll skip the details, but we can see that the aharmonic uh, resonator-based device can be within just a submicron footprint, but it, it offers this uh, energy landscape or ladders that are aharmonic. The last couple minutes, I will quickly scan the quantum engineering research and education effort at the University of Florida. The mission is to establish uh, a node in the national future national hub of quantum. Right now, as my Caltech friend said, uh, Florida could be an oasis of a, uh, a low temperature, high ma magnetic field, and, uh, and a dilution fridge but it's a desert of qubits. Um, let's just <laughs> sink in. Now, if you look at the uh, National Science Foundation website published NSF Quantum Leap programs, it looks as if we are intentionally skipped. And uh, so the, the elephant in the living room is how we keep up to make sure that in the future, we have a node that has sufficient uh, amount of qubits work that's in the hard core of the quantum research. So in UF, uh, shortly after I joined, we, we built a working group. They had the internal quantum moonshot uh, program with funding allocated, but immediately suspended in March 2020. We were top one candidates selected internally, but this program never came back because of pandemic. And then we were also seeking uh, outside funding. So one example is early days, uh, 2021, we built a team with leading institutions like University of Chicago, because you have had a long, uh, strong uh, collective or critical mass in Internet of Things. We were translating or linking classical sensing node, hopefully with quantum enabled transducers and qubits. So the warm color system shows the room temperature, the proposed room temperature network that's above the ground. The blue or cold color shows the qubits related quantum systems. Of course, this needs a lot of uh, quantum interconnect. Uh, optical counterpart of this proposed system and this exercise really helped us collect a lot of internal expertise in this vertical stack, counting from the bottom quantum materials and all the way to uh, systems and network communication software engineering. 
this was not funded. And <laughs> we are keep doing this uh, homework. So from a system perspective, in Florida, looking at the vertical stack, we have uh, expertise in all this vertical stack. And I'll put it horizontally. If there are names in these diagrams look familiar to you, or uh, some people you know them already, please talk to me and I can make the connections. And our goal is to collect our strengths from UF, FSU, and other universities around, and develop research and workforce programs, and to, to hope hopefully promote uh, Florida quantum research effort. With that, I want to thank the funding agency uh, from recent years, and also uh, we are recruiting, including faculty to graduate students. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> so, so it seems like it's Thank you for that. Um, maybe we could have time for a couple of quick questions. Yes. Thank you for the nice uh, question. Um, I have a, thanks for the nice talk. I have a very naive question. Um, yes. So you talked about uh, moving towards mechanical system based recruitment. Um, I guess you probably need to cool it down to a single phone number level. Yes. So what is the strategy for doing that? That is still requires now, uh, that is still requires, uh, based on our calculation, cryogenic cooling, yeah. Uh, it, but the benefit is it will be much smaller. So how, how low the temperature is? You can go like 50 minute count. Yeah. Yes. So I'm intrigued about the silicon carbide results, the, the color centers. So the color centers, you show it have spins and they have a long coherence. Yes. But you have, for quantum correction, you want to have some coupling Right. So, are they randomly distributed, or can you put them in specific locations to couple them in a specific way? Right now, uh, they can be put together by using very gentle ion beams, uh, like implantation. But uh, it's still hard. I think Sandia and MIT, Harvard, they have been doing. Uh, I'm not sure if they can do individual, but ensemble is fun. Ensembles of the defect centers, not so not so one a defect. So you expect this to bring quantum computation? If it was this was achieved, could you bring it to room temperature? That's this right. is room temperature. Yeah. But are the coherence times comparable to? Uh, the coherence time is still much better at uh, low temperature, but you don't need milli Kelvin. Let's say four Kelvin, you already have very good coherence time. But the coherence time will will degrade if you relax the temperature to room temperature. But room temperature, you still have, I think, nanosecond. All right, I think we should move on. Uh, we have a long uh, coffee break, so we can follow up. Uh, you will the presentation. Let's thank Philip again. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is uh, uh, Kyle. Uh, and Kyle was actually a, a student here, just so he's you need one of us. Thank you so much. Uh, he was an undergrad uh, in physics and mathematics. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. That's right. And I think uh, he did some research on his theory now. So now he's at uh, uh, MIT Lincoln Labs. Uh, so and he's going to talk about uh, enhancing the performance of a superconducting qubits. Right. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Is uh, is the Zoom going to bother people? I feel like that's that might be. Uh, the start is good. It'll go. Away. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the for the introduction. Um, uh, yeah, like like was mentioned, my name is Kyle Cerniak. Uh, I come from MIT Lincoln Laboratory. I also spend a couple days a week down at MIT campus in the group of Will Oliver, this engineering quantum systems group. And today I'll talk to you about just a subset of the work that we're doing uh, across these teams. Um, it's a big team uh, between the two labs. Oops, <laughs> the spoilers. Uh, it's a big team between the two, two labs, uh, a big research effort at MIT Lincoln Lab. 
uh, of a bunch of permanent <coughs> staff scientists of, of varying you know, education and, and expertise. Um, and, then, and then a handful, maybe 20 graduate students and about eight postdocs uh, at MIT. Um, yeah, as Peng mentioned, I was a student here. Uh, I would be remiss not to, to have a slide uh, thanking at least you know, some, some of you who are in the room uh, for, for sort of putting me on this path uh, uh, of academic research. Uh, as proof, this is my dog Jack, uh, hanging out with, with Paul Dirac. Uh, he was only like four months old at that time. Uh, this is me and Ashley, maybe some of you remember Ashley at some poster <coughs> ceremony, I don't know. Uh, I think it was right when we graduated. And, uh, and, and yeah, I worked with Yerinoki Rescue in the Columbus Dynamics Lab. Uh, that's what it looked like. Uh, so yeah, thanks, thanks to, to a lot of people. Um, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to be back. So, uh, superconducting qubits. Um, Philip gave an excellent introduction to quantum computing, sort of why and how uh, many, many folks are, are approaching it. Um, so this talk will mainly focus on kind of the hardware, the physics of superconducting qubits. Um, so feel free to interrupt me at any point. I'm happy to take questions. Um, and sort of at the, at, the heart of, at the heart of this field is a, is a simple question of whether an electrical circuit, you know, like we talk about in our, in our phones, our computers, uh, you know, you can make it in, a, in an undergrad physics lab, uh, can it behave quantum mechanically? Um, and maybe, maybe it's not such a, such a jump to, to say that uh, you can certainly you know, go through the machinery of writing down you know, a Hamiltonian from a classical Lagrangian of, a, of an electrical circuit. Um, and the question is whether there will be this classical to quantum correspondence given you know, that the right uh, conditions are met. Um, for superconducting quantum circuits, uh, really what you need to do is cool it down to low temperature to freeze out all of the, uh, the electronic degrees of freedom, single electron degrees of freedom, um, which gives superconductors very, very little dissipation, even at microwave frequencies that superconducting qubits are operated. Um, and so uh, this is a figure that I like showing to, to sort of illustrate this, uh, because it's, it also harkens back to things that you learn in a class that uh, sort of a driven harmonic oscillator the, the steady state solutions of that are uh, these coherent states. And coherent states have a Poisson distributed uh, population of, of photon number or, or Fox state number uh, that, that comprise them. And this is exactly showing that, uh, that Poisson distribution of photon number states in a driven harmonic oscillator uh, via some two-tone spectroscopy techniques coupled to a qubit, you know, some, some subtleties there. But what this is showing is exactly this, that you can resolve the photon number states, that the dissipate, intrinsic dissipation of the system is, is low enough to where you can actually see these quantum effects. Um, and so many, many years before this particular experiment, uh, this question was, was answered in the affirmative uh, in showing that the phase degree of freedom of the macroscopic superconducting wave function uh, can indeed behave quantum. And that's what all this is built on. Um, we can go into a little bit more detail. I won't walk through all of the math. I don't think it's, it's, it's valuable for, for y'all, but, but just to say that um, there, is a, there is a framework uh, of circuit quantization that, that you can go through for any, any circuit that you wish to consider, uh, that you can construct, um, and, and you know, making appropriate substitutions uh, to get into dimensionless units, like we, we like to use as physicists, uh, we routinely write down Hamiltonians in various bases and, and, uh, and solve them, okay? And so um, many, many people liken uh, superconducting qubits to these LC oscillators, uh, but there's another component uh, that's really critical for operation of basically any superconducting qubit, which is a Josephson junction. Uh, Josephson junction is, is uh, some superconducting weak link uh, that effectively has some nonlinear uh, current phase relation. Um, this sinusoidal current phase relation is what people typically think of uh, for tunnel junction based uh, Josephson junctions, typically constructed with a superconductor insulator superconductor uh, heterostructure. Um, and what that does is it changes the, the, the potential uh, of, of the Hamiltonian uh, and adds some nonlinearity to it. Um, instead of it being a, a perfect uh, parabolic potential as arising from, from this inductor, uh, you actually get a cosine, uh, which sort of bends away from this, from this parabolic uh, uh, scheme. 
And what that serves to do is change the spacing between adjacent uh, energy levels in the circuit, uh, which allows you to address them separately uh, from each other. And that's, that's critical for controlling the state of um, these circuits. And uh, something, something that's really worth uh, mentioning here is that this very, very simple circuit, just the Josephson junction with some shunting capacitance, is kind of the backbone of our entire field right now. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's called the transmon qubit. Uh, it's gone through evolutions over the years. Different parameter regimes have been engineered to, uh, to mitigate certain types of decoherence. Um, but, but in essence, we're using really technology from 25 years ago. Um, and sort of the, the, the key features there are that there are some Hamiltonian that you can write down uh, with some quantum mechanical degrees of freedom and also some classical parameters. Those classical parameters are really, really useful uh, when it comes to controlling uh, the circuits and, and, and changing their states. Okay? And so uh, the field as it stands today, uh, there's a lot of optimism is, is maybe one way to say it. Um, Folks are moving toward increasingly complex superconducting quantum processors. This was something that Philip uh, uh, described in, in pretty great detail. Um, but I'll, I'll mention that it's it's both academic groups that are kind of going to these larger scale systems, which is which is interesting. That says something about the accessibility of, of this technology, this hardware platform. Um, but also, you know, massive uh, massive uh, corporations like Google, IBM uh, are also really leading the way with um, uh, you know toward let's say utility scale um, on processors based on superconducting qubits. Um, and uh, the reasoning for this is just people, people are encouraged by the progress that has been made over, over the last 20, 25 years. Uh, and there's, there's this, this notion of, of hardware readiness. Basically what we have is, is maybe good enough. You know, aside from you know, technical challenges like working at cryogenic temperatures, uh, these things aren't necessarily the smallest thing that you can think of. They're not these archetypical, you know, atoms that behave quantum mechanically. They're these distributed circuits. Um, so size is maybe something that, you know, something that was mentioned before and, and, and is somewhat of a concern. Um, people think that you can do something with, with this technology. Um, but a question that a lot of our work uh, sort of focuses on is maybe this isn't actually an impossible feat, but is it? Is this the way we want to push forward? Do we want to push with the existing technology, or should we still be uh, doing fundamental research on uh, you know, the building blocks, the qubits, the transistors, uh, in, in analogy uh, to, to, to classical computing? Um, and the answer, the answer I think, is, is very much yes. Uh, because again, you know, this, this transmon circuit, um, which is topologically equivalent to what some people call a Cooper pair box, which was demonstrated again 25 years ago, um, you know, we've made advances and we can continue making advances on the hardware. Um, and so in, in thinking about what kind of qubits uh, one could make, what kind of quantum circuits one can make, it's worth considering what makes a good physical qubit architecture. And you know, you can have this conversation in the context of uh, you know, superconducting qubits versus trapped ions versus neutral atoms versus all the number of, uh, of, of defect centers that, that folks use. Uh, and are developing for quantum applications. Um, but something that's really nice about superconducting qubits is you have, so many, you have so many degrees of freedom, you have so many choices that you can make in terms of your design, in terms of your engineering, that you can also ask all of these questions sort of within the field and sort of do an optimization you know, using similar components um, to, uh, to realize something that's, that's better suited for, for large scale applications. So, so what do you need? You need some quantum system that is controllable. Uh, and for sort of qubits, where you're focusing on two levels, you want to be able to, uh, to, uh, to separate out those two levels from the rest of the, the space. Um, it needs to be coherent. So if it's interacting with too many degrees of freedom of the environment, quantum information isn't going to last long. Um, and so uh, there's a, a few metrics that we use uh, to this end. Uh, the coherence time T2, uh, energy relaxation time T1, Facing time T phi, all these things that are borrowed from NMR, uh, NMR language of, 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 of years past, um, and this will be sort of the metrics that we use for most of most of the talk. Um, we also need to address the qubits. You need to be able to control their states uh, with high fidelity. Uh, in superconducting qubits, we do this with microwave drives at gigahertz transition frequencies, um, 
typically speaking, we're using hardware with hundreds of megahertz maximum bandwidth for, for pulsing, um, so fast pulsing. Uh, and, and at this point, we're up to 99.99, uh, so four nines uh, control fidelity, which is, which is quite good. It's what people feel like is above the threshold necessary for, for um, sort of implementation of quantum error correction in these, in these systems. Uh, and you need to be able to then, once you have those single qubits, be able to interact them with each other, generate entanglement between them, uh, which is really the, the backbone of, of what makes quantum computing potentially interesting. Um, I guess I don't have the number here, but oh, I guess I do. Uh, we're up to one nine less of two qubit gate fidelity. It's just harder, more, more things moving on, uh, going on. Uh, but um, but this is but this is really state of the art, and, and also is is basically at that threshold that people feel is 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 ready for for prime time. Um, and then the last thing that you need to do, and this is actually uh, one of the things that is a big research to us nowadays. I won't talk about it much here. But, uh, but actually the readout of those qubit states. You need to do that with very high fidelity in a quantum non-evolution way. And that is kind of hard. Um, uh, in superconducting qubits, we use uh, techniques that we call circuit QED, circuit quantum electrodynamics. Uh, they borrow you know, exactly from cavity QED experiments of the, of the 80s and 90s and, and today. Um, so this is, this is sort of the lay of the land. Um, and, and the thing that I want to mention especially, is that for, maybe you'd call them synthetic, they're, you know, these super nutting qubits are very engineerable, they're, they're, there's a lot of choices that you can make. Basically none of these things, the, even the way that we encode the information in the circuits, none of it's actually set in stone. There's a lot of flexibility with this, uh, with this modality, and, and that's, that's something that, that I find really exciting. If we get bored of studying one of them, we can, we can, we can start thinking about another. Um, and so, uh, like I mentioned, this uh, you know, coherence times will be the sort of the primary metric that we talk about throughout this talk. Uh, and the goal is to improve them. The goal is to basically improve the time scales on which uh, quantum information can live in these, in these quantum circuits. Uh, I, I mentioned sort of this coherence time and the two components to it. Um, but what I want to point out is that uh, for, for, all of these, for all of these times, uh, you can kind of think about different components of them uh, two, two, two different ways of thinking about their components. Um, the first is some, some, uh, some part of this, of this interaction, Hamiltonian, uh, some, some part of either Fermi's golden rule or you know, your formula for dephasing, um, that's really intrinsic to the way you're encoding the information in that quantum circuit. And again, there's, there's some choice that you can make there, and this is, this is a really exciting um, aspect of the field. Um, and then sort of extrinsic uh, contributions. So basically, if you have a noisy environment that's interacting with your qubit, that can cause you problems. If you just don't have that noise, then that is a way to mitigate uh, decoherence from, from that environment. Um, and so, so these are, these, these are two, uh, uh, two sort of ways of slicing uh, this problem uh, slicing this problem up. And, and at first, we'll talk about sort of these extrinsic properties. And so. Uh, what this means is really, you know, how how the Hamiltonian, how the information encoding is actually physically realized. So this is, you know, materials on a on a chip. This is the electromagnetic environment that the qubit is living in. Things that are not fundamental, let's say, to the way the information is encoded. Um, and so that starts with how we create superconducting qubits. Um, something that's that's heralded as 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 a nice feature is that we utilize relatively standard semiconductor and superconductor uh, fabrication technologies, most of which is commercially available from a variety of, of vendors in terms of you know, deposition systems and lithography tools, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and, and everything is patterned on also relatively commercially available high quality substrates, either silicon, sapphire, so folks are, are exploring um, other substrates as well. Um, but. Uh, but yeah, the, the point is that you know, all of these techniques are somewhat, uh, you know, somewhat learnable. You, you can do them in an academic lab. You don't need to have some, some very fancy uh, semiconductor foundry in order to, to make a superconductor cube. Um, and so uh, sort of going down the line here, uh, at, at Lincoln Lab at least, we, we do fabrication up to uh, 200 millimeter wafers, so that's eight inch processing, big wafers. Um, this, is a, this is a GDS of a smaller two inch wafer um, I believe, oh no, sorry, this is, 
This is uh, eight inch right there. Um, and then if you if you zoom into any one of the die on this thing, you'll see you know some uh, some patterning. Uh, these <coughs> axes here are one way of implementing uh, what I mentioned before, this transmod qubit. Uh, you can see that there's some coplanar waveguide structures uh, that serve as readout resonators in the circuit QED architecture and control lines for either biasing uh, uh, local flux, so, so current biasing or, or voltage biasing, uh, either at DC or, or microwaves, uh, those, those individual transmods. Um, zooming in a little further, this is what it looks like up close. And really at the heart of this is, uh, is a SWIT. So the a superconducting loop interrupted by two Josephson junctions uh, shown here. They're fabricated with double angle evaporation in a Dolan bridge style technique. And you know, the details here, you know, different groups do it differently. This is, this is just one way of doing this fabrication. Um, I didn't mention before, but uh, we're utilizing a squid here to introduce some in-situ tunability of the Hamiltonian uh, once the device is fabricated. Uh, that allows us to turn on and off interactions between neighboring qubits by bringing them into resonance. Uh, or, or just changing their properties um, such, to, such that we can, that we can do uh, uh, higher fidelity control. Okay. Um, and so all of those, I, I didn't really mention much about the materials there, uh, but we're, we're utilizing typically, you know, nice superconductors, aluminum, uh, basically everything that was on this last slide. Uh, there we go. Uh, everything that you see on this last slide is either aluminum or aluminum oxide. Uh, if, it's on, if it's on sapphire, um, if there's a silicon substrate, you add silicon to the equation. But otherwise, the, the materials in processing can be relatively simple. Um, more exotic superconductors are, are also being studied. But one thing that we can do is actually look for, um, in those materials, try to diagnose which uh, components are actually giving us uh, issues, causing decoherence. So like, where are the degrees of freedom that the qubit is exchanging information with? Where do they actually live sort of physically in that structure? And so uh, this is an example of some work from our group from a couple of years ago, uh, studying coplanar waveguide resonators uh, with different um, isotropic etching profiles uh, underneath them. And so it's a little bit hard to see here, but uh, the center trace of the coplanar waveguide is, is located up top here with ground plane on either side. And that's kind of the same for, for each of these structures, the, the, the center traces in the middle um, of all of these. And basically by varying the, uh, the profile of the, of the substrate um, uh, separating this, this uh, center trace from the ground plane, you can change where the electric field is living. You know, change the dielectric constant, you'll change the electric field profile. Um, and from that, we can actually diagnose whether uh, the, the materials defects that are, uh, that are giving rise to decoherence are located either in the substrate <coughs> on this uh, interface of the superconductor with uh, you know, the vacuum or air above it, um, <coughs> at the interface between the uh, substrate and the, and the air, <coughs> or uh, between the metallization and the substrate. And so this is just, you know, this is, this is, this is an engineering technique that allows us to create um, some metric that is like quasi-orthogonal in these, in these design parameters uh, to be able to back out sort of which, which of those interfaces is, is, is causing us the most trouble. Um, we have other in situ uh, uh, techniques that we can, that we can use in, in coordination with, with uh, various models of, of these defects. Um, here's where we're sweeping. This is, this is a work from the Princeton group, um, Andrew Hauck's group. Uh, where they're sweeping the, the temperature of a, of a, of a superconducting resonator and varying the circulating power in that resonator. And the combination of those two things uh, allows you to uh, extract the relative contributions of sort of the materials defects uh, with, this, with this interesting structure at, at low temperature and non-equilibrium quasi-particles in the superconductor at high temperature. Um, and so uh, what, I, what I really want to emphasize here is just that uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of physics and, and sort of materials analysis and uh, that, that goes into the understanding of the performance and, and the then the improvement of performance of these of these devices. Um, and so um, that's that's one aspect of, of sort of improving the performance of these devices. Uh, 
something that something that's that's really exciting, especially nowadays, uh, is sort of like where do we where do we actually go from here? Um, and so this is showing sort of the uh, decay time of uh, transmon energy relaxation and coherence times over the years, and basically since about 2010, uh, all this improvement that's that's been shown. So let's say two orders of magnitude or so uh, in these coherence times has come from really you know engineering the environment, engineering the environment and the materials that these qubits are made out of, um, and this is going to be still going to be critical for uh, you know, the next generation of superconducting qubits going beyond the transmon. But, but really, there's a question we can ask, which is, is there just something else that we can do? Can we encode the information in some way that's just harder for the environment to access? Um, and so this is, this, is what, this is what people talk about in our field when they talk about noise-protected uh, superconducting qubits or decoherence root subspaces uh, within, within a quantum circuit. Um, and, and here, uh, you know, for the rest of the talk, uh, we'll limit ourselves to just a few of, the, of these usual ingredients. Something that, that looks like an inductor, something that looks like a capacitor, and, and a Josephson junction. And in particular, a, a superconductor insulating superconductor Josephson junction that doesn't have a more interesting current phase relationship than, uh, than that sine phi. That aspect of it could really be a whole other talk, and I'm happy to, uh, to chat with people about that, or, or maybe if there's time at the end, we can, we can discuss it briefly. Um, and so the question we want to ask is, can we use these simple things to engineer just a better superconducting qubit, one that's intrinsically protected in some of this, this uh, decoherence? Um, and so uh, in, in particular, what we're trying to engineer is a suppression of this uh, dipole transition matrix problem. Okay? Um, so you have some interaction Hamiltonian, and the question is, can it link uh, the two uh, energy eigenstates of the, of the circuit that you want to use as your computational basis? Uh, and so there's two ways to, to do this. So you can engineer some sort of symmetry protection. So if you choose to encode um, your information uh, in, in, in between the states, uh, you know, two states that have, uh, let's say, the same symmetry uh, about some axis where your interaction Hamiltonian has the opposite symmetry, so even versus odd, uh, that would mean that you can't drive transitions. There's no uh, dipole matrix on it. Um, or something that's, that's even a bit more robust to parameter disorder and, and things like that is disjoint support. So if you can encode your information in some basis, some physical basis uh, uh, of your Hamiltonian where there's just no wave function overlap whatsoever, you, you kind of have to cook up a pretty pathological uh, uh, interaction Hamiltonian or, or, or operator uh, in order to be able to drive those transitions. Um, and so, uh, it's worth noting here that you know, for for all of the sort of uh, uh, what's the word, the, uh, the 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 mechanisms of loss that um, that are that are most common in our field, uh, we, we we know what these operators are. These these interaction Hamiltonians are. Uh, for inductive loss, it's something that couples to current in the, in these electromagnetic modes, so it couples to the phase of the superconducting wave function. Um, for capacitive loss, like lossy. Uh, electrically coupled dielectrics, uh, dielectric defects. Uh, it's, it couples to a voltage, it's just like a, the charge operator. Um, and for quasi-particle loss, it couples to this uh, 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 exponential of phase over two. This is the, this comes from a single electron tumbling Hamilton in, 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 um, in superconducting qubits. And we really care about these quasi-particles when they tunnel across the Joseph's instruction. Um, and so one thing that, that I won't talk, uh, talk about too much, but, but it's worth, worth mentioning here, is that uh, the really difficult thing is achieving both T1 protection and T5 protection uh, simultaneously. Um, uh, because it's, it's very easy to, <laughs> it's very easy to um, you know, just hide the information somewhere that it can't be accessed. But if there's no way for, no way for you or the environment to access it, uh, you're kind of you're kind of stuck. Okay, um, and so this is just a, a, a small survey of some of the the sort of next generation uh, superconducting circuits that folks are looking at uh, to realize these novel or noise protected qubits um, of varying complexity. Uh, so the fluxonium is, is sort of a minimal realization of some of these ideas that I'll talk about uh, for the rest of the talk. 
uh, and it's it's arguably the simplest uh, circuit on this in this on this slide. Um, there's you know uh, sort of arrays of arrays of Josephson junctions with interesting topology that can uh, that can give rise to, to to protection in various ways, um, along with you know everything in between basically. Okay. And so, uh, like I mentioned, this fluxonium qubit, uh, it's realized by taking that same circuit that we were looking at for the transmon and shunting it with some uh, inductance. And in particular, in the fluxonium regime, it's a very large inductance. And this can kind of be thought of as uh, an evolution of a different qubit called the flux qubit, which is one that Irinel, uh, uh sort of pioneered in his, uh, in his postdoc. Uh, um, and so uh, this is the Hamiltonian. It's the same transmon Hamiltonian, just with another uh, term in the potential uh, related to this inductance, this parabolic uh, uh, potential from the inductor. And uh, in the fluxonium, it actually does exhibit sort of those same features that I showed on the slide previous uh, that are sort of the hallmarks of protection against energy relaxation. Uh, the issue is that it doesn't do it simultaneously with uh, dephasing at the, at the points that you'd want to operate it. And so uh, there's symmetry protection against quasi-particle-induced energy relaxation when biased at the, you know, at the, at, at the operating point that, that folks are most excited about, at a half a flux quantum biased through this um, superconducting loop, um, where uh, the wave functions uh, of the ground and first excited state look like this, um, and the, and the uh, and the uh, interaction Hamiltonian has uh, this sort of, um, you know, about, about this axis, it's symmetric. So it won't be able to drive transitions between these two states with opposite parity. Um, and then uh, you can also engineer this, this notion of disjoint support. So if you take it away from this half a flux sweet spot that you need, or, or zero flux sweet spot that you need in order to preserve uh, dephasing protection, uh, you, can, you can trade that for T1 protection. Um, and, and engineer the system such that there's disjoint support between the zero and first, or the ground and first excited state. Uh, the wave functions are localized in uh, these two different wells with, with very little overlap. Okay. Um, furthermore, so this is this is you know one one example of of, of sort of why fluxonium might be interesting uh, in principle. Uh, it's also really interesting in practice, uh, and so. Uh, nowadays, the fluxonium is arguably the highest coherence superconducting circuit uh, to date. Uh, it's recently demonstrated uh, to have coherence times both T1 and uh, T2. Uh, I think this was with one Han echo, but it might have also been without, just a, a Ramsey measurement, um, uh, of greater than a millisecond. So if we think back to that chart of, of improvement, that's, that's already at the, at the very top, uh, top corner of that. Um, so millisecond coherence times. Uh, again, people have demonstrated this protection of uh, T1 against quasi-particles at the small junction, this, this junction here. It's not protected against quasi-particles living in this inductor, but that doesn't seem to be the limiting uh, factor just yet. Um, this was actually shown, shown many years ago that this circuit exhibited this property. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, more recently, uh, people have been, you know, fluxonium has been getting serious and people have been, been working toward really high fidelity single and two qubit gates with fluxonium. And so uh, this is an example from our group uh, where we showed uh, you know, better, than, better than three nines, um, two qubit gate fidelities, uh, and that lasted for about an hour or so before we decided to recalibrate. Um, uh, so, so relatively stable in time as well. Uh, and then uh, again, I mentioned four nines of uh, single qubit gate fidelity. Uh, and then uh, just after that, there was another work from um, Dave Schuster's group that I just mentioned before, um, uh, doing doing similar things. And so uh, to talk a little bit about that that demonstration, uh, this was uh, an experiment that was led by by Leon Ding, a grad student in our group, um, where we we took a uh, took a device uh, that had two fluxonium qubits and actually coupled them together using this industry standard transmon qubit. So the transmon in this architecture isn't really doing anything, uh, isn't really encoding any quantum information. Uh, it's just mediating the interaction between these two fluxonium qubits in red. 
And here again, you can see the, the microwave control circuitry. So there's uh, some readout uh, copolymer wave guide resonators in, in, in gold for each of the qubits in this in the system. Um, current bias lines to thread flux through the various superconducting loops of the system, and then uh, some some lines that are terminated and open to, to drive a voltage charge uh, uh, drive on these qubits. And so <clears throat> what, uh, what this scheme did, uh, and is, is something that's, that's also nice, uh, we have freedom uh, in, the, in these engineered systems to actually generate entanglement with different types of physical hardware. Um, and so for instance, you can uh, do modulation of these, of these uh, uh, flux loops to bring qubits in and out of resonance and sort of really drive a, a, a natural interaction between them. Or you can just apply a microwave pulse. So in the, in the energy level diagram of this composite system, uh, if you apply a microwave pulse to one of a few uh, select transitions, you can generate a conditional phase gate, uh, basically rotate uh, the wave function of, of one of these qubits conditioned on the state of the other, uh, just with a microwave pulse. And this is really nice, because microwave pulses have uh, uh, much less crosstalk than, um, than, um, than uh, flux or current control lines. <laughs> and so as I mentioned, um, we were able to achieve these really high fidelity two qubit gates uh, using actually some reinforcement learning techniques um, that were stable for, for hours at a time and, and between which we uh, just chose to update the training of those, of those schemes. Um, and so this, this was at the time and, and still is uh, sort of state of the art performance with Fluxonium qubits. And so that's why we're really interested in, in continuing to pursue these, these types of circuits. Um, but uh, another question that we, that we, that we wish to answer, uh, and, and I'll finish up uh, with this, is, is when we make these qubits, <coughs> are, there any, are there any caveats? So they talk about all this engineerability, is that, is that always a good thing? And uh, there's, there's a question to ask, which is you have a choice of how to actually implement uh, this inductance in the circuit. And uh, the way that many folks do it is by using a Josephson Junction Array superinductor. So if you put many Josephson junctions in series, the phase fluctuations across the array are uh, distributed across all those junctions, and it makes it look you know, some, like something that approximates a linear inductor. And that usually works really, really well. Uh, but there's something that you need to uh, take into account, uh, which is that because you have all of these weak links, um, you, know, you, have to, you have to make sure that you can treat them separately from that other Josephson junction in your circuit. And so uh, Malika Rondaria and Tom Hazard in our group um, <coughs> just, just finished up an experiment that's on the archive uh, following on, on some work from Vlad Brancharian where he was a graduate student at Yale um, to validate sort of the consequences of that, of, of the choices that are made in our, in our fabrication of junction array superinductors and how it affects uh, the dephasing times of these qubits. And so uh, to run through it really, really quickly, um, again, the notion here is that you have some small junction in a fluxonium qubit and a junction array, and you've got to be able to treat this one somehow fundamentally differently than all of these. And uh, what it boils down to is the rate of what are called phase slips. And so in superconductivity, the order parameter uh, can be periodic and is, is periodic in 2 pi, and that allows for the phase to spontaneously flip or, or shift by, by 2 pi increments. And this is something that happens at all Josephson junctions uh, at a rate that depends on the impedance of that Josephson junction. And so uh, basically, if the, uh, if the impedance of these array junctions gets too similar uh, to the impedance of this uh, small Josephson junction in the circuit, you can no longer treat them as these you know, things that are somehow different. Uh, and, you need to, and you need to consider um, how that will affect your Hamiltonian. And, uh, there's actually something that's really, that's really cute that comes out of this, which is that there's coherent interference of all of these phase slips uh, in those junction arrays, or the or array junctions, uh, that actually picks up a topological phase due to the aronoff kasher effect. So each of these, in between each of these junctions is a superconducting island that can in principle have some offset charge associated with it, and a, uh, a phase slip, which can be thought of as sort of a flux on tunneling into and out of this loop uh, can enclose, can, can, can trace out a path uh, 
that encloses some of that charge, and the tunneling of that fluxon will acquire a phase due to this Aronoff Cashman effect. And so what we did uh, was we designed a chip with six fluxoniums that were nominally identical Hamiltonian parameters. So the energy spectrum was basically the same, uh, but we changed the, uh, the parameters that we implemented the junction array with uh, in order to be sensitive to this effect. Um, and what we saw was vastly different dephasing times. This is the Ramsey dephasing time as a function of external flux right around that half flux sweet spot. And you can see that the characteristic shape of these curves is very, very different. Uh, it goes from something that's characteristic of flux noise limitation to exactly what we would expect for this uh, coherent quantum phase slip limited uh, dephasing mechanism. Um, and so this, this agreed with, with, uh, with our theory over many orders of magnitude. We realized this is a typo. This should be 49 femtofarads per micron squared in the single free, free parameter of this model, which is just the specific capacitance of those Josephson junctions. So you have a tunnel barrier that has some capacitance associated with it, and the, you know, it's a parallel plate capacitance of the junction. Um, we took it a step further, and we looked at uh, the, the noise, the power spectral density of the noise of, these, uh, of this dephasing, um, and saw something kind of interesting that, you know, in contrast, the typical 1 over F dephasing associated with uh, flux noise limitations, or, or even what people would think about for charge noise, uh, the current quantum facelift dephasing was, was basically featureless. Um, we came up with a model to explain that uh, related to quasi-particles tumbling uh, between the atoms of the array. This is not necessarily what's happening, but it is at least a plausible uh, explanation. Um, great. Um, on that topic of quasi-particles, one other thing uh, that's worth mentioning in the context of improving superconducting qubits is quasi-particles. Um, so we make this assumption that we can write down uh, you know, the Hamiltonian of a circuit and not include any environmental degrees of freedom. But if our BCS, BCS superconductors aren't perfect and there are some excitations out of the BCS ground state, those are degrees of freedom that we need to worry about. Uh, and those we call these, these non-equilibrium quasi-particles. Um, then, uh, you know, there's been a lot of interest in the field recently uh, to, to mitigate their effects for one specific reason, which is that Ionizing radiation, so cosmic ray muons or gamma rays or, or what have you, can interact with the substrate of a, of a superconducting qubit chip, just deposit a ton of energy, and knock out a lot of qubits, like in a, you know, say, centimeter size area. And those types of errors are very difficult for uh, like traditional quantum error correction techniques to, to account for. And so there's been a lot of work uh, looking at um, on-chip mitigation of quasi-particle-induced decoherence. This is, this is actually stuff that I spent my PhD on. Um, and, and it was recently culminated in a nice paper from the Google group, uh, basically showing that it, you can do some things to suppress those correlated errors. Uh, and we also had from our team uh, an experiment recently uh, that he used coincidence timing techniques uh, between a superconducting quantum processor and a dilution refrigerator and scintillating detectors outside of the fridge to determine uh, exactly what fraction of, the, of these correlated errors came from cosmic ray muons. We found that at sea level it was about 17%, and that's, that's something that does make things a little bit harder. It deposits a lot of energy. It's not something that you can shield with lead. Uh, the only way to really shield muons is to go way underground and use the overburden of the earth. None of us want to work in mines, and so uh, it's really important for uh, for these sorts of quasi-particle mitigation techniques to, to, to sort of triumph. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's, uh, that's the research part of, uh, of this talk. I, I want to share two slides or three slides uh, related to some of the other stuff that Lincoln Lab is involved with. Um, so MIT Lincoln Laboratory is an FFRDC operated by MIT, so we're MIT employees. Um, but so in addition to research, uh, we do a lot of support of the community uh, at sponsor's request. Uh, we provide Josephson traveling with parametric amplifiers, which are crucial for high fidelity qubit readout. Uh, and then more recently, we've started uh, standing up a foundry service for superconducting qubits that the community can, can, can engage with. Um, and so uh, I know I'm running low on time, so I'll skip through this briefly, but, but these, these traveling with parametric amplifiers are, uh, look something like this. Again, it's a quantum circuit with junctions, uh, capacitors, and inductors. 
Um, and we've sent uh, you know, hundreds of these dupas uh, to various academic groups uh, worldwide uh, to enable high fidelity qubit readout. Um, I mentioned again uh, this, this uh, foundry program, we call it the Squill Foundry, Superconducting Qubits LL. Uh, and, and basically what, what folks are doing, and I mentioned this because you may be interested, uh, basically you design your own chip, you send the GDS to us, and we fabricate it for you, we ship you the devices packaged and ready to measure in your glitch chip return. Um, and so what this means is that, you know, a new group that doesn't have access to all the fabrication tools uh, can, in principle, start doing experiments on, on super nutty qubits. Uh, so the goal here is, is really to, to, to expand uh, uh, access to, to super nutty qubits um, for the entire community. Um, yeah, I guess we've, yeah, so there's now 10 users of the company uh, and growing. Again, this is our team. I want to thank everybody that's involved. It's a, it's a big team effort. Uh, and I'll leave up my conclusions to take, uh, take some questions. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Uh, quick questions. Anybody want to do it before Louise? <laughs> Thank yeah. you for a very nice talk. Uh, you mentioned this uh, causal particles and uh, their, the, the environment. Uh, do we deterministically know those radiations are affecting, or I saw there's a recent archive paper saying it's more like the fauna environment. If you just uh, do a metamaterial fauna bay uh, substrate, you can actually reduce two level system coupling and enhance the fact, uh, coherence time at two orders magnitude. The, okay, so there's a couple, maybe a couple questions in there. So the, the, the comment is not that, um, that quasi-particles are limiting sort of the steady state coherence times, but they are limiting the coherence times during these events when ionizing radiation impacts the chip. The, the energy transport does go through phonons, so it ionizes some, some, some charges in the substrate which relax via phonons, and those phonons are what interact with the superconductors and create all the flux particles. So you could, in principle, use some of this, you know, phononic band gap engineering to inhibit the energy transport. Thank you. Yeah. Luis? Yes. Naive question. So the evidence of your flux sonium, you have this array of possessive junctions. This consumes a lot of real state in the chip, right? So, I mean, because one of the issues with qubits these days is to scale in the amount, they're consuming so much space. You cannot put that many qubits in solution of prism becoming gigantic. The naive question, can you use another inductor? Can you just do a spiral and perhaps put a dot of ferromagnet to make a strong mm. uh, inductor? Why the array of success? I yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a that's a great question. So, um, in terms, so aside from adding, you know, some magnetic, explicitly magnetic material in, um, Joseph's junction arrays are probably the most compact way to get the inductances required for these circuits. Uh, this is using, oh gosh, I'm I, I'm only thinking in energy units, but it's uh, it's it's many many nanohenries. Uh, maybe even tens or 100 nanometers in some of these circuits. Um, and so the, you know, the high inductance density of a Josephson junction really is a, a spatially efficient way to do it. In superconducting qubits, the, the, the Josephson junctions and in fluxonium, this loop with, with an array of junctions, is really, it's kind of the smallest thing there is. The, the coplanar waveguide resonators that we use, the, the microwave feed lines, all of those things take up uh, even more real estate. So, so, so your, your, your points are well taken, but um, it's maybe, it's not the tallest pole in this size argument. We don't use explicit magnetic materials because we rely on hard superconducting gaps to suppress uh, quad spark bulk citations. Right, that, that yeah, so what is nowadays uh, production yield of uh, Fluxonia qubit compared with um, Which is easier? Well, I, okay. I can say that from a very privileged standpoint in that we can make high quality junction arrays, it's effectively the same. But uh, you know, the, the lithography required to make these dense, you know, for space, spatial, spatial efficiency. Uh, junction arrays is like a little, it's a little complicated. Um, it's, again, academic cleaners can do it. Uh, 
just fine if you have a, a high enough uh, <coughs> uh, accelerating voltage EV lithography system. So. All right, Mike, you have an announcement? Yeah, I just want to say let's restart at 10.55 instead of 10.50 because the run is nice and high. Enjoy coffee break. All right.
Listen to me. Can everyone listen to me in the back? Okay, good. So I'm not talking about Hewitt's today, I'm talking about quantum materials, sorry. Okay, but to be honest with you, I'm going to talk a little bit about skirmish, and there are a bunch of computational schemes I don't have time to talk today that have been proposed based on skirmish, like neuromorphic computing, and even there are folks proposing you can put an electric field the perpendicular to skirmish, you can control the helicity and the distinct textures, you can actually entangle those things for quantum computing. So it's one of my interests, it's one of my drivers here, and I'm trying to grow materials that can show skirmish at room temperature and above, and I, we have grown them, I'm going to show a slide towards the end. But today I'm going to talk about um, layer materials which I intrigue because they're inversion symmetric, and in inversion symmetric systems we don't expect to see the shaloshinsky mori interaction. For those who don't know, the interaction happens in the system lacks inversion symmetry, and the shaloshinsky mori interaction is, 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 is thought to be essential for stabilizing complex spin, spin textures. I'm going to talk about those today. So I'm going to show evidence for a topological hole effect in a central symmetric ferromagnet, but at zero field, a remnant. So uh, this is a work of collaboration with a series of students and postdocs in my group, uh, staff members in my lab, Hassan Choi, Ian Shin does electron microscopy for us, Professor Shatruk has helped us with uh, X-ray characterization, a lot of collaboration with the group of Julia Chan in Baylor, she was at Dallas before. So we get micromagnetic simulations from the University of Edinburgh, neutron scattering, which I'm not showing today, but there's ongoing collaboration with NIST. A lot of collaboration group of Amanda Petford at Argonne, and Lawrence Transmission of Microscopy, and we have an ongoing, but I'm not going to show images of uh, thought emission the mission electron microscopy done at four sharings. So I'm talking, oops, this slide's not here. Uh, well, uh, let me give an introduction to the materials. This all started with this materials, iron three, germanium, tellurium two. This is a transmission electron microscopy image of uh, a crystal that we have grown. So you can see here the, the, the iron atoms, the germanium atoms, and the tellurium atoms are forming clear layers and a sort of Van der Waals gap. So this materials will be easy to exfoliate. And then, a tricky thing that materials like this, in the case of iron 2 it's not subject to the stock. It, it crystallizes in the specific stream MC structure. If it becomes ferromagnet around 200 Kelvin above, we have a Korean wise type of behavior with a, uh, an effective amount of about 3 mb that has been controlled by neutrons. And neutrons in this materials tend to see very simple magnetic arrangement, just a collinear ferromagnetic arrangement along the c-axis of the material. Should be a boring magnetic ferromagnetic material. Nevertheless, if you measure Hall effect, um, <coughs> there's much more in the, in the story than uh, it would seem to imply from here, which I don't have the time to talk about iron 3 one You see magnetization, the c-axis, the z-axis, and the Hall effect mimics the magnetization. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're seeing a very strong and almost Hall. At the time, when this was published, it was claimed that this material had, at the time, one of the largest anomalous Hall coefficients. But we're going to talk today is the Hall effect have a, a conventional component, the anomalous component mimic, mimics magnetization. There's a topological component that has to do with the spin textures. And there's a paper that was published by Mohit Randeria, which is relevant here, that he claims that <coughs> the anomalous Hall effect is associated with the very phase in phase space and the topological component which I'm going to explain what it is in a moment, has to do with uh, Berry phase in real space. And I have to time to go into details of the paper. So I'm going to talk about the topology component. Why I'm showing this? Because iron 312, although it's just a collinear ferromagnet, when you cool down more, um, magnetic circular dichroism is these labyrinthine domains, and they're not simple. The domain walls between domains are actually complex. They have, they're, um, Block domain walls, nail domain walls, they have chirality, it's complicated. And if you apply a magnetic field, thank you. If you apply a magnetic field, you see all these bubbles and there are a bunch of papers. I'm just citing one claim, and these bubbles are not just bubbles, they're actually skirmions. They have these spin textures. And why do we care about skirmions? I give an example here, it was published many years ago. So this is barium titanate, transrutinate, a ferromagnet, this is just a substrate. This thing breaks inversion symmetry. So if you measure anomalous hall, the anomalous hall <coughs> follows more or less the magnetization, but there's an extra contribution here, which is the speak. 
and you can actually subtract the contribution against from magnetization, you're left with this uh, uh, green curve here, which has a small value of about 0.3 micron centimeter, but that's what is claimed to be the contribution by the interaction with the spin textures. Spin textures act like an effective magnetic field, provide a very phase to cares, and they deviate to provide an extra contribution. So that's what I'm going to talk today when I'm referring to the topological hall component. So I'm going to talk about R of pi one two. Here again, transmission electron microscopy image collected here at the Maga lab from one of our samples. The difference is have an, an extra iron in the atomic site, and it doesn't sit crystallize in a P63 and MC, but in a uh, um, R minus 3M structure. Oops. Well, I'll come back in a minute. So here is a, uh, this, this uh, material was reported in 2019. It's a complicated material in the sense that um, depending how you cool down, how you synthesize it, the TC can vary between 300 Kelvin to 310 Kelvin. In some materials, you can quench for high temperatures, which seem to give a, a better quality material, less disorder, but then there's a transition around 110 Kelvin. Nobody understands very well. Ramesh's group in Berkeley claims to, uh, that there's a, there's a restacking transition in this material from ABC stacking to AA stacking, if I understand correctly. And when you walk, the TC is somewhere here at 175 Kelvin. When you warm up, the TC increases and becomes permanently pinned above the room temperature, okay? So this material has been claimed to show uh, merons. What are merons? And basically, it's half a skirmion. If you get a skirmion, you put this a skirmion on a sphere, you, you can just distribute the spins in a sphere and, 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 the, and the texture over the spin. You calculate what's called the winding number, get a winding number, a chair number of one. And a meron is basically a vortex of spin in the plane, but as you move towards the center, the spins gather out of the center and start pointing out of the plane. And a meron, when you calculate the winding number of the chair number, has a fractional number. So the carriers can go interact with the spin textures, be scattered, because your carriers have spins, they interact with the spin texture that deviated, and they cont contribute to this topological Hall effect. So in previous publications, it was claimed that there was a region where uh, the topological Hall effect associated with the merons was pr probably the first example of a meron-driven topological Hall response, an extra contribution here. They already subtracted the anomalous Hall, they already subtracted the magnetization component. And MERS around 200 Kelvin is, is confined in a narrow range. And they have done Lawrence TM, and it's not very clear, but you have, I'm going to show in a moment, you have planar domains that make vortices of domains, and these vortices, they meet at a specific point, you can create these meron chains. So there's a correlation between the presence of meron chains, this, the center of this spin textures here, and the topological hall response in iron 512. So we have a, a measure iron 512 here, it's just a raw data. This is magnetization along C axis along the AB plane. As you can see, you need a much lower field along the AB plane to uh, polarize the magnetization, okay? So the AB plane is the easy plane of magnetization of the material. If you measure an anomalous hole, you just see this proportion to the magnetization. It's just an anomalous hole of the material. What we have done, and um, in a different way than most of the people measure anomalous hole, I'm going to explain in a minute. We have done something funny, just out of uh, having fun. We apply magnetic fields along the current. Fields along the current are not supposed to have any large force, are not supposed to give you a hall response. And nevertheless, you see something that looks like a hall response. You see a spike in, in a hole like response when you apply fields very well aligned along the current. Obviously, what it means very well aligned is very tricky because in real experiments, you always point to 0, 0, 0.05, 0 0.1 degrees away perfectly from the AD plane because they don't have a vectorial magnet. But we always see a spike in the whole response. The funny thing is the magnetization is always increased to go down. This spike actually is not a ferromagnetic component out of the plane because as the magnetization is increasing, this response actually decreases to go, go down in temperature. It's really confined to a certain range of temperatures. So the usual way people, I just want to show uh, magnetization as a function of field and show this thing does not show hysteresis. It's, it's relevant to water in bulk in the bulk material. Come back in a minute. Um, we have done Lorentz TM in our material, and bear with me here, this is a little <coughs> complicated. At high temperatures, what we see is 
planar domains, which are basically they use what is called the transport of intensity equation, is a, some formalism to analyze this Lorentz TM data, and they see vortices of spins. That's what basically you're seeing here when they, you have moments pointing up, moments point to the right, moments point to the left, moments pointing down. So this is what you're seeing, planar domains. At high temperatures, the system is completely dominated by ferromagnetic planar domains. The AB plane is the easy axis. So, so who is mask? They move in time or they are just stuck? They're really stuck. It's really stable. That's what we know from RSTM. But and they meet at specific points. And these are the boundaries between these domains. So we have these black lines here and these white lines here. It's basically their domain boundaries. And some bounds are pointing up, some points are pointing pointing down, that's why you have difference in color. But they meet at specific points here. You can see here, you can see here, and at this point where they meet, where you have the merons, according to our Lawrence here. So at high temperatures, the moments are completely in plane, so this whole effect that we're seeing out of the plane cannot be explained by a randomization of the plane, because the system likes to maintain the moments in the plane. Nevertheless, at 100 Kelvin, we have, we do, we have seen, for reasons we not understand, perhaps because we're approaching magnetic structural transition, some domains change the magnetic anisotropy. You have domains which the magnetic anisotropy pointing perpendicular to the planes. If you apply magnetic field, you get these dots which are skirmions. We don't see skirmions at low temperatures in specific domains. As far as we know, iron 512 is the first compound that showed the coexistence of merons and skirmions in the same material. Okay, this is what we published this last year. So, usual way. And bear with me, this is a little bit crowded. The usual way we, we extract the anomalous hall, you plot the hall effect versus magnetization, some power law of magnetism. You still check if this thing is linear. Once you check if this thing is linear, you, you calculate the constant of proportionality, SH, for the anomalous hall. Once you have SH, you rescale these guys, this multiplication here. This is this um, black curve that you have here, this rescale factor. You have your real hole measurement, and when you take the difference between the two, there's an extra contribution, which is very <coughs> controversial in the community. A lot of people don't like this massage of the data because they say you're measuring magnetization with the squid, you measure transport data with other instrumentation, this could be just an, uh, uh, an artifact. So we have done that, and that's what we get here. And if we do the experiment where we don't massage the data, we just put the field along the plane, when you should not have a hole effect, we see somewhat the same thing about the same values, typically. We have no massages, just you anti-symmetrize the data. So you get the same kind of response, the sign, and you don't know how to assign a sign when you have field and current that are parallel. So we basically see the same uh, topological kind of response, if, even if we follow this procedure, <coughs> or if we just measure it in this weird way. The important point is, the intensity of this peak survives, is, is con coincides in a certain way with the previous publication that is really confined around 200 Kelvin, but survives in our samples all the way to 300 Kelvin and above. So we see the evidence of the topological Hall effect at room temperature and above. If you measure this way, our fields in plane, it's, it's much more clear all the way in the entire range of temperatures. And along with the C-axis, because of the structure of transition, this topological Hall response has a tendency to disappear. Okay? So, Things get interesting when you start exfoliating. <coughs> I don't want to go into too many details. We, you exfoliate the material, the resistivity behaves pretty much like the bulk. There's a magnetic structural transition here. We just exfoliated iron 512. This is a 35 nanometers flake in a glow box. Prepare and contact, and we put <coughs> burn nitride, this green thing here, burn nitride for encapsulation. If we measure anomalous hull, hold and behold, I told you before, bulk crystals don't show hysteresis. And it's very frequent in this materials when you exfoliate, hysteresis emerge, and this thing becomes like a hard ferromagnet, which is always interesting for applications. Okay, there are ways of analyzing the whole effect versus the conductivity. <coughs> There's a famous and well-cited paper that relates the behavior of the anomalous hall versus uh, the conductivity, and. The terms that you should see here has all to do with dirtiness, skew scattering, side jumps. And there's an intercept, if you plot the anomalous hall versus sigma xx squared, there's an intercept that should give you what's called the carlos Luttinger or very phase-dominated uh, contribution to the anomalous hall, which is intrinsic. 
and the, this slope should give you uh, the extrinsic contribution. You have both contributions always to the anomalous Hall effect. The important point is the intrinsic contribution is always much larger than the extrinsic contribution. You have both of them, but the system is dominated by the very phase contribution. Now, here's when things get more interesting. So I'm showing you that it's fully the flake. You see his treases. And now you rotate the system from the C-axis to the AB plane. And suddenly, I was telling you there was no hysteresis in the crystal, in the AB plane. And I'm telling you the easy axis the AB plane. And then in exfoliated the flakes, we see this huge hysteresis going from four to minus four Kelvin, which is much larger than what we see for fields along the C-axis. Are we changing the anisotropy? I don't think so. Okay, I'm going to explain why. You can put dirt in the material. We can. Uh, this is just to say, this is not history is induced by disorder because when we put dirt in the material, this actually has a higher TC. For fields along the C-axis, we have a much higher coercive field. For fields along the AB plane, the coercive fields are most coincide. So it's foliated flakes. Remember, they show you this peak at very low fields for the bulk material. Now, in it's foliated flakes. Uh, exfoliated flakes, we see things of more or less the same magnitude, one micron centimeter, again, measured along the AB plane, but the peak has become much broader and survived several tests, and not a fraction of a test as we had shown you before. So now it's, it is an anomalous hole, a topological hole. This topological hole is emerging at high temperatures and broader range of fields, and it's very strongly dependent on temperature. What is intriguing the data is this is strange hole effect peaks at zero field at zero field, at zero field, at zero field. How can you have a maximum Hall effect at zero field? You cannot have a maximum Hall effect at zero field. If it is just the domains, it should be like this. Domain wall should be pinned, it should not move. This thing is moving continuously and give you a Hall response at the zero field, okay? So how do I understand this data? Is a preliminary understanding of this data. I mean, I'll come to this in a moment. I just want to say that when you exfoliate the material, the anomalous hall shows a maximum for a certain thickness. And the way we understand this, you have many interactions that are competing. You're favoring a, a set of competition interactions that seems to maximize the number of topological charges in the material. With merons and skirmions, these are micromagnetic simulations. We are trying to explain the presence of skirmions, the presence of merons in the system through micromagnetic simulations. This is all in our advanced materials, ACS Nano. These are the topological charges we get from these micromagnetic simulations. The maximum topological charge would happen around 20, 30 or so nanometers, and it gives a maximum of anomalous Hall effect. However, when you measure the Thickness dependence uh, for the same exfoliated flakes in plane is continue to see these spikes at zero field and evolving hysteresis. It's not like you have pin domains. And this hysteresis, I'm going to come back to, to this image in, in, in a second. This hysteresis is not seen in minus resistance. It's the same um, device. This is my longitudinal magnetic resistance. So instead of measuring hole, I'm going to measure the magnetic resistivity. You go to 100 Kelvin, basically comes back to the same value. There's no hysteresis at all. 200 Kelvin, the same story. 120 Kelvin, the same story. Perhaps a little bit of hysteresis at lower temperatures, but always comes back to the same value. So there's no hysteresis in, in the, in the, in the, in the magnetic resistivity. If it is a domain walls, they're pinning and they're creating scattering. They're reconfiguring when you, you change magnetic field, when you change temperature. You should see hysteresis in all physical variables. Why you see any large hysteresis is just in this weird Hall response. The Hall will only be susceptible to anything that affects the Hall response. What does affect the Hall response? Very phase spin textures. So what we're speculating here is when you apply a large magnetic field, you wipe out all domain walls in the material. The material becomes fully ferromagnetic. But when you come back, you create domains and domain walls, particularly between these uh, planet ferromagnetic domains. And what do you have between them? Barons. That's what it has shown. So it seems that the field is right in barons with a particular spin texture, a particular chirality. When we come back, they survive. And uh, the micromagnetic simulation seems to suggest that the maximum uh, topological charge density would happen at zero field. So it seems like what it, so this is speculative. This point. have a very broad distribution of domain sizes. Yes, 
But at the center of this, 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 uh, this at the vertices of these domains, planar domains, we always seem to have a, a metal on there. So we're speculating that actually we are writing spin textures, right? That's what you need for memories. And you're detecting with electrical signal uh, their density through the, what seems to be a topological Hall effect even in zero field. So that's the, the entire point here. Why do we care about this? We care because it's the basics of memory elements. Many, many people have been proposed this um, racetrack, skirmish on racetracks for memories that you could write the spin texture and read them. Well, this could, this materials could provide an avenue to detect the topological spin textures with an electrical signal, right? So that's could be. I mean, there's a lot of questions we have to answer to confirm this is true. It's part of what I, I submitted my Department of Energy grant. And it was renewed recently. The, uh, last week I received it, and the message was renewed. So we're going to explore all this with image techniques. So Lawrence TM here suggests that we have remnant skirmions in the system <coughs> at low temperatures, uh, uh, above the magnetic structural transition, although the Lawrence TM always has some remnant magnetic field due to the lenses of the microscopes. So I would just like to finalize to say that this strange topological response peaks like the anomalous hole. Both of them tend to be suppressed by magnetic structural transition. We don't know why. We're trying to understand that. Lotus TM is not very good at low temperatures. And they don't have are on a good stage to collect data below 100 Kelvin, but the, the, the strange topological hall seems to disappear, although the magnetization is increasing, and there's this remnant value that always remains even at low temperatures. And this strange topological hall scales with anomalous hall. If I'm saying this is dominated by very phase, it would imply this guy is also dominated by very phase of charge gas. So I would like to finally say that we are working now a lot in this compound iron 3 gallium tellurium 2 that we grew. It has a great temperature about 267 Kelvin, it's much higher temperature. An interesting part is that um, you can prove this thing, this is Lawrence TM at 323 Kelvin, you can see the skirmions here. You can see they survive, actually their density decreases with uh, altitude, and that's history, you can warm up, and for some reason when you warm up, for reasons that you do not fully understand, uh, the skirmions are wiped out, and there's some history in the magnetization between field cool and not field cool. So this, his, this history is the magnetization seems to be associated with the evolution uh, of spin textures. What is, why I'm showing this up? Just to say that this material shows skirmions at the room temperature, we're seeing femino not feminology that's quite similar to what we're seeing here in 502. So at this material is um, um, opening an avenue for skirmionics, emeronics, memory elements, perhaps computation, perhaps quantum computation, God knows what. At room temperature. So and you say you see uh, hysteresis above the curie temperature or not? This is below because the, the, the curie temperature of this compound is 367, 65 Kelvin. So uh, of this compound. But I mean, you did say you see the almost all effect. No, I want to, well, I, I should have shown perhaps the magnetization. What I'm saying is that <coughs> you have a hysteresis between field cooled and zero field cooled as we expect all as before a ferromagnet, right? But if you're always in field cooled and field warm conditions, that you should not see hysteresis. You still see hysteresis in a narrow region above 200 Kelvin. This is the difference in magnetization. And you can see that it seems to be associated with skirmions. We don't fully understand. When you cool down, when you cool under field at the beginning, you already have skirmions. When you warm up, they take a little bit of more temperature to form. So we don't fully understand why. But this is the same thing we want to, to explore. Uh, what is the time of life of skirmions? How do they survive at high temperatures? Can we try them with current? Can we manipulate, manipulate them with a perpendicular electric field, and, and et cetera? There are many things to be done here. So how much time do I have? Uh, uh, five more minutes. OK, let me just summarize that and leave, and leave space, space for questions. So we seem to be seeing a novel type, a novel configuration of a topological transport associated with complex, non-complainant spin textures in iron, and I should put it here, gallium iron and germanium, gallium tellurium two. In IO512, we expose the coexistence of merons and skirmions, although the material is inversion symmetric. I'm supposed to surprise that no one here is asking me, how is it possible to have skirmions and merons if it's inversion symmetric? Perhaps I can give you an answer. We see a gigantic anomalous topological hole under exfoliation. 
a stronger reversibility from playing fields in a larger remnant of biological hall effect component. Is it the metal I'm driven? Is, is what we're trying to, is what we're speculating, that's what we're trying to clarify in the future. Or is one writing merons in a magnetic field and then reading them with a, via hall voltage? Even at zero field, how common these things seem to have a specific reality? And could, if it is true, then we could be thinking about developing a memory elements. We could bring all this to room temperature. These materials have higher Curie temperatures, can be grown in a large area by MBE. This has been shown already. Are they, are they a new paradigm for skermionics or a beginning of the skermionics? So thank you, and I'll answer your questions. Thank you, Luis. Questions? Yes. Do, do I understand correctly? You suggest the merons line up along the domain walls? No, in the center, right? Not the domain walls. Come on. Let's have my computer. So <clears throat> this is a domain, right? You have you have textures of spins. The domains are you have basically a vortex of the spins, but it's not a simple vortex of spin. You can see the projection here at the center of the vortex. The, the moment is coming out. So it's, it is a meron in the sense that they have a vortex in the plane, but progressively the moments come out of the plane at some point perpendicular to the plane. And these things happen between mom, between domains. So here's domain wall, right? Separation between domains. You see this black domain walls here and this white domain walls here. They tend to meet a specific point, like a vortex, meet, where you meet different types of domains, different orientation, and form the vortices. So the merons are at the center. That's how we understand them. OK. But, but as you said, I mean, skirmia is a, can be viewed as a pair of merons. Yes. So is there a sharp distinction between just a collection of merons or a collection of skirmia? Well, one has a. One has a chair number one half, or another one has a different chair number yeah, but I mean, one. They, they, they're different in pairs, right? The right, but, 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 but no, absolutely. That's a good question. But the difference, what we know is that the skirmions happen in this labyrinthine domains, right? It's a specific texture of domains, which is not this texture here. And, and, and for reasons we don't fully understand, we start seeing domains at low temperatures that suddenly might end up to be close perpendicular to the plane. Here, why you see the skirmions. At high temperatures, we don't see evidence for skirmions. We just see these merons here. It's not like you're breaking up skirmions and, and forming pairs of meron and anti meron. Right. And that, that's the fundamental question. If you're creating pairs of merons and anti merons, should, you would expect to have a topological charge neutrality. So, how are we breaking this topological charge neutrality in the plane? It seems that we have a favor in a particular chirality. The question when you bring it back, because probably the field is always a little bit tilted, not perfectly aligned on the AV plane. So yeah, this is the thing we're trying to understand. How is it possible you break this charge symmetry and it remains when you bring the field to zero to explain our data? Okay, that's the question that we, we, are, we are asking right now. Have you looked at the uh, uh, bias current dependence of this topological uh, Hall component? Uh, I'm asking that because I'm <laughs> sure you're aware I'm wondering whether it's a linear response or a nonlinear response. It's a very good question. In the range of currents that we measure, we seem to be in the linear regime response still. But uh, this is something that we are going to explore that I have proposed in my proposal to you to make a systematic study, particularly in the deflates. As we etch them, we have nice, well defined, defined channels for all effect, not just a randomly oriented deflates. How because you want a precise geometry channel to do AV characteristics, right? You don't want a very homogeneous distribution of current in, in, in the system. So these are things we're going to explore in the future. Yeah. Can we move them? How much current do we need for them? Can we image them as we're moving them? These are things to be moved to, that we're going to do next. I mean, could this be related to the nonlinear Hall effect in some way? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. What do you mean? Uh, you know, in, in these uh, uh, non-central symmetric uh, materials, there is this nonlinear Hall oh, effect. You're talking about the second order. Right, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so we have explored a little bit, and I think we have not managed to see, but I, I did a weird few studies if it is a, a second harmonic 
yeah. uh, Hall effect. But yes, there's still everything to be done here in this system. I mean, that's a zero field effect. Yes. Any other questions? Not. Let's thank uh, my best question. Oh. He was promised to tell something about the Lachinsky Marine interaction and the interesting. Oh, okay. It was a magnetic interaction tilt, forced to tilt the spins out of play. Uh, there's no magnetic track. Well, what we start to believe is that you have some uh, iron vacancies in the material because, it, at least for 312 and 512, the stoichiometry is not perfect in iron, and there's vacancy order. So there's a paper that was published in, in advanced materials uh, at the end of last year that claims they have done second harmonic generation. And, and in samples, different iron content, they see a very pronounced second harmonic generation. You can only see second pronounced second harmonic generation if the system breaks inversion symmetry. But how come the system breaks inversion symmetry if it's inversion symmetric? So and they claim the samples that have Closer to stoichiometry defect is much smaller. So they claim that this iron vacancy order orders locally and locally breaks inversion symmetry. But it's again speculative. Okay, that's the best argument that we have so far. You have the link, right? Yes. Well, while Sarah is uh, working on it, uh, Sarah is a last speaker of this morning session. Um, uh, she's a uh, Professor of Physics at uh, uh, Duke. Good. Oh, we need to. Uh, so, so I believe she's going to be talking about uh, quantum spin liquid state. Yeah, you have to mute yourself. If you mute yourself. Yeah. Oh. oh, this way. It should be fine. Yeah, just, no, she oh. needs to mute. She needs to mute here an echo somewhere. I think on your Zoom, can you mute it? You need to remove from all your echoes. This is this Mac, okay. Click on the little arrow. This way. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, that should be fine. Okay. Is it fine now? Yeah. Well, thank you very much <laughs> for your help and uh, thank you very much for organizing this uh, very interesting workshop and for inviting me to be part of it. Uh, so today actually I am going to talk about uh, something that has Dirac in it. So, that's, uh, uh, so today I'm going to talk about realization of Dirac quantum spin liquid state in a new triangular lattice system. <coughs> So first I would like to acknowledge uh, um, uh, everybody who has helped us uh, going through these projects. So all the neutron work that I'm going to show uh, were collected at NIST Center for Neutron Research, Oak Ridge National Laboratory and ISIS at the UK. And so I'm going to show some data that was collected at MACLAB. 
so we have been very privileged in uh, that we, we were able to collaborate with very excellent uh, theory groups. So some of the data that I'm going to show was basically done with Sasha Chernyshev's group. And uh, some of them was done by Christian Batista's group. And the more recent work that I'm going to share with you was done by Jewel Moore's group at Berkeley. So this work has been funded by NSF and DOE. Of course, I need to also thank my team back at Duke. So the data that I'm going to show part of it was done by William Steinhardt, who is actually now uh, graduated. And uh, some of the work has been done by Laletia Yadef and, and Robin uh, Bagg. Uh, as well as uh, Matthew Innes. Okay. So uh, it's a little bit different topic. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to give a very brief introduction on, on what we are going to, to see. So uh, my main area of interest is actually on quantum materials, specifically frustrated quantum materials. So frustrated quantum materials, if they are geometrically frustrated, you can imagine that, for example, they would have a triangular lattice. And if the Ising interactions between the, uh, the different nearest neighbors uh, is going to be antiferromagnetic, this side wants to be pointing up, this one would be pointing down, and there is going to be uh, a frustration on the other side. So now if you actually make uh, uh, some sort of a lattice based on the triangular lattice, you can imagine that there is going to be very uh, high uh, frustration. And this is actually the basic science that is underlying the resonance invalence bond, uh, which was uh, uh, proposed by um, uh, Anderson. So there is other ways that we can introduce frustration. For example, if you have a square lattice, in a square lattice, there's going to be the competition between the nearest neighbors and next nearest neighbors can actually uh, uh, define the frustration. And th this is, for example, a one example that we had with the chassis sutherland system, that you have a triangular lattice, the inter interactions are antiferromagnetic, and then you would be able uh, to basically go through different phases due to the competition between nearest neighbors and next nearest neighbors. In three dimensions, we can also have frustration. Uh, so for example, you can think about the pyrochore lattices that they have edge sharing tetrahedral. So each, su each surface is going to be basically a triangular lattice. And through that, we can uh, also see very rich physics uh, basically on the frustrated uh, uh, lattices. So today, I'm going to focus on a triangular lattice. And I'm going to show you some of the uh, previous data sets that we have collected, as well as um, some recent work. So you may have actually come across this material. So it's ytterbium, either magnesium or zinc gallium oxide. So this, in this material, ytterbium 3 plus is responsible for magnetization and magnetic properties. And uh, what, what, what you're seeing here is, that, is the structure of this material. And what you can see is that ytterbium uh, is forming this triangular lattice, which is shown in, in blue. So we have a magnetic ion sitting on a triangular lattice. So it is the best uh, scenario that you can expect uh, for some sort of a frustration to happen. So therefore, this material was actually pr proposed to be a quantum spin liquid candidate. So in a quantum spin liquid candidate, there are ma mainly a uh, few um, um, indications. So one of the indications that you have a quantum spin liquid candidate, which down to the lowest temperature, the spins are disordered, but they are very much entangled to each other, is the lack of magnetic ordering or long range magnetic ordering. And for example, when you look at the heat capacity measurements, also it's going to show us some indications that you have a quantum spin liquid candidate. So when this material came into uh, uh, everybody's attention, there was uh, an indication that there is going to be a quantum spin liquid candidate. But what, what I would like to point in here is that you have a gallium and either gallium or zinc, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, either gallium and zinc or gallium and magnesium, that they have a 50%, 50% site mixing. So when you think about the site mixing can actually complicate everything. And through that, then uh, there was some other uh, um, predictions that came into play saying that this site mixing is basically responsible for this material not to order and therefore an, uh, maybe it is not a quantum spin liquid candidate rather than this site mixing is mimicking what you would expect for a quantum spin liquid candidate and therefore uh, it's probably uh, if we relieve this site mixing there's going to be an ordered state. So um, what we have done previously is actually we looked at this material. We looked at uh, specifically ytterbium magnesium gallium oxide. 
And what I am showing here, uh, here is basically the neutron scattering data as a function of magnetic field. So this material doesn't order. However, what is very interesting about it is that when you apply magnetic fields, you can see that here I am energy integrating the Q space. So you're basically looking at the Q space. And here is the brilliant zone that you can see that the excitations are basically focused at, at a high symmetry endpoint. Okay? And then when we have start to apply a magnetic field, you can see that these uh, high intensity endpoints now become more homogeneous along the brilliant zone. And then at two Tesla, they have actually moved from an endpoint to the corner, the K point. So there's, there's, a, there's a crossover that is happening as a function of field. For this material at three, four, you can see that now they are very well uh, uh, shown that they are moved from an endpoint to the K point. And by about five or six Tesla, they are al almost gone. So this is actually the theoretical prediction based on, on, on our experimental data, which was done by Christian Batista's group. And what they have been able to show is that there is indeed there is going to be some uh, excitations at endpoint that as a function of fields, they would be able to uh, move to, from an endpoint to the K point. Why is this important? It is important because when we have site mixing in a material, everything will become too diffuse. Everything will become too complicated. So any other tuning parameter, like a magnetic field, can actually help us constrain the order parameter space a little bit better. So that's actually what we have done in here. So through this, uh, the previous uh, work that was proposed was giving various type of order parameters. However, we checked those order parameters and we made sure that whatever has been proposed needs to follow this crossover as well. And we were able to constrain that order parameter a little bit better. So I'm not going to get into too much details about this. If you're interested, we actually published this a, a couple of years ago. And uh, uh, you, you would be able to, to find more of the details about this, or you can talk to me. Okay. Now, this is also something that I would like to just glance very briefly. This is for ethereum, uh, uh, ethereum zinc gallium oxide. So also the same isostructure as the previous material. However, in this case, we actually did inelastic neutron experiments. So you're looking at energy versus Q in here. And again, we applied to different fields. And you can see that when it looks like something like a continuum of excitations in here, it starts to show a gap. And then the gap is being increased. And so the excitations are being lifted. And this is at 4 Tesla. And at 8 Tesla, there is a really increased gap. So through the uh, spin wave uh, calculations, the linear spin wave calculations, we have been able actually to model this material as well as a function of field. And we were able to, again, constrain the order parameter and predict uh, and, and give an indication of what the predict, predicted, material, uh, predicted order parameters are going to be fitting this sort of uh, uh, data. So again, this was published uh, in, in, uh, in Nature's Quantum Materials. And if you're interested, uh, you can look at this paper or talk to me about this. <laughs> this material is, is, is uh, predicted to be ordered. It's That's why it has been exactly so. So, but it, if you look at only this, it shows as a continuum of excitations, right? But if you actually start to apply a field, then you're basically making all the spins to be in a polarized state. That's why at eight Tesla you have the spin wave excitations. Okay. Now, so what are the two takeaways from from these previous work that we have done? There are two. Uh, takeaways, uh, at least from my point of view, there's one which is the rare earth quantum spin liquid candidates are emerging and the field induced, uh, for example, uh, crossovers or phase transitions in them is actually giving us some other tuning parameters to be able to look at them more carefully and be able to understand them better. But also, there are going to be some efforts that we need to concentrate on material design, either by going to the extreme of site disorder or try to eliminate site disorder, minimize that, so that we would have a better understanding of what the physics is in here. And this is actually what we have done. So this is a new compound, and it is ethereum now zinc to gallium oxygen. So the difference between this compound and the previous compound is that what we have done is that we have actually introduced a zinc oxygen layer uh, in, in, into this compound so that we would change the, um, uh, the space group. And actually, now all these uh, galliums and zinc are having a unique Wyckoff positions. So this is uh, the previous compound that I showed. And I will call this 1114. 
And so you can see that there is a site mixing between the zinc and, and, uh, and gallium, and the, 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 group, the space group is R minus 3M. However, when you introduce an additional zinc oxygen layer in here, uh, we would be able to lift this uh, site mixing, at least to the detectable uh, uh, resolution that we have, and you're changing the space group as well. So uh, one other important thing is that uh, the distance between the iterbiums and iterbiums is basically more or less the same. It's a little bit smaller, so the size of the interaction doesn't change much. However, the distance between the layers, uh, the iterbium layers, is increased a little bit. So which shows that when you're becoming more two-dimensional, so more quantum mechanical effects can actually emerge in this compound. So I'm going to call this second compound 1 to 1, 5 the new compound. So we have been able to grow a high quality single crystals of this compound in our lab at Duke. You're here looking at the lower spectrum of this. Uh, so it's, it's showing that it is actually very high quality and it has a, 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 the triangular lattice uh, uh, symmetry that you would expect for it. Now what we have also done, we have looked at this, uh, the powder X-ray diffraction and uh, we've, we've modeled this for a compound that does not have any side mixing. And you can see that the, 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 the model fits really well. However, someone can say that the zinc and gallium are close to each other electronically. So why, why would x-rays see the difference between the, them? Maybe there is side mixing and you're just blind to it. You, you won't be able to see that. Now, that's why we actually looked at powder neutron diffraction measurements as well. So the neutrons cross-section for the zinc and gallium is actually quite different. So therefore, if there is going to be a side mixing, we would be able to see that better with the neutron uh, diffraction measurements. However, when we actually freed up all the parameters and we introduced the side mixing, we were not able to, uh, to basically um, increase uh, uh, the fit parameters or the, the goodness of the fit in that scenario. So at least at least within the resolution of our experiments, it looks like that there's no significant site mixing in this compound. Now, the first thing that we wanted to do was just to see if the compound orders. And this is basically, you're looking at a susceptibility measurement as a function of temperature. And what you can see is that down to 300 millikelvin, when we apply the field in uh, parallel to C and perpendicular to C, there is no signature that there is a significant site mix, uh, the significant ordering, long range ordering. And the zero field cooling and field cooling, they do not show any uh, hysteresis. So there is an indication that there is no spin freezing down to 300 millikelvin. There is no long range magnetic ordering. However, if you look at the data in the two different directions, you can see that there is an anisotropy associated with that. And uh, so we, we, we think that this anisotropy is actually quite important in the physics that we can achieve from this compound. So the next thing that we have done is basically we wanted to see where it starts to saturate. You're looking at the magnetization data versus field. This was actually collected at 2.5 Kelvin. And you can see that there is indeed the, 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 uh, the clear anisotropy with the 001 direction being possibly the easy access for this compound. And then you can see that uh, at around 10, uh, a little bit higher than 10, maybe 11 Tesla, it starts to saturate. So this is the, this is the field that is needed to be able to look at the spin wave and to be able to fit that uh, so that we would be able to extract all the J parameters and, uh, uh, and the exchange parameters out of this data. Okay, so the next step, so this data was actually collected at MATLAB, so the next step uh, was basically to look at uh, AC susceptibility measurements. So if there is going to be a significant uh, uh, spin freezing, you would be able to see a, a significant shift uh, in, the, in the peak uh, that you have here as a function of temperature for different frequencies. So one thing that I would like to mention is that if you look at the lowest, so the, it, it starts to move a little bit, but when we go to higher frequencies, it actually comes back. So one thing that I would like to mention is that we think that this peak is emerging because of some uh, orphan spins. So there could be some spins that there are orphaned. And so you have a, a spin a half that is sitting somewhere. And then there is going to be also uh, uh, at 80 hertz, which is the closest that you would get to the DC susceptibility. If we interpolate the data at the lowest temperature, it actually starts to cross at very close to zero. So that is also something that is important in case that we would like to make any predictions that this compound is a quantum spin liquid, specifically a Dirac quantum spin liquid candidate. So 
Because we saw a little bit of a shift in frequency, we wanted to make sure that there is no freezing in the spins. And therefore, what we have done is basically we have actually looked at the core coal equation and the core coal plot. So you're looking at the imaginary and, 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 and real part of the AC susceptibility. And what you can see here is that if you plot these two as a function of different temperatures, so we were able to go down to 20 millikelvin, thanks to the nice facilities that you guys have in here. So uh, we were able to look at the data. And if you fit it to the cold coal equation, so one, there is a cold coal parameter alpha in here. So if the data is fitted to this alpha, the value for alpha is actually going to give us information uh, if it's freezing or if it's staying dynamic. So we want it to be dynamic as a quantum spin liquid candidate. So the values that we got for alpha is actually, you can see, that's very close to zero. Actually, for our lowest temperature, which is more susceptible to spin freezing, it's actually the smallest one and the closest to zero. So the zero means that you have some sort of a semicircle that is appearing. However, if this alpha was close to one, you would get some sort of a flat uh, uh, line shape in here, and that would be an indicative of, uh, of a spin freezing in the compound. So with additional uh, measurements down to 20 millikelvin, we say that the spins for this compound stays quite dynamic. It's a good indication that probably we are really dealing with a quantum spin liquid candidate. <coughs> so the next step is to look at the, uh, the heat capacity measurements. So for the heat capacity measurements, so here you're looking at the 1 to 1, 5 compound. And also we made the lutetium isostructure of this compound, which is a non-magnetic compound, so that we would be able to subtract off the phononic contributions. So here you're looking at the AC susceptibility, uh, at the uh, uh, heat capacity measurements. And here is the, for the lutetium compound. And when we subtract it off and we look at the uh, entropy, you can see that it, it saturates at R uh, log 2, which R log 2 is an indicative that you're dealing with a spin a half, or in this case, an effective spin a half. So there is no sharp features that would be an indicative of a, of a uh, long range magnetic ordering. However, we know that at very low temperatures, it is going to be quite important to make sure that there is nothing happening uh, there or w if there is an indicative of what kind of a spin liquid it is. So here I'm showing you the specific heat data as a function of T squared. And uh, you're looking at the raw data. And then you can see that there is an upturn. So for a rare earth material, specifically uh, ytterbium, what will happen is that you have the contributions from the, uh, from the uh, nuclear contributions, the hyperfine nuclear contributions that is shown in here in the pink dashed line. So we have to subtract that off first. And then one, once that is subtracted, we had subtracted off the uh, phononic contributions as well. You can see that the data actually pretty much goes like a T squared rather than uh, for the, uh, as a linear with T. So if it would be linear with T, uh, it would be an indicative that there is a different kind of a spin liquid. However, if it goes like T squared, we know that from uh, Patrick Lee's uh, and, and collaborators' paper that actually was published uh, in 2007, there is, an, uh, there is a prediction that if you're dealing with a Dirac quantum spin liquid, there is going to be a T squared co component. So you would expect to the data at very low temperatures, as it goes through zero, it would be like uh, T squared. So the fit that we have done is basically just showing that. So the first term is the nuclear contributions, uh, and the second term is the BT squared, is the one that is an indicative that this is uh, a quantum spin liquid, and it's most likely a Dirac quantum spin liquid. Okay. So then the first thing that to do is basically to look at the crystal electric field excitations in this compound, making sure that we have an understanding of an effective spin a half. So I'm showing you the neutron scattering data. So this is energy versus Q. This was done on a powder. And you can see that there are excitations. The first one comes up at 40 millikelvin and 40 milli, uh, milli electron volt, and then at 60. And you can see that there is an excitation at around 90. So here I'm showing you the line of, uh, cut of the data. So basically this is at, at 40, and this is at about 60, and this is at 90. 
And then we were able to model this with a single ion, uh, basically, model uh, to be able to understand exactly what is the ground state. And through this, we actually we know that ethybium is a Kramer ion, so it has a J equal to th uh, seven and a half. So we expected to see the three excited states, and this is basically checking that what we are expecting is actually true. But also, what we, I would like to mention is that the first excited state is at 40, um, close to 40 MeV. So therefore, there is this gap that is indicative of the, our J is truly uh, uh, is basically um, an effective J is a spin a half rather than a seven and a half. Okay. Okay. So here I'm showing you now the uh, inelastic neutron results, uh, which was done on a single crystal compound, and this was done at the lowest temperature of 100 millikelvin. So what we have done is here basically I'm integrating at a different energy. So this is basically energy, and this is uh, Q. And if you can see that there is a continuum of excitations, so it is showing that uh, basically there is no gap. And this is basically the high symmetry endpoint. Here you're looking at high symmetry K point, and this is gamma. So you can see that if you make different cuts in here, we will, um, for example, in this case, at the cut, equal, uh, cut one, you can see that there is an excitation, again, picking up at endpoints, which is close to what we have seen in the 1114 compound. However, when we go up in the, uh, in the energy, you can see that it becomes more diffuse, and then by cut four, it is basically gone. So at the lowest energy, uh, 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 low-lying energy excitations, uh, the intensities are peaking at endpoint. So what we have done then at that stage is basically we looked at the uh, line cut. So here I'm showing you the intensity as a function of Q, and this is the endpoint which is peaked at endpoint in here, and these are the K points that it's showing a little bit of a shoulder, and then it starts to come down as we go close to gamma point. Now at the same time that we were working on this, actually Jules Moore was visiting Duke, and when I was discussing this, I said, well, we have this, at that time, this paper was actually not on archive even. He said, oh, we have a very nice data set uh, uh, that is basically some simulations based on the triangular lattice has been a half, which could be an indicative of what is happening in here. So then what we actually done is that in the, in the, in the theory paper for a J1, J2 model, uh, Joule actually didn't use the uh, anisotropy at all. But we know that in our compound, we have anisotropy. So what we did is basically we made this cut and we say that if this was completely isotropic, then you would expect to have all of these intensities the same. But if it's anisotropic, then you would expect to have different intensities. So we looked at the ratio of these intensities, intensities at M and K point, and then we introduced an anisotropy parameter to the same model, by V I mean Jules Moore's group, so uh, introduced the anisotropy uh, uh, parameter to this uh, model, and then you can see that when you go for uh, delta equal to 1.35, which is the red curve in here, it actually shows a very good com comparison to the actual experimental data that we have. So by doing this, the prediction is that the J1 is about 0.5 MeV. However, what is important is that J2 over J1 is 0.12, which in our case is, is practically putting it right at where you would expect to have a quantum spin liquid candidate based on the theoretical model. Okay, so the next step is basically to compare our data with the simulation based on these order parameters and the delta. And this is basically the, the, the theoretical calculations. So you can see that in both cases, there is going to be the excitations that is peaking more or less at M point. And then when we start to get to the gamma point, at K point, they start to be lifted. There is a little bit of a uh, downturn in here, which you can see that we see it in the data. However, we don't see this upturn as it gets to, uh, close to the gamma point for two reasons. First, we, are, we had to subtract off this data from a background, so it is affecting the actual data set a little bit in this region. We don't have the detector coverage uh, very well in here, so you can see that there is this blind spot that is happening in here. Also, what we are sp speculating is that in this particular compound, the spin-ons, which are basically our quasi-particles that are going to be entangled, uh, they are entangled in a quantum spin liquid candidate, we think that the spin-ons are rather slow in this compound. That's why we don't see this upturn that we, we have seen in the calculations. Well, let me ask you, in 
does that look like free speech? <coughs> like if you, I mean, you know, you can think these are free or ignore their interactions, and then the free fermion in the Iraq, the, in the Iraq spectrum, does that explain all the data? Or, or you need some, to involve some interactions between the experiment? We, we believe that there, there is, it's not completely free. So, so well, um, if this was a, a spin-on Fermi surface, we would have expected them to be completely free. But in a Dirac, so you have the Dirac nodes, so there must be to some sort of an interaction between them. Oh, I'm asking you, is there evidence in the data that... The oh, no, the entanglement? No, we, we in this data set, we can't say that it is an evidence of an entanglement. But it's an indication that it's so far an indication that it is most likely a Dirac quantum spin liquid candidate. Okay. Now, the next step is now to apply field and look at the data, uh, the, the, uh, the magnetic component of the heat capacity as a function of temperature. So what you can see in here, there's, there's nothing surprising. So you would expect that as a function of field, there's going to be some change. But there is no, for example, sharp features that are popping up. And uh, you can see that the saturation is more or less hovering around the RL and 2. However, if you, so this is for the field par parallel to C. However, what I would like to, know sh uh, to note in here is that in the same paper, so Patrick actually, uh, uh, who, uh, I was discussing with him, and then he said, maybe you also need to look a little bit more carefully as a function of field what is happening. So the first part, is basically the T2 squared, uh, uh, T squared, basically um, uh, contribution of the heat capacity. However, if you start to apply a magnetic field, what you would expect to see for a C over T is basically this needs to be linear with the field. So what, what do I mean by that? Practically, this is our zero field data, and this is C over T. So we actually fitted this to gamma plus uh, be the, the parameter of the linear slope, and uh, which is practically, if you look at the C, this is a quadratic slope, slope. So you can see that at, at zero field, it actually crosses the zero, which is what you would expect to see from a direct quantum spin liquid candidate. However, what happens if you apply field? Based on, based on this, this theory, it needs to be linear with B and starts to go up. Uh, as you go basically toward the zero temperature. And this is what we can see, that the y-intercept starts to go up as you go up in the field. And that is, so that is quite interesting, and this was quite intriguing for us, that as a function of field also, it is following what the Dirac is expecting us to see. But the field is actually quite small. So we started to go to very high fields. And then what we notice is that when, because the temperature range is small, so the energy scale is rather small, so we really need to go to lower temperatures to be able to see, the, to lower fields to be able to see this. So this is basically just plotting gamma versus B. Uh, and you can see that there is, th this is up to 0.5 Tesla. You can see that there is basically a very nice uh, slope to them. And then when we start to go to higher fields, a higher energy range, you can see that it sort of starts to flatten out. Now, what we also did was basically use the equation that uh, uh, Patrick has actually proposed uh, for the ratio between these two parameters, which is giving basically a linear behavior like this. And then we actually plotted our own data over this to be able to see how well they are agreeing. You can see that at the low field region, up to about 0.3 Tesla, they're actually agreeing very well. And then it starts to deviate. And the higher the field goes, you're getting out of the Dirac regime. And then you're basically going into the different phase, which is the crossover phase. But at low fields and low temperatures, they are very in very good agreement. So then the question is, what really happens when you start to apply really high fields? And this is what we have actually we have done. Uh, looking at the very low temperature region, so up to 350 millikelvin, you can see that when we start to go to higher fields, uh, the data actually starts to deviate from uh, what, what it has. So the upturn is due to the nuclear contributions again. This is the raw data. So you can see that what happens is at, at 3 Tesla, it starts to actually give a different line shape. Uh, and if you apply the field perpendicular to C, it has actually at around 5 or 6 Tesla, it starts to give a different behavior. So what we have done, we looked at the magnetization of this data set as a function of field 
uh, down to 300 millikelvin. And we saw that there is a change in the line shape of the data. And here, practically, if you look at the DM over DH versus the field, you can see that there are two plateaus that are popping up. So the two plateaus are basically one is, is basically at around two tesla. And the other one, the center of it, is, uh, or the onset of it, is at 2 tesla. The other one is basically for H perpendicular to see the onset is at 3.7 tesla. So this, if you look at the center of it, it's, or, or uh, basically where it is centering, is at close to 4 and 5 tesla. And this one is basically close to 3. They match with what we are seeing with the heat capacity data. You can see that around 3 tesla, it starts to basically, at above 3 tesla, it starts to deviate. And then here at a higher field of 5 or 6 tesla, you can see that they start to deviate. So whatever the nature of this crossover is, uh, it is basically matching up between the two data sets. Okay, so here I'm just basically showing you how it behaves as a function of temperature and of course it, it starts to become more flat and the line shape starts to saturate as a function of temperature. One more very important thing, if you're dealing with a triangular lattice, you would expect to see sometimes if you specifically have an ordered state to have a magnetization plateau and what one third of the saturation. However, in this case, we see that it happens at one half of a saturation. So it's quite interesting and intriguing for us to understand what is happening in this uh, range. That's when we came to MATLAB again, and we actually used this technique, tunnel diode oscillator <coughs> technique, which is quite a very uh, um, high resolution technique if you want to look at uh, um, magnetization measurements. So what it does is that you have an LC circuit and this is, the, uh, this is a coil. So we look at the frequency of the coil and then here is where we put our sample. So when the magnetization of the sample changes, it changes L. So the resonance frequency of the coil starts to change. So practically we are looking at the change or the susceptibility uh, of the sample, the change of the magnetization as a function of field. So here you're looking at the data down to uh, 25 millikelvin, and here I'm just showing you how, uh, as a function of the uh, uh, as a function of um, angle, uh, the field orientation, we start to see this plateau also appearing at the same field that we were expecting to see uh, uh, from our uh, squid measurements. So this is an indication that. The definitely something as a function of field is happening and so it encourages us to start to look at the neutron scattering data as a function of field. So here I'm showing you the two Tesla data so you can see that there is still uh, more or less a little bit of a gap is opening in here but there's more or less a continuum excitation specifically at the K points and when we go to four Tesla you can see that now it starts to show two bands. Uh, maybe even three bands, we don't know yet, but there are uh, these continuum uh, excitations that are at very low temperature, at very low energies, and then you have this basically data that is uh, gapped a little bit, and as we go up in the field, we are getting closer to the polarized state, you can see that the gap starts to opening up, and at 8 tesla, which was the highest field that we could go, you can see a nice dispersion. However, this is still a little bit broader than what you would expect. So that in that case, it is important for us to be able to go to even higher fields to be completely in the polarized state so that we would be able to extract the parameters uh, based on the polarized state. So here I'm basically just showing you the data that was collected on 1114 compound. So these we, we actually extracted uh, from our, our measurements uh, that was done and the reported measurements that was done on the compound that had site mixing. And then we put it on top of our own data to see how well it actually uh, agrees. You can see they don't agree really well. Actually, you can see that we have a dispersion that's more like this. However, in the reported data, it shows that there is more flat. So this means that probably even the 1114 compound could have a, a different dispersion. However, because of the side mixing, it was so broad that we were not able to resolve that very well. So with that, I would like to conclude that what we have done is basically we have been able to uh, design and grow single crystals of a compound that is a Dirac quantum spin liquid candidate. And based on that, we actually did some AC susceptibility measurements uh, as well as uh, specific heat measurements, all agreeing with the Dirac quantum spin liquid candidate. And uh, uh, the inelastic neutron measurements also agrees with the predictions based on the theoretical calculations for J1, J2. 
And uh, what I would like also to mention in here is that there is a paper that was recently published uh, uh, basically showing that there could be some correlation between the Dirac spin liquid spectrum and superconductivity in cuprates. Uh, uh, and, and so if you're interested, I, I, uh, I recommend that you have a look at this one. And so this is basically an advocate, uh, the, the data that I'm showing and, and all the projects that we have done, that uh, not only one technique, but maybe a multiple techniques is definitely needed to be able to look more carefully into quantum spin liquid candidates and to be able to understand their physics better. Thank you very much. That's right. So we were. Does that show up in your, in your neutron, neutron spectrum? So in, not in the neutron spectrum, but we have calculated that, and it is like about like uh, um, I believe 100 uh, uh, meters per second, which is rather slow of what you would expect for uh, uh, for not as expect. But uh, uh, in diff it, um, the theoretical work shows that, for, for example, a Kagoma system, which is copper-based, it's a little bit higher than that. But we have calculated that, yeah. I see you this time. Nice. Uh, what is the fingerprint uh, on neutron scattering data, the fingerprint of the Dirac spin beam? So if the specific heat square depends on the specific heat, this is one evidence of Dirac? In a neutron, so, so there are two things. So the first thing is that um, we don't have, uh, so let me actually go very quickly back to that. So we don't see um, um, very diffuse scattering. So here what you're seeing is that it's not diffuse everywhere. So that's one indication uh, when we look at the basic uh, J1, J2 for the spin liquid candidate you would be able to see that it also agrees that at K point there is source to lift, and at gamma there is, a, there is a gap. So this is also what we are seeing in here. That's the first thing. So if you would see all the excitations being uh, diffused in here, that would have been either um, coming from uh, a site mixing, or it could be a spin on Fermi surface. But in this case, we think that that, that is more indicative of a direct quantum spin liquid candidacy. And, and then the field, um, the field measurements that we have also done uh, for heat capacity, that's another indication that if, he, if it's a direct quantum spin liquid candidate, it needs to show that linearly as a function of field, it starts to go up. And that we also see that as well. Well, I, so if I remember correctly, is there another follow up on my question I asked before? No, for the simple spin on Fermi surface on dry device, this is a, uh, if you have a, just a mean field level pre Fermions. They expect the linear specific heat coefficient. That's correct. There was claims that it was observed. And yeah. the corrections to mean field theory suggested that the exponent should be changed to a smaller exponent, which has never been seen. Now, in this version with the, with the dark cone, you, don't, you, you have it square, but uh, are there predictions to corrections to mean field theory? And how could this be tested with your experiment? So there are, um, so with the mean field theory that they have done, actually, which I'm not having it here, but they actually did a correction. They went to higher orders. And what they say is that for a different range of uh, field versus temperature. So in our, our case, the field is actually uh, mu BH is higher than KBT. So if you reverse that, if, I mean, if you want to look at the correction, it should go like B squared. So as a function of field. So there is something there, but somebody needs to actually look at that more carefully and, and be able to extract that. But they have done that, yes. Okay. All right, there are more questions. Thank you. Thank you again. Any announcement? Yeah, so we, we'll have a lunch now. There should be like, if you're registered, there should be like boxes with lunches. But I'd like to ask faculty if possible to have lunch here so we can have some discussion about like, Quantum in Florida, and maybe some advice from people from outside. Here, you don't room. mind. No? Yep. Right. Okay, so everybody's free to go.
I wish you were kind of engineering. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I, I'll first give you this up here, this uh, Wayne from the um, Mechanical Mechanical Engineering. We're going back to electrons on the solids and up on the uh, surfaces of uh, on solids. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our research. Uh, but this talk is not all about uh, electron only and it's part of it. It's more about how to use quantum fluids and solids as platforms for quantum science and engineering. So I'm an engineer, I'm from uh, mechanical engineering. First, let me very briefly introduce my group. Um, our lab, our cryogenics lab, is located at the MAG lab. Uh, it's just across the hallway, so if anyone would like to visit my lab, uh, feel free to let me know. I'd be happy to show you around our facility uh, during the coffee break. Currently, we have three postdocs, uh, six graduate students, and a number of undergraduate students. So what do we do in our lab? Actually, uh, our research covers a wide range of topics. This include fluid dynamics research in quantum fluids like superfluid helium and the both instant condensate. And then we are also involved in a large collaboration for wind arc matter detection using liquid helium. Recently, in collaboration with Dr. Jing and some other uh, researchers, we also started working on uh, electron-based qubit system using uh, quantum fluids and solids as, as the platform. We also have some other more engineering oriented project, like high Reynolds number turbulence modeling using cryogenic fluids. We're actually building a wind tunnel using liquid helium. We also do a cryogenic accelerator uh, R&D, and uh, we're also involved in a liquid hydrogen based aviation uh, project. All those different projects are funded and supported by different, a number of funding agencies. With this support, we can then produce a scientific result. The structure looks a little, little bit like uh, the neural network for machine learning, right? Uh, for those of you who are familiar with um, machine learning, you probably would recognize that this layer is the so-called tuning parameter layer, right? We all know with more tuning parameters, you can build better models. Same thing applies here. We do need more tuning parameters. <laughs> All right, so in this talk, in the first part, I will very briefly introduce uh, superfluid helium and the quantized vortices in superfluid helium. And I will also discuss how researchers nowadays utilize superfluid helium and other quantum fluids and solids as a platforms for uh, quantum science and engineering. Uh, and then in this uh, talk, I only have uh, 30 minutes, so I wanted to only focus on two topics. One is how we use flow visualization technique to visualize quantized vortices and the quasi-particle flow in superfluid helium. And after that, I will continue the talk that Cafe introduced the other day. I will discuss some more recent development on uh, electron uh, trapped on neon system as a qubit platform. I will discuss some theoretical study on the quantum state on the surface. And then in the last part, I will briefly discuss uh, two topics. Actually, we, we do have a plan to expand into the quantum science engineering field. Uh, there are a number of topics we plan to launch in you know, all that, but I will focus on two of them. All right, let me start with the introduction. As many of us know that if we cool a liquid helium to below about 2.2K at saturated vapor pressure, it undergoes a phase transition under the so-called superfluid phase. In the superfluid phase, this liquid can be treated as a mixture of two fluid components. One is the so-called superfluid component, which is associated with both sides and condensate of the heating atoms. And then at finite temperature, on top of the condensate, you may have quasiparticles. So the collection of the quasiparticles can be treated as a fluid component called normal fluid component. We have two types of quasiparticles the so-called phonons and the rotons, they're just different branches of the dispersion curve. 
The total density of the two fluids, uh, of those two fluid system, is nearly independent of temperature, but the fraction of each fluid component is strongly dependent on temperature. Close to the phase transition point, you have nearly 100% normal fluid component, but if you cool the liquid to below about 1K, it's pretty much 100% superfluid. So you can tune the fraction of the two fluids. For the superfluid, it has no viscosity, no entropy. Its property is largely controlled by quantum mechanics. For the normal fluid, it's more like a classical fluid, like water, like air. It has viscosity and entropy. One very interesting property of the superfluid is that circulation in this fluid must be quantized. And the reason for that is very simple. This is because the superfluid is, is described by a microscopic wave function. And its velocity is related to the gradient of the phase part of this wave function. So if you integrate velocity along a closed path, which is essentially the definition of circulation, one can easily show that the circulation must be quantized. It's given by a quantum number, uh, it's given by integer, which we call the winding number, times this quantum circulation. You look at helium, uh, this quantum number and this winding number takes the value of one because quantized vortices with multiple circulation is not stable against the fission. The velocity near a straight vortex line goes as one over the distance from the rotation axis. So you can imagine that when you approach the rotation axis, this velocity will diverge. To fix this divergency, actually the superfluid density will automatically drop down to nearly zero in a very narrow core. <coughs> the diameter of this core is very, very small. It's about one angstrom. So essentially, when you rotate a bucket of superfluid, you end up with an array of those tiny hollow tubes. We call it quantized or uh, vortex lines. So although there's no viscosity in the superfluid, but turbulence can be induced in the superfluid by a random tangle of quantized vortices, those vortices can move around uh, by their self-induced velocity based on the uh, Biot-Savart uh, equation. Understand the dynamics of quantized vortices is actually very important because it provides us valuable information for other quantum fluid systems. For instance, it will tell us how the so-called cosmic strings emerge and evolve in the early universe. Furthermore, it can be utilized to explain the so-called glitches in neutron star rotation. And it also help us to better understand the so-called superfluid dark matter here. Uh, turbulence in the normal fluid is more classical, and um, it's pretty much just like in water and air. However, those quartz particles can scatter off the quantized vortices, which leads to a mutual friction between these two fluid components. And this mutual friction can lead to a very novel behavior in both fluids. So I must say, the turbulence physics is very rich in those two fluid systems. Oops. What did I do? Yeah, as a quantum, as a quantum fluids, superfluid helium has been utilized in a lot of engineering and scientific applications. On the engineering side, I think the most notable application is to use superfluid helium as a coolant. Um, actually, heat transfer in superfluid helium is not by convection, like that in water. Instead, it's by a new mode, the so-called thermal counterflow. So if we turn on a heater in a closed channel filled with superfluid helium, what will happen is that the normal fluid will simply just move away from this heater, carry the heat away from the heat. And then the superfluid component will move in the opposite direction to compensate the fluid mass. This is what we call thermal counterflow. Those two fluids can interpenetrate each other. This heat transfer mode is extremely effective. It actually leads to an effective thermal conductivity orders of magnitude higher than that for pure metal at a low temperature. For this reason, actually engineers utilize superfluid helium as a coolant in a lot of applications. For instance, at the MagLab, we use superfluid helium to cool down supernatural magnet. And engineers also use superfluid helium to cool down particle accelerators and the satellite. However, we must remember this is a fluid. So when the relative velocity between the two fluid component exceeds some threshold, turbulence can set in, and you have quantized vortices spontaneously develop in the superfluid. That tangle of vortices can impede the normal fluid flow, and then lead to a significant degradation of heat transfer in the superfluid here. 
So this is, is, is essentially the reason why we want to study fluid flow and hydrodynamics in this uh, two fluid system. I also wanted to mention that actually superfluid healing has been utilized as a platform for quantum sensing, quantum detectors, and quantum simulators. For instance, like superconductor, Josephson effect also exists in superfluid healing. If we separate two domains, two volumes of superfluid healing by a small aperture, and then change the chemical potential by simply just varying or increase the temperature and pressure in one volume, then what will happen is that there will be an oscillating mass flow through this aperture. This has been demonstrated. It's pretty much like the, uh, the Josephson effect in superconductor. Now you can imagine one can build a circuit like this, including two uh, Josephson junctions, and you will, uh, once you change the chemical potential, you will have interference. This device, it's neutral, so it definitely does not couple to the magnetic field, but it does couple to rotation. So this is, this is a very sensitive uh, uh, sensor uh, for sensing rotational motion. And it has been proposed that one can build a so-called quantum gyroscope based on this uh, device. It will be very, very sensitive. It can be utilized to de detect small rotation in Earth and even earthquake. As I mentioned, uh, our group uh, is currently involved in a large collaboration for wind documented detection using liquid helium. And the, one of the key concepts there is one can make use of the so-called quantum evaporation mechanism. But I don't have details, uh, but I don't have time to discuss the details. You may check those papers for relevant detail. Uh, recently, uh, a group uh, at University of Nottingham, they demonstrated that uh, there exists a very interesting analogy between a surface wave in superfluid healing near the so-called uh, bathtub vortex tube to the so-called uh, to uh, essentially the uh, gravitational wave near black hole. So they demonstrate that those two systems, although they are very different, but they're, they're, they show a lot of similarities. So they can do experiment in the laboratory to gain knowledge about black hole and the gravitational wave near black hole. Furthermore, as uh, Parfait mentioned yesterday, um, actually liquid helium, superfluid helium, is among the very first system proposed for quantum computing. This is because if you put an electron on the surface, the electron can be automatically bind to the surface of liquid helium. And then one can utilize and form essentially some discrete Rydberg state. So one can make use of those Rydberg state to form qubit, or one can use the spin state or the lateral motion state to form the qubit. There has been a lot of uh, research on this topic over the past two decades. Recently, the face group showed that replacing the liquid helium with solid neon, actually he can show very good uh, uh, qubit uh, operation and very long coherence time. So this is something I will discuss a little bit uh, in my talk as well. All right. Now, let me start with the first topic, uh, visualization, flow visualization in superfluid helium. I mean, this is a liquid. What's the best, most powerful method to start the flow of a liquid? Definitely, definitely flow visualization. Um, one of the very powerful flow visualization methods is the so-called particle tracking velocity method. This was first demonstrated by Dan Lasserov's group in collaboration with Shirini. So what they did is they make a mixture of hydrogen gas and helium gas. And then they inject the gas mixture directly into liquid helium. What they find is that in the superfluid phase, very interestingly, they find that those particles move around. But beside those particles sort of uniformly distributed in the liquid, they also see some line structures. They quickly realize that those line structures are actually quantized vortices decorated with the trace particles. This is because if you have a trace particle nearby a vortex line, you can imagine that the velocity, the flow velocity near the vortex line will be higher than the velocity on the far side. So the, due to the Bernoulli effect, there's a net pressure pushing the particle towards the vortex core. This is pretty much like in a tornado sucking a nearby small object. So we can decorate the quantized vortices with small trace particles. Over the past few years, we also built this uh, 
injection system and conducted uh, this type of experiment in, in our lab. And specifically, we applied this method to start a so-called summer counter flow. As I mentioned, the summer counter flow is related to a lot of engineering applications. At the MagLab, we use superfluid helium to cool down magnet. So I care about counter flow. So here I build this vertical channel, put a heater at the bottom, and then we can inject the particle. Once we turn on the heater, we can see how the particle moves around. Here is a typical movie. The heat flux moves upward, so you can see some of the particles move in a straight trajectory upward. But in the meanwhile, you can also see some particles they undergo zigzag motion, and on average, they can move, they can even move downward. <coughs> so we analyzed the trajectory of all the particles. It's very clear that if we plot velocity, the velocity distribution in the vertical direction, we see two separated peaks. The peak with larger mean velocity are those particles with relatively straight trajectories. We believe those are the particles simply entrained by the viscous normal fluid component. <coughs> But besides that, we also see a group of particles, and they have very irregular trajectories. Those particles, they can even have an uh, average negative velocity, and they can move downward. We believe those particles are the particles trapped in contact with the vortices. The vortices drift together with the superfluid towards the heater, so that is the reason why they can move downward. Now, if you keep increasing the heat flux, eventually those two peaks will merge, and at a sufficient high heat flux, all the particles simply move upward. They have some sort of a, 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 a fluctuation a trajectory. This is because, you all understand, this is because when the heat flux is so high, the viscous drag from the normal fluid is so strong, it can pull the particles off the contact surfaces. So all the particles simply undergo frequent collision with the contact surfaces, but they all move upward. Based on this understanding, we, we can then develop uh, you know, specific analysis method to separate and analyze the two groups of particles. For instance, we can measure the trajectory lengths of the particles entrained by the viscous normal fluid. This is essentially a measure of the mean free pass of the particles through the vortex tangle. Through this measurement, we can actually link this mean free pass to the density of the complex forces. So visualization method allows us to evaluate the density of complex forces. Furthermore, we can measure the displacement of the trapped particles and the start of their effective diffusion. For the first time, we revealed that there actually exists a generic super diffusion behavior of contact forces for random vortex tank. Now, in counter flow, all the particles are drifted away from the view region because of this mean flow. So this is not very convenient to image contact forces. Therefore, we developed another setup where we can tower a grid through this flow channel. Okay, this is in liquid helium. When we tower the grid, we can generate turbulence and quantize the vortices, but the mean velocity is close to zero. Now, let's see what happens. <coughs> After we tower the grid, if we wait for a little bit of time, allow the particles to get <coughs> trapped on quantized vortices, you can clearly see those vortex lines. Now, if you zoom in, if you zoom in, you can even see how those vortex lines move across each other, exchange topology, reconnect with each other, and then generate the waves on the vortices, the so-called carbon waves. So from this type of data, we can do a lot of quantitative study of Dynamics. This is very challenging with other systems. In more recent experiment, we occasionally even see quantized robotic rings propagating through the superfluid. Those rings are likely produced due to reconnection of vortices in a chaotic tangle. Now you may ask. Well, it's interesting, it's like a small green in here, but what can you do with it? Actually, the vortex ring data is very, very important. For instance, we can pick out 
some of our best data, for instance, visible X-ray, and then study how the radius decreases with time. Why the vortex ring radius decreases or shrinks? This is because the vortex ring moves through a static quasi particles. So there's a dissipation. With this data, for the first time, we can measure how large this quantum dissipation is. And then we can compare with various theoretical models and then uh, tell people which model works the best. In the past, there's no such a benefit. So we have a lot of different models, but we don't know which model is the best. Now we know. <coughs> All right, um, so the trace particles, uh, the, those micro-sized trace particles, they are useful. They can allow us to study the quantized vortex dynamics. But they are simultaneously affected by the viscous drag from the normal fluid. So now the question is, can we develop some method so we can trace, say, the quasi particles only? without being affected by vortices? The answer is yes. Actually, we can use very small molecular traces. We can use the so-called metastable helium molecules. We all know that when two ground state helium atoms meet together, there will be no molecule state. They will not form a molecule. This is because the interaction between two ground state helium atoms is essentially repulsive. However, if you excite the one of the atoms to the excited electronic state, then the interaction potential will change. There is a potential minimum at about one angstrom. So the two atoms, the excited atom and the ground state atom, turns to a state again and form a metastable molecule. That molecule can be easily generated by ionization or, or excitation of ground state heat atoms. What's important is that, depending on the out shell <coughs> electron spin, if the the electrons is in the singulated state, they can quickly decay to the ground state, so they are useless. The lifetime is only one nanosecond. However, if the molecules in, is in the so-called electron spin triplet state, their decay to the ground state requires a spin flip, which is forbidden. So in that case, their lifetime could be very long. It has been measured to be as long as 13 seconds. This is the longest metastable molecule in all of these uh, uh, molecular traces, all kinds of molecular traces. And then another unique feature is, uh, for those molecules, uh, when, when you generate them in liquid helium, they actually form tiny bubbles with radius of about six angstrom. So at high temperature, when there's normal fluid component, they're completely entrained by the viscous normal fluid. They don't bind it to the quantized forces. The reason for that is, is because size is too small. So their binding energy on the quantized vortex core is, is tiny. So even if there's a little bit of you know, normal fluid flow, the normal fluid can easily drag them off. So as a consequence, they don't stick to the quantized vortices. But if you keep reducing temp the temperature at below, say, 0.5K, when there's no normal fluid, then those molecular bubbles can still bind to quantized vortices, which allow us to visualize the vortices in low temperature limit. Now the question is, how to see the molecules. Actually, there's a laser-induced fluorescence technique developed for this purpose. We can use a laser light at a 9 or 5 nanometer to excite the molecules to high excited state. From there, they will uh, decay and emit a red photon and then crunch back. So if we drive the second transition many times, we can get many photons out of, out of each individual molecule. This method has been demonstrated in the past. So after I joined FSU, we developed the so-called molecular tagging velocity packet. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, so we use a focused laser uh, and then create a trace line and then uh, see how the trace line deforms. This way we can measure the velocity field. We applied this method, study various flows like thermal counter flow, and more recently, we created this uh, uh, molecular trace line in a uh, wind tunnel, liquid helium wind tunnel. We can then measure how the trace line deforms near the solid boundary to measure the velocity boundary. Okay, let me now jump to this topic. Fortunately, Dafei already gave a very nice uh, introduction on this topic the other day. So, as I mentioned, uh, electron on helium is actually among the very top separate system pro proposed for quantum computing. One can use uh, either root book state, uh, um, spin state, or uh, later emotional state. Over the past two decades, there are a lot of uh, studies on this uh, system, but uh, there's no clear sign of qubit operation. 
one issue for that is because liquid helium is actually very, very soft. So the surface can easily deform and fluctuate. That fluctuation can easily induce large decoherence, and then uh, 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 so you cannot put the electron in uh, superposition state for long time. However, there are other options. As you can see, all the substances, they can serve as energy barrier to prevent the electron from entering the bulk material. And then uh, due to the image charge, the electron will, be, will automatically bind to the surface. So they all behave similarly. But among this list, actually, solid neon stands out. One reason for that is this is a solid material, so there's no surface ripple mode, and it's very cheap compared to, uh, say, other materials like Kine 4, Kine 3, and it's very easy to produce. I wanted to mention that actually solid hydrogen in parallel state may also do the work. It has very similar properties. So uh, in the past year, uh, a base group did this experiment, and they showed very nicely that they can trap the electrons and uh, demonstrate uh, qubit operation. The coherence time is a very long. They, they show that this uh, is comparable to charge group. But this is not the end of the story. There's still a lot of things we don't know for the system. How much time do I have? Mm, I think well, I, I started at one third. Yeah, so you have about three, you only got three minutes, and that includes questions. Okay, okay. <clears throat> okay, so um, for instance, um, in principle, one can tune the voltage of those uh, guard electrodes and the trap electrode to tune the energy of that electron. So that's why one would expect to see large shift of the excitation spectrum. However, they don't observe that. And especially in some of their experiments, they observe that even without the trapping potential, the electron can still stay on the surface for a very long time. So after some discussion with staff, eh, we start to thinking about how this electron could bind to the surface. One possibility is that uh, the electron may interact with surface deformations. This concept can be easily illustrated. For instance, if you put an electron on a flat surface, the induced charge will distribute symmetric around it. So there will be no lateral force. But now if you put this electron on a curved surface, depending on the local curvature radius, you may have a residual horizontal force. That force may actually drive the electron to the surface deformation. So specifically, we consider the surface bump. And in this study, we need to very accurately calculate the induced image charge. So we developed <coughs> this formula and calculate this charge distribution using iteration method. With this charge distribution, then we can calculate the perpendicular force and the parallel force to the surface. The perpendicular attractive force is always balanced by the Pauli repulsion from the solid surface. So the electron is always confined to about two nanometers above the solid neon surface. Then to start the lateral motion, we calculated this lateral potential. We simply just integrate this force along the curved surface. What's very interesting is that this potential shows that the electron is attracted to this bump at a large distance, but get repelled at close distance. So there's actually a potential uh, minimum around the tail part of this bump. So then we solved the electron Schrodinger equation on the 2D surface, on, on this 2D curved surface, we find that the electron has a number of eigenstates. This eigenstate all have this sort of a ring-shaped geometry because of the geometry of this, uh, of this, uh, of this trap. So specifically, this is the ground state. This is the first excited state in the radial direction. This is the excited state in the angular uh, uh, direction. The cavity photon can excite transition from this ground state to one of this state. Okay? So we calculated this uh, trapping potential, and we find that the trapping potential could be as large as several milliEV, which is strong enough to bind the electron without the applied uh, external potential. Furthermore, the excitation energy from the ground state to the first excitation state is also calculated for various bump geometry. And we can see that um, actually with suitable bump size, the transition energy matches nicely with the photon energy in the experiment. 
we also studied how an applied magnetic field can tune the excitation energy of such a system. This, this can be a very convenient law in the experiment to tune the performance of the qubit. Um, I want to add this one more slide to discuss the implication. Actually, this, this research, in my opinion, has a lot of interesting implications. For instance, one can intentionally fabricate some surface bump and then trap multi-electrons in this trap region to form multi-qubit multi gate. What's more interesting, in my opinion, is one can even fabricate an array of such bumps and then throw a lot of electrons to form a two-dimensional electron system. Now, such a 2D electron system has a lot of interesting transport property because, for instance, if the distance between adjacent bump is su suitable, then the electron can hop from one side to another side. But this hopping path strongly depends on the rounding number around you know, adjacent bumps. And furthermore, if one electron is in the so-called uh, you know, rotation state, uh, you know, uh, non-zero angular momentum state, when, when it hops to the adjacent state, actually the chirality will change. So there will be a lot of interesting uh, problems. All right, let me, I guess I'll skip all this. So this is one of the research we want to do. We want to build this uh, quantum gyroscope uh, using superfluid helium-4. And uh, specifically, what we plan to do is uh, to fabricate a better uh, Josephson junction and then use more sensitive thermometer to, to stabilize the temperature, and then use multi-term device to enhance sensitivity, and then finally build a pulse tube-based compact system to pave the way for commercializing of this device. And there are some other uh, project, I will skip that. Finally, let, let me mention this. This is a, this is a graph that uh, Philip showed we all see that there's no uh, as a funded uh, QSE center. So in my opinion, we really need to carve out a unique uh, niche within the QSE domain so we can you know, make an argument. And uh, recently, we proposed to use uh, quantum fluids and solid as platforms, and we submitted this uh, expanded QSE proposal. Uh, proposing using quantum fluids as sensors, as detectors, and as qubit systems. So this is in collaboration with Dave and with Jack Harris from Yale, and we also included uh, partners from uh, quantum industry. And at last, I wanted to advertise this uh, international uh, symposium on quantum fluids and solids. So this is in collaboration with Yong Sikali from UF. I hope. Uh, uh, you have interest to, to attend the seat. Thank you so much. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 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 you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess we are referring to this track with electrons in this potential well inside of the surface. No, no not, the whole, not, not the later motion. I'm talking about in the vertical direction. This is your surface. The electron binds to the surface. So in this direction, it's pretty much like tightening it. So you mean it's like an exit on? Yes. You have a main charge that's positive, yeah. that's bound yeah. to create an exit yeah. on yeah. yeah. right there. There's an energy barrier, but there's yeah. also unity yeah. charge. So you have actually a potential barrier and this type of potential. Yes. So there could be a lot of discrete I mean, I you. Do we have any other questions? So I guess not. If not, in the interest of time, let's uh, thank Wei one more time. Presenting. So, um, so it's a great pleasure to welcome Daniel Bolli. That's the second Bolli I'm here at the meeting. Daniel is at the University of Florida, and he's still a graduate student, right? Yes. Yeah. So he's going to talk about open quantum systems. Okay, yeah, thanks for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me, and thank you all for participating in this uh, nice symposium. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a graduate student at University of Florida, and I'm in the computer science department. So, I'll be wearing a few hats today. 
I'll begin sort of with the computer science hat and I'll switch over to the more physics hat. So this is sort of the outline here, uh, introduction, quantum computing, what are open quantum systems, and some of the fun stuff I've been playing around with of using quantum computers to simulate open quantum systems. And I'll conclude with sort of some random simulations. Um, so computer science hat. In classic computers, uh, we have these sort of you know, bits, zero, one, and we can create these sort of logic to process this information of zeros and ones. So I guess on the left-hand side, there's a set of inputs, A, B, C, or D, and you can build a truth table of all possible kind of combinations. And then you have an output X, which is sort of decided by that circuit on the right-hand side. And the kind of important thing is class computer can only be in one of those rows at a time. Okay, and you know, this kind of seemingly simple way of doing information processing has really gone a far away, far, far away. So here's just a picture of um, the Voyager. And here's sort of modern day, you know, GPUs. Uh, you know, you can kind of see from, you know, 20,000 uh, transistors to 30 billion transistors. And then we can even start talking about sort of these supercomputers, 400 trillion transistors. And, you know, all our you know smartphones and laptops all are based on this simple like classical information processing, and part of you know igno some ignoring some of the really important work that has gone into making like these bits and sort of manufacturing techniques possible, you know, you know to do these things. I think another key part of this was sort of the abstraction that went along in in time. So we had both like hardware abstraction. We were able to, you know, some tools like VHD and Verilog sort of design circuits on a computer and like, you know, kind of simulate how things go. You don't need to think about error correction. We sort of abstracted that away. There's some like, you know, pipelines and networking, you know, how to use your CPU the, the most optimal way. All that stuff we abstracted. At the same time, we had software that sort of went along with the hardware abstractions. So for example, you know, we started off as, you know, maybe even before assembly or something, for that, but then assembly, you know, C programming language like Fortran and C, and that was sort of showing the power of compilers. Um, and then we had sort of like numerical abstractions, like Linpack, you no longer had to think about um, sort of memory allocations, instead you could think about vectors and matrices, and you can multiply them, and it just worked. Uh, and now today, you know, uh, well, API, so if you have several computers, how do you make them talk to each other? CUDA to program. You know, GPUs and even higher level abstraction like Python and Julia. So now you don't even have to think about you know, these sort of C-like things. So I think this is sort of, in that computer science hat, you know, if we're thinking about quantum computers of the future, it's sort of interesting to think about what, are, what could these abstractions be. All right, speaking of quantum computers. Um, so quantum computers sort of, you can, you know, the first key part is you start with some initial state and you apply these discrete gates that transform that state to a new quantum state. And your information is sort of encoded in that quantum state. And the goal is your sort of the combination of gates you apply um, reach some desired target state which encodes some solution to your problem. And these sort of gates, uh, you know, the kind of key part here is that the reversible, unlike the classical case, and, the, and kind of the computer can be in all of these two TN states. So all those uh, rows in that truth table from before, uh, you have some amplitude in each of those. Um, and this has, you know, this sort of has many promising theoretical sort of capabilities. So one of which is um, to simulate quantum systems. You want to use a quantum computer to simulate a quantum system. There are sort of more algorithmic ideas. So sort of needle in a haystack problems, you can find a solution. Um, there's Grover search, and that the fundamental part of that is the fast, the, the quantum Fourier transform, which I'm showing at the bottom, uh, which is sort of analogous to the classical Fourier transform, where you can encode the kind of frequency onto your qubits and then find, figure out what the, you know, the, the frequency of that wave was. And then there's some applications, uh, and there's some talks today that are yesterday as well, but that were about machine learning. Um, 
But uh, you know, that's sort of the, at the abstract level, but in reality, as many of the talks so far, quantum computers are real quantum systems that you have to design, you have to be able to control, you have to do these sort of state initializations, measurements, very, you know, very difficult stuff to do. Um, but that's what is needed, and you can be able to talk to qubits at the same time. So on the left-hand side is just a schematic from IBM quantum of you know, qubit setup and the resonators that talk to each other in the measurement uh, resonators. And then on the right-hand side is sort of, I like this picture where it sort of just shows sort of in each intermediate level of when you go from room temperature, when you're controlling a quantum computer, you have signals that go from room temperature all the way down to this you know, cryogenic and you know, formula Kelvin, Wyman, Kelvin uh, temperatures. Um, okay, so these are real quantum systems, so you need to find your qubits, so you do some calibrations, zero and one. Uh, you do some experiments to figure out how, what kind of pulses do I need to apply to swap your qubits, and then you do some experiments to figure out when I measured something, what did I actually measure. And these are all kind of key characteristics you need. Um, so I just kind of wanted to quickly segue. Uh, so one of the ways you can control a computer, like who comes up with how do you control, and what kind of pulses you send, right? So you can derive sort of an analytical expression of your Hamiltonian, uh, or you can sort of let a computer do it. And this is um, sort of known as great set <coughs> engineering. You have some model of your qubits. You uh, sort of simulate that model, sort of solve the Schrodinger equation. You compute the gradients along the way uh, with respect to the objective function, which is, oh, I want a desired gate or I want a desired final state. What sort of, what sort of pulses should I send to reach that? And just to show an example uh, here, Um, okay, sorry about that. Uh, so, yeah, so we had these pulses that you can come up with. So here's, here's an example, right? So you can use these sort of machine learning techniques to maybe give you a better pulse you can send to control your qubits. Um, now, kind of tying back to the abstraction I was talking about earlier, you know, this is just some thoughts I had. What, you know, what kind of things could look like in the future? So, for example, similar to what we had in BHDL, these hardware description languages. You know, there could be something to help you design, uh, like use computers to help you design, uh, you know, future like materials or um, devices, and sort of also, it would be sort of like, is there some sort of abstraction over quantum error correction, right? It would be nice to not have to think as if you're using the quantum computer, nice, you don't have to think about all the details of how to implement those sort of error correcting codes. In terms of software, you know. Um, one example is that controls, you don't think about sending pulses to a computer, you think about gates. So that's sort of one abstraction, but you know, there could be others, so maybe a better abstraction for compilers, a better abstraction for mitigation, error mitigation techniques, so on and so forth. Okay, but now sort of back to the physics hat. Um, quantum computers are noisy, and in fact a lot of, most uh, quantum systems are noisy, I guess. And so for in the quantum computer case, for example, what are the sources of the noise? And maybe just a broad description. Uh, you have, could have bad pulses. You might have some perturbation in your Hamiltonian that you had. You might have initialized some faulty initialization. So maybe half the time you thought you were in a zero, half the time you thought you were in a one. So you have some 
uncertainty, and that segues into that classical and quantum uncertainties. You can have measurement errors. You measured uh, one, but it was actually a zero. Um, and uh, the big kind of factor is qubits tend to sort of entangle with their environment, and that leads to decoherence and corresponding Hamiltonians HS and HE. And then you have an interaction between the system and your environment, this HSE. Um, and so kind of the sort of the way you could solve this, you write the joint evolution, you solve the equation. Uh, the time evolution equation, and then you trace away your environment with degrees of freedom, um, because all you care about is how your system evolves and not necessarily how the environment evolves. And then if you make these few assumptions, so for example, you assume that your system and environment are weakly coupled, and you assume that the most important part is the time scale of your system, so that means your system evolves way much, much faster than your environment, you, come, you get to this famous uh, J, GKSL equation. Um, now, it, it's kind of express. Um, this is a differo, dif, differential equation with an integral, so it's not the easiest to work with. So I'll kind of present here an alternative viewpoint, where instead of viewing that environment as one large uh, body of degrees of freedom, you view it as smaller, discrete sort of packets that interact with your system. So now your Hamiltonian becomes a sum over all of the individual environmental plus the interaction with the environment in your system. Um, and now how this sort of works is you evolve, you start an initial known state of the environmental, like could be qubit or some degrees of freedom. In those initial state, you couple it to your system for some time um, driven by this unitary U of S, which is given by that Hamiltonian. So it's a short duration of time that happens. Then you forget about that qubit. Then you start again. You couple a new, um, sort of known initial state of the environment, you couple it to your system, and you keep repeating this procedure. Okay, so what this, this is sort of um, resembles, so it's called sort of the collision model because it's sort of, you can imagine your environmental qubits or environmental degrees of freedom are sort of hitting and then you forget about them. So they're kind of colliding with your system. And this picture is actually just uh, a picture of Markovian memoryless dynamics because you're ignoring any sort of memory that could happen with your environmental uh, system. But that is not to say, so if you were to include, so for example, if you were to say, um, you know, let's say you forgot about one environment, but then you let the next one next environmental qubit interact with that old environmental qubit, well now you can restore memory effects. And so there's a nice balance, you know, you can play around with, you know, how much memory do you want? And it's an easy way to control it with this sort of model. Okay, so let me now segue into how can you use this model and simulate it using a quantum computer. So the goal that I will sort of target is, or the goal I want to do is I want to use these sort of models to prepare a desired state on a quantum computer. And this could be a pure state or it could be a mixed state. Um, and now, how would you do that sort of today on a real quantum computer? Well, first, you could do a set of different measurements and different bases such that you know each time you measure, you project into one state, and then you measure again, and you project to a different state. So that means you need a universal measurement basis, which you're not going to have. And also, if you don't have a universal basis, you could end up having a probabilistic result of being one state or the other state. The other way is to just let your system cool. Um, so you let you know your so you start to stay, and it sort of cools, uh, and you hope that it doesn't get stuck in some meta stable minimum. Um, you know, the kind of the problem is that this can only go to the ground state, and also the larger your size of your system, the more cooling you need. Uh, and sort of the last way, sort of that's kind of traditional quantum computing, is you start with a precise known initial state, and then you evolve it. You know, even more <coughs> precise control of some Hamiltonian, and you evolve in time to reach your desired target state. So there's, you know, that requires precise control and precise knowledge of the initial state. Now, 
what is our wish list? Um, we want to prepare that des desired target state. Um, another point is the initial state should be arbitrary. We should not know exactly. We, it's unknown to us. So that's, you know, these are wish lists. We want to be sort of robust to any perturbations that could happen. Um, you know, you, you woke up, you spilled some coffee, you know, it should be robust to that sort of stuff. And, you know, you don't want exact control of the time of operation. Um, and, you know, the target state can be arbitrary, not necessarily the ground state. So how do we, so what I'll call is passive steering, and let's remember that collision model. So we prepare all our environmental qubits in some initial state. We then let these qubits collide with our system with what I'm calling strength J. And we forget about, we measure these environmental qubits and forget about the result. And what I'm calling here, the terminology is, it's blind in the sense that we don't care about the measurement results of the environmental qubit, and it's passive because we're not changing the collision operation that happens. Um, but we can vary the strength, so I'll get to that later. So here's a schematic of a, just one environmental qubit, well, actually, well several environmental qubits, um, but I'm using one, sort of on a quantum computer, I'm using one qubit that's being reset to act as the same initial environmental qubit. And you want to design sort of this operator U, that collision operator, such that with each iteration, you get closer and closer to your desired, desired target state. So here's an example of how that would look like. You know, no matter where you started on the block sphere, you end up converging with each iteration of these collisions. You end up converging to the desired final state. And so here's some plots from IBM uh, quantum computers, from a few different IBM quantum computers. So the best one gets you the highest fidelity. So over the course of many iterations, you reach that perfect um, overlap of one. And so that's the left figure. figure. And the error bars are sort of representing, I repeat this experiment several times and show it like the deviation. And you can see the sort of the weaker machines had larger deviation. And on the right hand side is showing that inequality, how close are we getting with each iteration. So at the beginning, you, you sort of exponentially converge fast to your desired target state, and then you start oscillating uh, due to sort of noise. Now that was just to one state, but we can also steer to many different states, and I kind of wrote out explicitly what that unitary operator could look like. Um, a nice feature of this, these set of states I've chosen in particular, is that they end up, if you take this sort of the, fidel the fidelity or the overlap of all of them, the, the discrete sum is actually equal to the exact sort of the integrated over all possible states. So here's just some figures showing, uh, you know, now I'm changing how strong that coupling is and showing on average to all these different states how well did, how well did your system steer to that state. So you can kind of see on the right plot that the best steering occurred somewhere in the intermediate uh, stage, and I'll kind of I have a better plot to show this off. But before that, Question. yep. So why does the fidelity not go to one if n is very large? Uh, and there's a systematic uh, shift. It seems like. Yeah, there's a, some systematic. So uh, one reason is that the and still that environmental qubit doesn't get reset perfectly. And so my assumption of the perfect reset to zero is not true anymore, and so that causes a shift. Um, and you know, also just in general, the decoherence slowly, I think, from the, that until a qubit starts also is adding these are, all, these are just classical simulations? Of, uh, no, this, this is on real time. Oh, yeah. So, okay, so to look at how this, you know, what, what does it mean with the strength J? So we can decompose any two qubit unitary into local parts, so SE2, SE2, non-local parts, and local parts. And that non-local part you can write as a vector of three variables. Um, and so as a circuit, it could look like something like this. You have that local part in the gray, non-local part, we have that two qubit gate, that C naught gate, and then again, the non-local part. And if you draw that vector I mentioned, it's all these steering operations live in this, this whale chamber if you draw the, the coordinates. And at the very um, front of the whale chamber, that means you have 
no, low entanglement power. Well, if you're deep in the middle chamber, you have sort of high entanglement power, and that corresponds, corresponds to the strength. So the best fidelity kind of occurs somewhere um, in the middle of not, you know, if you had high strength, you would need fewer iterations. If you had lower strength, you would need more iterations, so it kind of ends up being a balance. All right, so from this, um, we sort of satisfy our list list. We can prepare, you know, we sort of robust to state preparations, but can we do better? Um, and here's, so before I was ignoring the measurements, but we can actually include the measurements and sort of stop the protocol as soon as we reach, like, we measure one. So we can stop it, and this is just showing a plot that we can accelerate the protocol, um, what I'm calling non-blind versus blind. So if you look at it, we can immediately stop it. Um, Okay, so I guess another way uh, you can do active steering, which is now you consider those measurements, but you also change what unitary operator uh, you use. And that you can accelerate even faster. Um, so you, such that no matter where you started initially, no matter which path you take, when you, you, know, you will end up in that target state by choosing the correct unitary operator. Okay, I'll, I'm gonna skip this so we have time and I want to sort of talk about this random steering. Um, we still have a fair amount of time. We just started five minutes late. Oh, okay, okay. All right, let me... Um, so, yeah, so I guess now if you have the choice of any for this active steering where you consider the measurement, um, you, know, you can make several choices. So these are now just simulations. They're not on the real computer. So if you had some decoherence effect, you can choose your gates to have high entanglement power so that they correct for that decoherence. Uh, if you have sort of random, a uh, bias, unbiased Hamiltonian perturbations, you can also correct for that by choosing the correct set of gates. Um, so what are the advantages of this is you can do this even faster and it's sort of, again, is able to overcome some of the noise problems you might have. Okay, so let me now segue back to that passive steering um, that we talked about earlier, where this blind passive steering where you didn't care about the measurement result and you only kept the same operation. So sort of how to segue into this, let's recall that collision model again. If you choose the interaction H, the Hamilton, uh, HSE, the system environment interaction, to be random, what, what happens to it? What happens to the system if this interaction is random? Uh, well, you can sort of model, uh, so what happens is if, let R be the, the degrees of freedom of each of your environments. So if I'm using qubits, R equals two. So that's the environmental degree of freedom. And what happens is every, every time you apply that collision, uh, collision, your, your system state changes. And that's sort of modeled by that top equation, how that changes. And if I look at that mathematical operator, that governs how the system changes. If I look at that spectral analysis, so I look at the eigenvalues of that map, it has one eigenvalue, which is always equal to one. There, or at least, there's always, there has to be at least one eigenvalue of eigenvalue one, and that's um, given by the trace preservation of your system. And the corresponding eigenvector, I'll call the steady state. Okay, so that's where, that steady state is where your system converges to as you do all these collisions. All the other eigenvalues sort of live in this disk, and they're given by the radius of one over square root of your degrees of freedom of the environment, okay? Um, and that dictates the convergence. So how fast does your system converge to that steady state? This one over r squared of r, okay? And that steady state um, if you do all these random collisions, that steady state is also random. And that randomness could be modeled by an ensemble of these complex Weierstrass matrices. And these x are basically rectangular, complex Gaussian distributed values. Um, and uh, how long the rectangle is, is the degrees of freedom that you have at R. And another way to think about it is that steady state can be viewed as a mixture of random pure states weighted by the special um, lambda, that eigenvalue, that lambda is this multivariable distribution um, 
where at kind of large limits, it follows this Archenko Pasteur distribution. And I'll show a picture of that later. So basically, you have these you have random pure states that are weighted by another random variable um, in, the, in, the, in, these, uh, in this limit. Okay, and if you were to measure that density, you would be taking the contribution of your random state and that random eigenvalue, that lambda. Um, now let me sort of show how this looks like in a circuit. So you're applying the same operation over and over, so you're steering. Um, and how does that steering, how do I implement that on a quantum computer? Well, I take uh, pairwise random two qubit gates, sort of shown on the bottom, and there is a nice sort of proof that each, if you if you do this, if you layer these random gates several times, you approximate closer and closer to a true unitary operator. So the depth, it's kind of each depth d is a correction of the df moment of your unitary measure. Um, so that's so that's what I run on the kind of on a quantum computer. I take this uh, random uh, I, in the experiments I do, I say d equals three. So I have these three depth, three random circuit, and I plug that into the top, and I just repeat that same circuit several times with a measurement of one of the qubits. Um, and this, here's just a picture of what happens to the correction of your eigenvalues of that map um, when you add the layers. And here's sort of that Marchinko Pasteur distribution. Uh, when you add those layers, you get closer and closer to your that, that limit distribution I showed earlier. And here's the sort of results so I did these on two quantum computers. I also did the simulations provided by QSkit where they modeled single qubit errors and two qubit errors, measurement errors, readout errors, and then you can simulate in their ecosystem how well does your, you know, in that noise model. So it actually turns out, and when I was running this, so IBM, this Kyoto device, ended up matching fairly close to the error model, while on the right-hand side, the Osaka was far away. So from this picture, it seemed like IBM Kyoto converged, um, did the best in this random experiment. So, so I was trying to what, what is the theory? What is the theory? What is the theory? Yeah, so the theory here is the combination of random pure states weighted by the mixture of this distribution. And is this a guess or is this actually a result of calculations? Uh, wait, say it again? It's like an ansatz. It's not a result of a systematic approximations. It's like a guess what it would look like, is that what it is? Um, I guess if one instance it would be a guess, but because of doing many, many, many ensembles, uh, the sort of, you'll get this distribution. Yeah, but can you actually prove that this is a proof? Like, or, or I guess. you have to try and compare to the numerical experiment? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what you mean. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, so I sort of simulated, and it matches the distribution, and you have a noisy simulator, which is sort of close, and then you have the actual IBM quantum computer running it, and sort of the better computer matched closer to that distribution. Um, and here's sort of a similar plot showing the distance between that ideal distribution with the two quantum computers, the simulations, and the ideal simulation. So the you can see that Kyoto is the best one, it's closer to your ideal distribution. Okay, so let me sort of summarize. Um, so kind of what's some fun of simulating these open quantum systems using this collision model on a quantum computer. And it's kind of interesting, you know, usually quantum computers are described as evolutions of pure states, so it's interesting to think about what could that look like if you were to use quantum computers to simulate you know, open quantum systems. And here I just presented sort of you know, this passive steering where you can steer to a desired state, but also this kind of randomized where you just randomly have these collisions. And sort of this could be a way, this sort of steering could be a way to combine methods from classical machine learning that variational quantum uh, circuits we saw, saw before. Um, that's sort of an interesting area. And these could be, you know, invest, you can investigate some properties of many body open quantum systems and applications to potential nuclear physics and chemistry and material science. And sort of let me acknowledge uh, all the people that 
sort of <laughs> helped me along the way. Uh, the books that I think were very good, um, and uh, the sponsors and uh, that sort of let me use the quad computers and pay, pay the salary. And thank you for finding me here, and I'll open to questions. Some rigorous definition of open quantum systems. Yeah, I and examples too, which is not open quantum system, which I, is. I guess yeah, it's also a good question because um, you know, it, an open quantum system can be a closed quantum system given you model everything, right? So because we can't model everything, you have a you know you have sort of non-unitary evolutions that happen in your closed system. So this is the example here. You have your system that's closed, and you have environmental degrees of freedom that you might not know exactly. And that would be, I guess, an example. Can you give an example of hardware that you map to say, we, we, it's a cryogenic superconducting chip mm -hmm. correspond to the one on the left? Oh, oh yeah, so this, so the right, so yeah, you're like, you know, I don't know, Josephson uh, circuit could be the S, while your nuclear spins in your material could be the right hand side. So what you're basically saying is if, if you could treat all of those interactions exactly, yeah. then uh, you could it would be a closed system or just a much yes. larger closed system. Yeah, just in a larger space, yeah. But it's because you reduce it to the way you're treating this model, it's I'm like I'm sort of modeling, uh, yeah, I'm trying to model that open system using individual packets instead of trying to figure out all the how all the nuclear spins would interact, yeah. you know. Are they, in your modeling, are every single one of those just a two-level system? Or? Yeah, and all the things I did, they're two-level systems, but they could be. Yeah. <coughs> um, on your, you got a plot from one of the IBM processors, it was like doing passive steering. Mm -hmm. And the, the air bars got bigger, and then as it went out, it like number of epochs or something. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Does the do you understand the um, the spreading out of the air bars as a function of n, or is that telling you something about sort of like where the information is going? Yeah, that's sort of related to the lifetime of the of the qubits, uh, so the t one and t two times. What is that? This answers my question. I missed the slide because I came late. So, so I have another question going back to the open versus closed. <laughs> is it correct to say that a closed system would would be reversible? Yes. And the open system would not? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. You mentioned um, like great and these these optimization algorithms that require uh, some physically motivated model. Yeah. Um, I guess what are your thoughts on those types of physically motivated models versus model free? Uh, it's, yeah, that's a good question. I see. I like model driven approaches because you can understand what's happening. I think the you know you can use reinforcement learning and some like Gaussian mixture models, but you don't exactly know the you know the model. And it'll give you a solution, uh, but you don't know exactly why that solution is, is good. Yeah. So I, I don't know. That's my, my take. Yeah. Um, could you comment on why the Osaka and the Kyoto data was so different? Is it just the system? or? Um, yeah, in the particular, the qubits that were chosen, the Kyoto, the environmental qubit had a better reset fidelity. Than the, than the Osaka ones. And that turns out to give you a larger peak. Um, and that's why Osaka had that worse performance. Yeah. How many qubits were there on, the, on each of the machines? Uh, so, okay, well, the Kyoto and Osaka have, I think, 100 something, but I use only four of them for, the, for that. Oh, yeah. Any more questions? No, let's thank Daniel again.
No, you don't need to play because you just go straight into it. Right. Okay. So, and you've got plenty of power on that. Yeah. Um, and I'll, when it first comes up, it has all of the menus and stuff, but I'll get rid of those in a moment. Okay, so the final talk before the uh, coffee break, we have the echo Ruby from Magna. Um, and he's going to tell us about increasing coherence in Wi-Fi. Uh, two complexes. Right. Um, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm from the Magla, from the group of uh, Steve Hill, uh, Hill Group Electron like, Paramedic Resonance. And uh, in this afternoon, we'll switch a little bit to more uh, molecular um, quantum computing. And my title is Increased Coherence in Lanthanide Two Complexes. Uh, it's a part of this direct quantum discussions, and I would like to have, let's say, 25 minutes talk and 5 minutes questions. Um, so now we will steer a little bit more from this uh, superconducting qubits from materials to the uh, molecular, let's say, spin qubits. So spin of an electron is, is of our interest. Um, so let's see uh, with the introduction. So. Many have also already said uh, many things previously from the speakers. So I'll just start with this uh, quantum information processing and I will follow up with the uh, relation to the electron paramagnetic resonance because it has never appeared here yet. Uh, so in the classical bits, we have zero and one in our uh, classical linear technology. Uh, for the quantum uh, computing, the idea would be to use a starting quantum bit, so we would have 0, 1, and the superposition uh, uh, state, which can be described by the wave function. Uh, here, what is important to notice that for one qubit, the wave function can be described by two, um, uh, two parameters with the state, so alpha 0 plus beta 1. So here, this is just a block sphere, geometric representation, nothing new for most of you. Um, so uh, a two-level quantum system with a wave function. Here we can uh, write this alpha and beta. Uh, and here we see that our first uh, important parameters start to appear. It's a T1 spin lattice relaxation, so the heat dissipation from our system, and T2 spin spin relaxation. These two times are crucial for our molecular uh, uh, spin qubits. So for two qubits, the wave function can be fully described by these four, uh, by this, uh, let's say, linear combination of these four, uh, uh, four terms. Uh, in the end, we measure again zero or one, but this is where the quantum computing would gain the advantage, that we need more parameters to fully describe our system. So for one qubit, it would be probably very useless, two qubits as well, but as we go further for three qubits, um, and so on and so forth, uh, we can get 2 to the power of n scaling when n is number of qubits. So this would be the advantage. Here in the molecular, um, molecular qubits approach, the advantage is that if we treat the molecule, is, uh, we, can, we can chemically synthesize it. They can be uh, very similar, so we can create pretty much cheaply a lot of very same molecules and we can build it from the bottom up. That's the advantage of the molecular <laughs> qubits. Um, so here was the connection to the electron paramagnetic resonance. So as a tool or technique, uh, just to mention it, so here I put uh, these five um, requirements for useful or meaningful quantum computing. So the first, scalability and characterization of qubits. So our uh, direction is the molecular. Uh, the second qubit state initialization, this can be done, for instance, by pulsed uh, EPR. Uh, also, the long coherence times. So our um, direction, what we're uh, following, is the use of clock transitions, an intrinsic property of some of these molecules, as I will show later. And there's also a set of quantum gates and qubit, qubit specific measurements. These we are not really um, probing as of, as of now. 
So here, um, this is our uh, Pulsed machine, probably many of you have seen in the Magla tour. So this is uh, uh, based on the design from uh, San Andreas, and it's a high power 94 gigahertz uh, pulse electron paramagnetic resonance, which works at this around 3.35 Tesla uh, for a G2. So here, uh, <clears throat> what is usually the connection to our uh, spin system or to our sample? So we're interested in, in electron paramagnetic resonance, we're interested in relaxation of magnetization, which is described by this T1 and T2 time in our case. So usually what is the pulse sequence we use to measure T1? So usually we can use uh, uh, saturated recovery uh, detected or inversion recovery detected echo. So here, most likely we apply some very uh, long, low power pulse, then you wait, and then you apply your, uh, let's say, pi, pi half, uh, tau, pi, tau, and the echo, so typical detection scheme, and T weight you vary. For the T2, you, you measure the, let's say, Han echo sequence. This is the most easiest. Uh, tools how to get your T1, T2 relaxation times and you monitor the echo intensity drop. Um, so this is just for the introduction. So what is the quick transition? It's a avoided energy level crossing and here you can see the frequency uh, versus applied magnetic field and you see that uh, <clears throat> here in the at the clock transition the first derivative of a of this uh, parabolic function, let's say, uh, it's uh, zero. So the first derivative is zero, and here we get this uh, energy gap, which is a which is a clock transition. So how to get this clock transition? So it's a perturbation to your uh, axial Hamiltonian. So here again we have uh, our Hamiltonian with a perturbation, which is a, a non-diagonal perturbation. And in the first order, uh, the dfdb goes to zero. So there's increased coherence time t2 by lowering magnetic noise. And in the second order, uh, there's also, uh, let's say, lower magnetic noise. So bigger transition frequency should lead to even reduced sensitivity in the second order. Um, so what are the perturbations we can have in our system? So the first can be zero field splitting generated uh, clock transition. So in a sense, there's a superior work from, uh, from the Hill Lab, which uh, in 2016 showed in this whole new polyxamotalite the increase of uh, coherence time up to eight times. And in the case of uh, hyperfine interaction, there is uh, uh, one example of the S-band, which is uh, 3.6 gigahertz, so low frequency in the cobalt uh, low spin metal organic framework. There is also from uh, two years ago an X-band on the lutetium system. And uh, also uh, this year we published the uh, X-band in the Procidium 2 system. So these are the uh, few examples. There are not that many, so this is uh, actually the one of a few molecular examples of uh, uh, clock transitions here, but it's also important to mention that uh, now we're, let's say, in the, in the frequency range of uh, microwaves. So there's also clock transitions, let's say optical clock transitions, higher frequencies, or also low frequencies, but we're interested in the, let's say, microwave uh, regime. <clears throat> Are there any other zero field splitting generated clock transitions? This we will see later in the, in the talk. Okay, so here this is uh, uh, not not comprehensive, but a map of uh, let's say quantum computing market map in 2022. So it's a little bit outdated, but there's uh, uh, pretty much all of these uh, many companies: this Sci Quantum, Xanadu. This we've seen on uh, um, on, th on Thursday uh, with the photonics. There's uh, silicon superconducting qubits. This has already everything was mentioned. So what would be the, I don't see any molecules here, so what would be the closest to what we do? So the closest to what we do is the ion trapping, 
And this I'll show you how it is related very soon. So the idea of ion trapping is that we have a, a trapped ion um, and we have these uh, we have uh, electrodes which uh, which we, have, we can apply electric electric potential and the electric field uh, trapping the ion in the place. So this is already commercially available quantum computers based on this ion trapping technique. Um, there's been also a Nobel Prize, 1989, for this uh, development of the ion trap technique and uh, hydro hydrogen masers and other atomic clocks. Uh, and in 1995, Sirac uh, and Zoller, uh, quantum computations with cold trapped ions. So this is the, the, the beginnings. Uh, nowadays, there's a few companies, for instance, IonQ, Quantidum, that uh, explore this uh, ion trapping for uh, quantum computing. So in this case, they use ytterbium uh, where there's one unpaired electron with a, a nuclear spin one half. There's also uh, ioning works on the barium. So these are the ions of, of interest as of now. Uh, so what is the connection to the, to the molecule? So if you imagine molecule as a, you have a, ion in the middle and you have ligands around. So you can imagine that you're trapping your ion in a molecule. Uh, so the first example I'd like to, to mention is the lithium series. So this is a collaboration with a, with a chemist from Berkeley. And here we have a, this is an example of a molecule with the lithium 2 plus. Uh, here the lanthanides are usually not in the uh, let's say natural state, oxidation state 2 plus, but they, they like or favor 3 plus. So there's been only up to, un, until 2013 when it's shown that it's possible to reduce these to have the oxidation state 2 plus. So it's quite recent development. And this uh, uh, lutetium 2 plus, we have uh, one unpaired electron with the uh, uh, nuclear spin 7 halves. And this we can use for our let's say, qubit exploration um, and use of uh, clock, tr the clock transition. So uh, the development of these lutetium compounds, so as you can see from 2019, uh, there's been uh, this example of the lutetium-based uh, molecule. And here, um, what is, what is uh, important to, uh, to, to notice that for a uh, S orbital, and let's say free uh, free electron in vacuum, it would probably measure something like this. So the G would be uh, isotropic and would be uh, very close to uh, to 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 for uh, <coughs> and here you can see how the G deviates from this value from two, and also how the hyperfine uh, magnitude, uh, hyperfine splitting magnitude evolves. So. Um, Last year, there's been uh, shown that for this uh, lutetium, uh, this k grid lutetium, uh, there was a 3.5 gigahertz uh, uh, hyperfine, which generated uh, clock transition in measurable and X band on, on, the, on, the, on the tool. And there was a order of magnitude increase in coherence time of the clock transition. Uh, the, the work we are interested in recently, so there's even higher, uh, bigger magnitude of the hyperfine, and this results in even bigger clock transition. But the problem here is that uh, for people who are familiar with microwave technology, there's only specific set of frequencies that we can measure, uh, measure at. So there's usually this S band, X band, Q band, W band. So it's not really possible to, let's say, if you have a clock transition of 50 gigahertz, you cannot easily measure the dynamics of the spin there. So here, the, and the evolution is that for the bigger hyperfine, you have a bigger clock transition. Um, so in this uh, case of this lutetium series, so the, uh, the idea is that you have a, your lutetium 2 plus ion, and it's surrounded by two electrons. So here you have the, uh, the DFT uh, SOMO, it's a simulation, 
where we have uh, dz uh, square orbital plus the s character. This is this pink and the green. And you can see that by changing the ligands around your uh, middle ion, you can, uh, you can get uh, different properties. Uh, and this is, this is the, the G value, is reports on these properties. So this is how we use the, uh, the paramagnetic resonance. So it's, let's say, probing our local environment of the electron. Um, so it's so this uh, ion trapping in a molecule, and here we get just uh, the Coulomb repulsion between the, let's say, partial charges from the ligand. And here, uh, the idea of the series was that if we change the angle between the, 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 the ion, the lutetium ion, and the, the ligands, we would get different uh, hyperfines and different S orbital character. So the increase in axillate would lead to increase of the S orbital character, and uh, this chemical fine tuning would lead to quark transitions that would uh, have longer coherence time, and this would be potentially used in quantum computing. Um, right, so how the, let's say, real EPR measurements look like, so for this uh, three different uh, compounds, here we have the EPR signal versus magnetic field in Tesla. Uh, all measurements are in 240 GHz at 5 Kelvin. And the black <coughs> is experiment and red is simulation. So uh, unfortunately we don't have here this uh, so big difference in, uh, in angles, but you can see that pretty much with uh, increasing the banding angle, the hyperfine, let's say, the hyperfine interaction uh, increases, and this increases your 6s parentage uh, occupation. So this is the this is the idea of, of the changing the angle between the ligands and the main ion. Um, so here, this is the again this frequency in gigahertz against magnetic field, and here this is overlay of the of the middle spectrum with uh, eight allowed EPR allowed transitions. Uh, and here, there's in this uh, image, there's no clock transitions. So for clock transitions, we have to go to the low magnetic field regime. And if we do the, uh, and here we see that in this low magnetic field regime, we can see three uh, transitions that have this, uh, um, uh, that the derivation would be zero. So for instance, this uh, seven to nine uh, transition, there would be, uh, the gap would be 11.3 gigahertz. So if we can have a tool or machine that can go to 11.3 gigahertz, measure the core position, we would expect increase in coherence time. So this is the core transitions in these lutetium, uh, lutetium series. Uh, the second example is the procedure tool. So here, uh, this is a, let's say, follow-up study on the previously reported uh, record high single ion magnetic moments through 4F uh, and 5D1 electron configuration in divalent lanthanide complexes. So the, this is the, the molecule of interest, so it's a procedurium 2 uh, with the spin 1 half, the nuclear spin 5 halves, and this is a collaboration with the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, so here the, the starting point was uh, magnetometry modeling for us, so here you can see the chi t versus t, uh, and here this uh, the Red, uh, red solid line is for the procedure three plus, which is uh, spin one. And uh, here, the important thing is that if you want to have this, uh, if you want to have, want to measure EPR on the procedure two, we need to have a singlet in the procedure three. So this was the initial, uh, uh, initial idea. What, what, what was the in the beginning? So if we would uh, introduce an electron to this. Uh, Procedure 3 plus in a single state, we would possibly have a, a tablet which would be measurable on EPR. So on EPR, we're uh, interested in the ground state. So here, this, uh, the ground state tablet is measurable on EPR here. So uh, how can it look like? So this is the X-band uh, powder measurement on this Procedure 2. 
and this was uh, measured in uh, in Berkeley, and this is what they what they got. Uh, they didn't really know how to approach it, so they they reached uh, with us, and we were able to do uh, high frequency EPR. And I think this is one of the uh, really good examples how high frequency EPR can be useful. Um, so here in the high frequency, this is 70 gigahertz and 5 Kelvin, we are able to get this uh, real nice spectrum and get also this uh, Z component of G and we were able to pretty much get the spin Hamiltonian parameters very precisely which we can uh, uh, reconstruct here with the electron, the Zeeman interaction, uh, nuclear Zeeman and the uh, hyperfine splitting interaction. You see that these uh, they are quite anisotropic, the, um, both G and uh, A uh, <coughs> terms. And this, uh, with then giving back feedback to the, to the X-band, we, we see that if we use the parameters from the high frequency, we can, uh, we can fit this X-band nicely. And this gave rise to this uh, magnetic, uh, the spin dynamics measurements. And here, this is the increased coherence of the clock transition. So here, we have a, a eco intensity versus magnetic field in the low field magnetic regime, uh, low magnetic field regime. And here, <laughs> we have the, uh, let's see, the Han eco sequence, where tau is varied from zero to eight microseconds. And you can see, as you increase, you increase the tau, uh, the eco intensity lowers, but there is one transition that is still uh, still visible compared to others. So here you can see this this uh, transition is much higher compared to this one. But as you increase the tau, this one is still visible, but this one uh, it completely disappears. And this is a signal that you have a uh, you might have a clock transition. So if you measure the uh, coherence time at this uh, uh, at this transition, you see that compared to other uh, transitions in the spectrum you have increase in coherence time. And this is the idea of, of clock positions. So here you can see the eco intensity versus uh, time, which is uh, two tau in this, in this case, in microseconds uh, at five Kelvin. So this is, this is how you can uh, get increased uh, coherence. So here this is the <coughs> pretty much just a recapitulation of the, so this is the, the X band. This is how the eco intensity increases uh, uh, still like decreases, but it's still increased compared to the other transitions with a prolonging tau. Uh, and here you can see the uh, the energy levels, and you can see here the uh, the clock transition. So this is the the most recent study on this procedure. Um, for this hyperfine interaction generated clock transitions, what I've been mostly uh, interested in. Uh, so the, here there's a, this, this, as, we, as we mentioned before, the non-diagonal perturbation generates the clock transition. And here there's, for specific uh, elements, there's some, let's say, boundaries, or it cannot be 50 terahertz, for instance. So there's, uh, in the 70A, the Smorton Preston, they, they uh, follow these atomic parameters for EPR data, so there's some, let's say intrinsic boundary, and this is connected to the S orbital character. So in these, uh, in these molecular systems, we have usually uh, 5D, uh, 6S uh, orbital mixing, and for the, in the case of lutetium, for instance, with this 4.3 gigahertz hyperfine, we can get to 40% S orbital parentage. In the case of uh, prosodymium, uh, we can, with a 3.1 gigahertz average hyperfine splitting magnitude, we can get to roughly to 25% uh, success orbital parentage. So uh, as you can see here, there's, there's a list for pretty much every element. So there are some elements that, uh, for instance, uh, thallium or on here, bismuth, uh, 77 gigahertz. So if you'd be able to control this uh, success orbital mixing, you can pretty much tailor your uh, hyperfines and clock transitions uh, where you want to have them. We are more, mostly in this, uh, let's say, fundamental beginning steps, but I, I, I say the, the apparatus is, is, uh, is there. Um, 
So here this is to, to sum up. So this is the like, load transition summary uh, for the holmium-3, the holmium polytic proximal metallite. This is measured as a single crystal, 0.1% uh, in uh, yttrium. So usually for these uh, spin dynamics, we need to magnetic dilute our system. And uh, these usually work at uh, 5 Kelvin. This is the most uh, let's say, available stable temperature for us in EPR. Um, and the frequency was uh, this X band, 9 gigahertz. And uh, here you can see T1, T2, uh, T1, 20 microseconds, T2, 8.4 microseconds. Uh, then for this, uh, again, magnetically diluted cobalt, low spin in the metal organic framework, uh, we have uh, also 5 Kelvin temperature and 3.6 gigahertz. And uh, T1, T2 orders of uh, um, let's say tens of uh, microseconds. Um, in the case of uh, of uh, last year, so here we can see the uh, lutetium. This was a closed uh, shell. Here we can see the T1 is uh, much higher, 1.4, 4.5 milliseconds, and T2 was uh, 12 microseconds. The conditions were frozen solution and uh, THF, 5 Kelvin X band. Um, here, uh, recently, the, the Prasidium 2, what I showed you, is the diluted powder, 1% in ytterbium. And here we have a slightly higher uh, frequency. And here you can see the T1 is uh, pretty much the same as the T2. So here, this was the 4F2 uh, system, the open shell, and this is probably what's limiting our T2. Um, uh, T2. So the, in this case, it's uh, T1 limited um, coherence. Uh, if we go to higher frequency, so this is the lithium series I showed you. So here, the, uh, we don't have the measurements on T1, T2, um, and, and the frequency would be higher than our available 9 to 10 gigahertz uh, X band. In the, there's also this uh, another one example, a really fresh one. Uh, so here I want to mention uh, our finishing grad student, Robert Stavart. Maybe he, uh, he's sitting there in the, in the back. So uh, it's a zero field spooling generator clock transition. And here, this would be uh, 116 gigahertz. So we can go to higher frequencies. Uh, but again, there's the challenge with uh, measuring the, the spin dynamics. Um, so what we can do, so this year uh, there's, there's a new pulsed X and Q band going to the, to the MyLab. We can we have also this uh, W band, so we can, let's say, ex expand our uh, microwave measurement capabilities, or we can play with the molecules. This, is, this seems to be a little bit easier, so here uh, the collaboration with, with chemists is crucial, and to develop these, uh, let's say, crystal engineering, um, tuning of molecules is, is, uh, is really crucial. So at, at the end, I would like to acknowledge uh, Hill, Hill Group and our collaborators from uh, Berkeley. And also would like to advertise uh, colleagues from our group. So it's uh, Brittany Graham with the spin crossovers on the poster session, and also Manaj Subramania with the gadolinium population transfer. So it's uh, P03 and P09. Um, thank you, and if there are any questions, feel free to ask. I think I have one quick question. Just one. Yeah, Maybe Mike. Eight. I couldn't understand why when you go to uh, Brazilian material L, it remains 5. Or is it just copy paste? Um, it's like slide 13 or 12. Yeah. Yeah, that's a bit delay in the Well you don't need to go back to the slide. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah that's one. So right. Um I'm reducing it I should also get back the old So 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 again, the question is why the L is fine? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
for the ground state. This, this is the ground state. Right. Yeah, so this is for the magnetometry modeling. Now, I'm just thinking, yeah. it becomes, Brazilian 2 becomes like neodymium 3, right? So L should be 6, no? No. Oh, because, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I see, yeah, yeah, sorry, it's too stupid question. Yeah. Or maybe you can tell them. I know that, I know that. All right, any, any other questions? If not, let's take our coffee break, I think.
think we should stop. We want to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just mentioned there's reception and posters, and I think there's some refreshments at this reception, right? There's two other uh, like uh, booths at the reception. <laughs> Beer and wine. <laughs> Nothing strong. Beer and wine. <laughs> No, 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 no. Bottomless beer, but behave yourself. Okay, so the first talk of this last session, which has two speakers, uh, um, the first talk is by Jin Jiang uh, from our FSU statistics department. And and might want to point out we're, we're, you know, we're trying to bring people in from all over campus as well so we can find new synergies um, uh, with, um, with the quantum initiative. So this talk is on tensor analysis and statistical learning. Thanks for a nice introduction. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for coming back to my talk after the um, interesting coffee break. And uh, I thank Mike for including me uh, building this very inclusive and uh, diverse program, scientific program. Um, I want to introduce myself a little bit as I'm a uh, on the next page. Yep. A lot of people ask me from MSU <laughs> internally, uh, where is the statistics department? <laughs> so, <laughs> this is a picture I took this morning because uh, if you just walk out the statistics building, you see the Dirac uh, statue and the Dirac library. And uh, here is the Starbucks and I go there uh, routinely. <laughs> so, so if you go to the Iraq library, cross the way, uh, that's the statistic building. Uh, and the statistic building is uh, uh, quite, quite, uh, quite large. We have five floors of uh, faculty and students. We have about 30 faculty and over 100 graduate students. Is that statistically or? Uh, <laughs> statistically uh, accurate. <laughs> Just some error in it. And, uh, and, and uh, a little bit about myself, uh, I, I got my bachelor degree in applied physics in 2008, uh, 2008. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I'm uh, generally interested in the science uh, and engineering back, uh, uh, problems uh, always. Uh, I, I studied quantum mechanics for two semesters in my undergraduate and <coughs> two more uh, during my PhD study. Uh, and then, um, Eventually, I got a PhD in statistics and become a faculty here uh, in 2014 after I got my PhD. Uh, I'm currently an associate professor. Um, I'm going to be a professor this summer. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, my background in physics kind of uh, always driven me to problems uh, somewhat loosely related to the physical world. And uh, today's talk is one example. I'll be focused on tensor analysis. Uh, so I, 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 I chat with some of you, and uh, you already know what is tensor, or you have uh, encountered tensor before. Uh, so that's, that's great. That's exactly uh, when my uh, first encountered tensor, I was still a student in physics. Um, and uh, uh, since this is a direct quantum discussion, so I want to start with some uh, discussion. And uh, also, during my talk, I know uh, it might be strange to some of you because it's statistics. Uh, feel free to interrupt and feel free to raise your hand for questions or clarifications. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's very uh, informal. Uh, um, and uh, speaking of discussion, I, I know um, perhaps the most relevant thing to statistics will be quantum computing, uh, both highlights the power of randomness and the probabilities approaches. And the quantum computing potentially can do a lot for statistician. Uh, they have potential to revolutionize the statistical data science. Uh, they can uh, increase the increase the uh, computing capacity, meaning that uh, uh, there's no more worry about trade-off between statistical efficiency and computational efficiency. So you just uh, shoot for the statistical efficiency and uh, just uh, uh, don't worry about computational cost. Uh, and a better theoretical property will be guaranteed since you, you're aiming for the best uh, uh, statistical theory. And it also motivates new methods and techniques. But, uh, but um, you might be more interested in uh, knowing what, uh, I, I am more interested in knowing what statistics can do for quantum science and engineering. That's why I'm here. Uh, uh, before I came here, I was thinking about maybe there's uh, 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 some design of experiment perspective uh, from statistics. How you design your experiment, how you design your uh, how you design your tuning parameters, so that uh, you extract the most information from your experiment. 
because we all know experiment can be uh, very expensive. Um, also, uh, statistics provides a unique angle for understanding complex systems, um, which is I try to convince you through today's talk. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, uh, one takeaway home uh, take home uh, message uh, from my talk is uh, 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 statistical inference uh, is harder than simulations. I know uh, 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 since I have uh, so many friends from physics and chemistry back from my undergraduate and graduate years. Uh, I know people uh, uh, are very good at computing and very good at simulations. They are better than me, but uh, uh, but uh, I try to convince them is that uh, statistical inference is harder than simulation. Uh, simulation is not the end of story in, in understanding the physical world because uh, in, in statistics thinking, we assume a model. Like you have a model, you have a parameter, but those are unknown. You know that uh, you, you probably have heard the, the famous quote, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So we have some model and we have some parameter. And after you observe the data, you try to do inference. So that's the theory inference uh, is all about. Uh, from the data, what can you infer about your model? Uh, which part of your model is correct, or which part of your model is wrong? And what can you say about the parameter in the model? Is your parameter theta equal to 0? <coughs> is theta equal to 10? And that can be learned from data. And that's what we are, as a statistician, we are uh, good at. Now, simulation-based uh, is different approach. Simulation kind of a, uh, you, you start with your physical model, and given the parameter, you can produce the data. So your data is already generated from the model you know, the model you created, and the parameter you set. So you know the model, you know the true parameter, you don't need statistics. But that's not true. Uh, uh, if you don't believe me, there's a very uh, nice background, uh, uh, like an overview paper, the frontier of simulation-based inference. And if you read the abstract, you immediately know um, uh, like a lot of simulation-based experiments, the inference is the hard part. Now, the uh, simulation is hard. Uh, I'm not saying simulation is uh, simple, but uh, uh, the, the inference part is even harder. And uh, uh, my talk, we are, uh, uh, I built this talk around tensors. Uh, it, it has some connection to quantum. Uh, um, so what is tensor? So let's start by a formal uh, definition like, uh, 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 from, uh, from for, for, for this talk. Uh, it's just a simple generalization from vector to matrices to multidimensional array. So uh, if you have a vector, you can use AI, uh, not, not uh, uh, no, no pun intended, but you use A subscript I uh, to denote the vector or the element in the vector. If you have a matrix, you use A with two indices, I and J, to denote the rows and columns in a matrix. And each one of those A's will be a number. Uh, for multidimensional array or tensor, you have uh, uh, multiple uh, dimensions. So you have multiple indices. And they can arrange into this format of A subscript I1, I2 to I of D. And each index runs from 1 to uh, whatever dimension P, okay? or, or, or P of D. So this naturally occurs in quantum physics. Uh, when you study uh, many body problems and nonlinear systems, uh, you will encounter tens. I'm sure many of you already seen that uh, from, this, uh, from earlier talks in this symposium or from your own research. And uh, uh, in my experience, uh, when you encounter tensor, uh, dimension reduction is uh, necessary. By dimension reduction, uh, what I, we mean in statistic sense is uh, the curse of dimensionality problem. Because uh, in, in, in most statistical problems, we collect the data, so the data is finite or usually limited. And the parameter uh, can grow exponentially when you have a tensor structure. So the parameter in your, in your, in your model will be uh, growing much, much faster than your sample size. And that's the curse of dimensionality in, in statistics. So we need to do a, a reduction. So reduce the number of parameters or the number of uh, free parameters in a statistical model. Uh, so we are going to uh, talk about two types of tensor decomposition throughout today's talk. Uh, uh, both has uh, uh, ties to physics. Uh, one is the tensor ramp decomposition, also known as the uh, CP decomposition. 
So this was uh, a, a very uh, famous, a very early work uh, in 20, uh, ni ni 1927. So by uh, Frank uh, Hitchcock, the expression of a tensor or polyadic as a sum of products. And I'm going to show you exactly what, um, what is this decomposition later on. Uh, then the second type of decomposition we are going to see is uh, tensor chain decomposition. Uh, this is also from, uh, originally from Felix, uh, the original from the uh, DMRG method in simulating quantum systems. So yeah, there you go, quantum. <laughs> and uh, and, and the, in this area, the two matrix product states uh, representation for this decomposition has been well studied and well known. Uh, but it's, uh, um, it's been popular in very recent years in machine learning, especially in uh, deep learning models and the numerical analysis for the tensor train decomposition. And you will see a, a reason why is it. Um, so given the tensor data, uh, I'm just visualizing a 3D tensor. So you have mode one, mode two, mode three to denote the three directions. Uh, for each index, you, you will have three uh, subscripts and each uh, element is a number. Uh, uh, we encounter tensor data a lot in applications from business application. So mode one will be different user, user one, user two. Mode two can be different product, uh, product one, two, three, and mode three will be different actions they do when they see some uh, like pop-up uh, ads. Uh, there's also an uh, uh, engineering problem from uh, uh, computer engineering. There's image and video processing problem and uh, 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 monitoring problem involving. Uh, so image and video are naturally 2D and 3D uh, uh, tensors. Uh, in, in, uh, in science, I'm particularly uh, interested in science problems. So I have done some work from uh, medical image uh, and, uh, uh, and also neural image from the brain image. <laughs> So, so there are brain image scans that are MRI scans are naturally uh, uh, 256 by 256 by 198. Or some, some typically, those the dimensionality of a MRI scan. Uh, so it's huge. And also there's a uh, 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 high throughput uh, uh, genomic study where you produce multi-tissue gene expression data that can be arranged into tensor. So arranging them into tensor is very naturally occurring in uh, in, in science and engineering and business applications. That's why uh, tensor data analysis is a research direction gaining uh, increasing attention in data science. And uh, I, uh, I started working on tensor analysis right after I joined the FSU and uh, published the first paper uh, in 2017. So I'm, I'm, and I'm still intrigued and uh, uh, continuing pushing the boundaries in this area. So, so it's data motivated as, as we've seen and it's also fueled by uh, computing capacity. Uh, uh, no, uh, no quantum computing necessary, but uh, as, uh, the computing capacity nowadays allow us to do large scale tensor decomposations uh, that's uh, impossible in the past few, uh, like a few years or decades. And in high dimensional statistics, when we say high dimension, we mean the number parameter in your model is much, much larger than your sample size. Uh, this pro provides us uh, new theory and methods. So uh, speaking of uh, high dimensionality, if you imagine the 256 by 256 by 198 uh, MRI image, that's the number of parameters you need to estimate. And the uh, sample size will be how many patients I get. So usually it tends to hundreds. So the dimensionality of your parameter is larger than the sample size. That's why we, we, need, new, we need new theory and a model for high dimensional statistics. It also brings new insights uh, to other branches of statistics and applied maths. Um, so why, uh, uh, and in AI, uh, which is, uh, everyone has to, uh, <laughs> in statistics, we typically, if, even if you don't do AI research, you kind of uh, include one slide about AI <laughs> nowadays. Uh, uh, people, uh, you probably know uh, Google's TensorFlow, uh, you know, that's why uh, Tensor is popular. And in, in deep learning, uh, 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 the deep neural networks, the parameters are naturally a uh, 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 tensor. So tensor decomposition has been routinely uh, used to, spe uh, to speed up the computation, and also, more importantly, to provide uh, uh, explainable <coughs> and uh, interpretable uh, 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 models and structures. So tensor probability distributions 
um, has also been developed and used as prior over those uh, network parameters. And the statistical re uh, dimension reduction helps uh, interpretability in that sense. Uh, what, what, uh, so I'm going to show one slide about my previous work on uh, tensor regression. This, that's my first paper on this area on tensor analysis. Uh, we, we, we want to study what's the, uh, uh, like a, um, supposedly a scientific motivation is what is uh, uh, how the image change from one group to another. Like if you have Alzheimer's disease versus not having Alzheimer's disease, what's the average brain image change uh, structure uh, MRI change so you can identify those regions. So, so this is a, 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 a tensor response regression problem where your response Y is a matrix on a 3D tensor and your vector X with a predictor will be several uh, clinical uh, uh, measurements such as your age uh, or your, uh, 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 or your uh, uh, other, other covariates. So if you have a vector of predictor and a matrix of uh, response then the regression coefficient becomes a 3D tensor, the dimensionality multiplies, okay? So every element is driven by a, a, a fiber of coefficient multiplied by all the predictors plus some error. So, so this is uh, the statistical model uh, visualized, uh, and that's true like in a population sense, which is the true model we assume for every single uh, subject. Okay. Uh, and we perform some dimension reduction technique on this uh, uh, simultaneously dimension reduction on this uh, regression parameter and also the error distribution. We also model the error distribution to uh, further harness the power of this uh, randomness. Uh, a, 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 a second problem I, I worked on would, would be uh, inverse of that. So if you have a tensor or matrix predictor and you want to predict uh, some outcomes, either continuous or discrete. Uh, how do you uh, build a model like that? Uh, it's simple, uh, you just uh, do it uh, reversely. So every outcome is the inner product of a matrix times the matrix predictor plus some error. And then those matrix uh, uh, coefficient aligned together give you a 3D uh, tensor. So it's uh, not hard to imagine. And then we have a uh, covariate adjusted tensor classification uh, uh, method for high dimensional study. Um, so today's talk, I want to talk about some ongoing work. Uh, uh, it's actually uh, 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 like on the on the revising manuscript, uh, and uh, um, and uh, it's quite exciting. So I, I always want to talk about new research than uh, paper I have already published. So we want to work on this uh, multi-categorical response problem. So it's, it's a mouthful, but multivariate categorical response regression. Uh, if you don't know what it means, uh, don't worry. Uh, even I talk to a statistics department, half the audience doesn't know the meaning of this. So let's give you a little bit background on this. So this slide's summarizing uh, uh, the problem of interest. Um, so how many of you know or heard about logistic regression? Raise your hand if you do. One, two, three. Okay, wonderful. Uh, three is a crowd. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, logistic regression, uh, we are interested in predicting or modeling a binary response. So you have a zero, one outcome, which is uh, very common in uh, computer science and uh, computing systems. And you want to predict this binary outcome based on uh, uh, multiple, uh, like an uh, X or input. So you want to uh, you treat Y as your output, treat your X as your input, and X is p-dimensional, p can be large. Uh, now, 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 now uh, the logistic regression model is a very basic model uh, 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 assumption, very flexible thing. Uh, the probability of Y equal to one given X uh, equals X is the uh, uh, exponential of beta transpose x over 1 plus exponential beta transpose x. And the probability of y equal to 0 will be 1 over that. So we sum up to 1, the probability will be 1. Now, uh, uh, in case you are unfamiliar with beta transpose x, so this is the <coughs> linear combination. So beta is a p dimensional vector, x is p dimensional real numbers. So we multiply together beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2 and so on. 
Uh, and this model is the, the, the cornerstone of uh, many, many uh, statistical and uh, clinical uh, 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 research. Um, and uh, and in, uh, in a, a direct generalization to that, there will be categorical uh, 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 response. So instead of having a binary outcome, you might have k possible outcome. So why we will take the value from 1 to k? Uh, they are not like real numbers 1 to k, but the categories uh, uh, 1 to k. Um, so, so, so we denote it as a set of k. Um, then, then the regression, so, so you can imagine equivalently you can uh, uh, call the y differently as y1 to yk, where each y is a binary coding. Okay, so you have a binary coding of k possible outcomes. Then the regression coefficient will be similar. This is called uh, multinomial logistic, and uh, the regression coefficient becomes a p by k matrix. Uh, so each possible outcome is proportional to the exponential of beta k transpose x. Now imagine, uh, 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 it's not hard to imagine, but uh, uh, when you have multiple uh, y's, multiple categorical uh, variables measured on the same subject, how do we jointly model them? That will require a tensor from a vector to a matrix now to a tensor. Uh, suppose you have m binary response variables, uh, maybe you know some uh, quantum application where you have m binary outcomes. Then you have two to the m power of uh, 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 combination uh, of possible outcomes, and that's uh, another uh, issue of exponentially grow possible outcomes and the number of parameters in the model. So in today's talk, we are going to tackle this problem. Not we are going to have m categorical response, not necessarily binary. And we want to model the conditional distribution of those variables y given the predictor x. Um, so, so this this still set up some uh, notations. So now y is y one to y m for every subject. You have m outcomes um, in dimension m, and each outcome y m can have c m categories, uh, and your predictor is p dimensional. They can be random or fixed. Uh, because we are conditional on x, it doesn't matter. And you have ID data uh, from uh, the same distribution, uh, hypothesized distribution from the data. So the goal is to study the conditional distribution of y given x, and we want to move forward from marginal probability to high order association. We want to quantify the relationship among, uh, uh, between x and y, but also among those uh, distinct categorical responses. So the challenge is uh, it's large M and large C problem and also large P problem. So, so, so naturally, um, uh, the question is, do we really want to fit them separately or jointly? When you fit them separately, you are intrinsically, as we show, when you fit one response at a time, you are intrinsically assuming those responses are independent given X. And that's a very unrealistic assumption. Uh, therefore, fitting them jointly is, uh, is kind of a uh, making a model assumption uh, uh, more realistic. So how do we fit them uh, 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 jointly? Uh, we go back to the very basic uh, uh, target of this problem is a tensor problem. So the regression study, if you, if you, um, if you heard about regression, if you aren't heard about regression or don't know what regression is, uh, it's a study of conditional distribution. So it's a study of a variable y given uh, a, a, another set of variable x. Uh, in this problem, we want to consider the, uh, the discrete response. So, so, the, so the ultimate goal is the uh, uh, study the probability mass function, the conditional probability mass function given as follows. So p of j1 to jm uh, given x, which is a functional of x. That's defined as a probability of y1 equal to possible uh, category uh, outcome j1, ym equal to jm, given x equal to x. Of course, it being a probability means it's uh, uh, greater than or equal to 0, and it's, uh, of course, less than 1. So collectively, uh, you can arrange them uh, by those indices, and it becomes a c1 by c2 by cm uh, probability tensor. And it's not just a, 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 a fixed tensor, but it's a functional of x. Uh, and it's element-wise bounded between 0 and 1. It varies value uh, over x, and it has additional constraints, such as its sum to 1 constraint, since they are probability mass function. And directly decompose this tensor is not possible. So yeah, 
yeah. So how 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 can we uh, propose a model based on the idea of uh, tensor rank decomposition? So we first consider what is the tensor rank decomposition in the modeling stage. What's the population level meaning of that? Um, so so this is the simplest case of tensor decomposition, which is a rank one uh, probability tensor decomposition. So suppose you have uh, independent categorical uh, random variables u, v, w. Uh, their, their, their joint distribution is uh, fully characterized, characterized by this p, i, j, k tensor. That's u equal to i, v equal to j, and w equal to k. They are independent. Therefore, you can de decompose this into probability of u equal to i, probability of v equal to j, probability of w equal to k. And that becomes three vectors, u, i, v, j, w, k. So uh, collectively, you have this rank one decomposition. So the probability max function as a tensor, as a probability tensor, is decomposed into a rank one structure, which is the outer product of three vectors. So that simplifies things a lot, because on the left-hand side, how many parameters you have? Uh, you have uh, uh, this this would have a C1 by C2 by C3, the product of the Cs. On the right hand side, you have the sum. You have C1 as a vector, C2 and plus C3. So you decompose the product into sum, so you, you break the curse of dimensionality or the exponential growth of your, uh, of your parameters. Now, in this rank one problem, um, what, does it ha uh, what does it mean in, uh, in our problem is we, we just model it as a product, uh, auto product of uh, 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 marginal probability mass functions. And uh, uh, we can generalize that to rank R case. Uh, that becomes a summation, a weighted uh, sum of rank one tensors. So you have a, a rank one plus another rank one tensor plus another rank one tensor. And the number of those rank one structures is the rank in a rank decomposition. Uh, so this uh, r is the, uh, small r is the index, big r is the, is the rank. Uh, we also develop some, uh, we also derive some theory on the uh, possible upper bound on r on the different scenarios, uh, which I'm not going to show you today. Uh, but uh, given this rank r decomposition, what does it mean for statistical modeling? Yeah. Uh, so in the case of just two, Vectors, that's just like uh, SVDs. Exactly, platform. exactly. Right, but uh, I, I mean, we thought about this. Is there a general algorithm to do this decomposition into these three? Yeah, that's that's a that's an excellent question. So, 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 yeah, you are absolutely right. Uh, in matrix case, which is a two D tensor, uh, we have SVD, and you have all the nice properties about SVD and algorithm of about SVD. The challenge in tensor case is. As, uh, as soon as you move from 2D to 3D or higher order tensor, there is no uh, unique generalization of SVD. This is just one case of generalizing SVD to high order tensor, is uh, decomposing them into rank one sums. Uh, it's a direct generalization idea for SVD. That's why uh, it's been proposed almost 100 years ago, so 90, 97 years ago. And uh, 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 tensor train decomposition or Tucker decomposition are other examples of generalizing SVD from 2D to high order. Yeah. Oh, three minutes. Uh, so, so statistically speaking, this immediately gave you a latent variable model, seeing that <coughs> you have a latent unobservable variable Z that driven different states of independent uh, responses. So at each value of Z, you have a parameter theta, and then you have independent structures of y given x. And for different uh, r rank, you have different uh, lags of different states. Um, so we developed this and uh, run an algorithm uh, uh, to encounter large p problem. We also adding uh, additional sparsity constraint. So we're assuming some of the slices, some of the fibers are entirely zero, just to uh, improve the interoperability. That means some predictor are not useful. Uh, we have algorithm uh, which guarantee to converge, and uh, we have uh, uh, explicit updating formula, so it's uh, straightforward to implement. Uh, statistical error has been proven in this order. So our estimator minus the two parameter 
should be in this order, M is the number of the response, S is the sparsity level, so how many predictors are important, and log P is the logarithm of the number of predictor, N is the sample size. So it grows linearly in the number of response, not exponentially, and also grows as log of P, so we can allow the number of predictor to be much larger than our sample size. Um, so I'll take the next two minutes to briefly talk about tensor chain decomposition. Um, so another approach is we don't assume low rank uh, on the on the on the uh, probability tensor, but we just think about the most ambitious way of modeling the joint distribution. That will involve a p by c1 by cm coefficient tensor using the standard logistic regression model. And you can write down the likelihood, but it's intractable to solve. So it's uh, computationally intractable. Um, now, the way to do this is we, uh, we use the tensor train decomposition on the parameter B. Uh, the the t tensor train TT format of a tensor takes uh, uh, like this. Maybe some of you recognize it from your uh, 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 MPS uh, 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 study. So this will be G1 to G2 uh, to G of D, and the each uh, first three-way tensor and the next one will be connected through alpha one index, <coughs> and then alpha two will connect to the next one, and alpha D. So the, it's a linear connection. So you can write it alternatively as G1 of I1, G2 of I2 to GD of ID, multiplied together, the usual matrix multiplication. Uh, this has been, uh, as, as I mentioned, has been uh, first proposed in physics a long time ago, and then rediscovered and, uh, uh, in 20, 2009 in numerical analysis, and has been uh, very popular in, uh, in machine learning. Now, uh, the, the, this is a visualization of those products. Uh, when we model our co regression coefficient B, every element is the product of those smaller tensors. Instead of modeling a large tensor, now we break it down into the estimation and modeling of those uh, smaller tensors. Um, and uh, in terms of optimization, uh, we use a distance to set uh, penalty. Uh, so, so this will be the uh, uh, likelihood uh, negative log likelihood function. Uh, uh, without any constraint, that gives you the statistical automatity. But uh, we have those constraints to improve the uh, estimation in finite sample. So this is the penalty we use. And uh, uh, in a simple uh, simulation study, you can show that uh, we have a drastically improved accuracy in prediction over the separated and uh, aggregated approach. And uh, also, it's quite close to the oracle, which is using the true parameter of your model. Um, and the highland distance is also a, a, like a drastic improvement from the existing approach. All right, so um, finally, acknowledgement. Uh, we have some fundings for this ongoing work. Uh, and the uh, uh, main collaborator is uh, Aaron Mostad, who moved to Minnesota last year from UF. Uh, and his uh, PhD students still at UF now. Uh, also, I have a long term collaborator with Le Xing at Berkeley Biostat. Elizabeth Slade is a biostatistician at uh, FSU. Uh, my former student, Jing, uh, graduated and now an associate professor at uh, University of Science and Technology in China. Uh, my former student, Sun Ti, graduated now at uh, Washington University in St. Louis as a postdoc. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for. <laughs> so I'm trying to see if I perceive the connection that the statistics could make to quantum because of the probabilistic. Uh, again, I don't know the area at all. So do you think uh, that some new algorithms could come out from quantum algorithms from statistical? Work because like you have yeah. like growers and uh, short algorithms to have kind of trade marks of quality, right? Yes, yes. I I I, uh, I think one one thing people talking about uh, what statistics can do for quantum computing is about the uh, like how do you how do you know your algorithm is better? Okay, uh, if you have a quantum computer. Uh, and you want to demonstrate your advantage or your uh, supremacy, what is the, um, like, what's your confidence level? Uh, so that will be um, uh, something statistical hypothesis testing can tell you. 
Uh, and uh, uh, for me, I'm, I'm also very interested in like uh, how you incorporate statistical inference, uh, those basic ideas in uh, in training of the next generation of scientists. Uh, because I know quantum computing for general purpose is still a long way to go. Maybe for not for our generation, maybe the future generations of data science and scientists will be um, use that uh, more routinely and. Uh, 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 it will be beneficial if they learn some statistical inference uh, ideas. Yeah. All right, let's thank So we come to the last talk of quite a long day. Um, the talk will be given by Hibin Lee, who is currently at Foreign International University. Um, he's going to talk, well, you can see the title there, yeah. so go ahead. <coughs> Great, thank you for uh, the introduction. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I think in the morning, Philip joked about Florida being the desert of uh, Cupid. <laughs> That's the case, Miami probably would be the driest place in this desert. So I'm really happy to, to come here and uh, uh, to, to meet with uh, um, uh, everyone in, in, the, in the workshop. And uh, I see there are seeds in the, in the desert. Right? So, so there's, there's a future. So, um, um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, the research in, in my group uh, is mainly in the field of AMO physics. So we spend a lot of time developing uh, techniques and tools in ultra-fast spectroscopy and quantum optics, and then we use those tools to study metabody physics. Uh, first, in atomic systems, in atomic papers, as well as cold atom uh, clouds and uh, atom arrays recently. And then uh, we also uh, do some research on solid state systems, but uh, we, we, we basically focus on those so-called atom-like uh, solid state uh, systems. And my talk today will mainly focus on the atomic uh, systems. Uh, so before I go on, I'd like to uh, acknowledge people who are actually doing the work uh, in, in the lab, which is a group of uh, uh, postdoc and graduate students, as well as some undergraduate students, and of course the work wouldn't be possible uh, without the support from uh, funding agencies. Okay, so in these two days we heard a lot of really amazing efforts to develop and understand different platforms for, uh, for qubits. And uh, this, is not a, this is not a complete uh, list for, for all the possible uh, candidates, um, but the point is that uh, each approach has its own pros and cons. And, and I think uh, the future landscape for quantum computing uh, not necessarily is going to be just the one winner, but rather I think it's going to be a combination of different platforms for uh, different uh, applications. Now, uh, very interesting, uh, one, of the one of the best qubits is nature's qubit, neutral atoms, which intrinsically is a really good qubit by, by by many measures, right? But the problem is, it's very difficult to actually grab uh, individual atoms and start operating uh, on them. Now, uh, in recent years, in about recent five years, the AMO community developed this technique of trapping individual atoms by uh, object tweezers. So the idea is that you can have uh, individual atoms held by focused uh, laser beams, and then you can use either um, laser beams or microwave to operate on um, individual atoms or uh, globally on um, all the atoms. And then the results can be read out by using uh, fluorescence imaging. Now, this approach, um, surprisingly, it is, it is very easy to actually scale, which is counterintuitive. After all, you need a table full of optics to trap just a single atom. But, but what's interesting is that to, to trap hundreds of atoms or even thousands of atoms, the hardware overhead is exactly the same. You can use exactly the same set of hardware to trap one atom or trap hundreds or thousands of atoms. So, so in that sense, um, is the complexity is, is, uh, is relatively low if you scale up the, the system. And also, the whole entire system 
is operated um, at the room temperature without cryogenic cooling. Well, you still need a small vacuum chamber, which can be pumped just by an amp. And uh, also, there are no cables going into uh, each qubit, right? So instead of electrons to uh, operate the qubits, we use uh, photons to operate the, the qubits. And the atoms, uh, intrinsically, have, can, can give you high fidelity, uh, long coherence time, and uh, also, the atoms can actually interact with each other through rather strong and long range uh, double dipole interaction. Therefore, they can actually interact way beyond the nearest uh, neighbors. Therefore, you can actually, uh, uh, so in, in an atom system, um, we, the, 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 the platform based on neutral atoms um, already go beyond operation of single uh, qubit operations, even two qubit gate operations, but rather a, a larger system of multiple uh, qubits uh, enabled by the interaction uh, between them. Uh, therefore, in order to take advantage, the quantum advantage um, of parallel scaling and quantum interference, a, a, a future quantum computer uh, intrinsically is a coherent interacting uh, multi-body system. Then the question is, how do you experimentally um, uh, measure and benchmark, and how do you experimentally understand uh, a large uh, multi-body system? Now, multi-body physics, is not unique to quantum computing. It's actually quite an important topic in many different fields uh, in science, ranging from atomic physics all the way to biologic systems and even human society, right? So in, in, in all of these interacting multi-body systems, one important feature is that as you scale up, there are emerging uh, phenomena that cannot be really, uh, cannot be simply understand by, by simply scale up um, the behavior of, of, of non-interacting uh, individuals. Uh, so so it's, it's, a, it's a very important question going beyond just uh, formal information science. So what we hope to contribute is to uh, use this bottom-up approach, uh, starting with two atoms. Let's say we have two two-level atoms. Uh, they are uh, not being interacting independent. And in the two-atom picture, you can consider these two two-level atoms as a four-level system, where you have a ground state, where two atoms are in the ground state. You have singly excited state, one atom is excited, the other atom is not, but you don't know which one. And a doubly excited state, where both atoms are excited. Now, if you start introducing um, some inter interaction uh, between the atoms, then you will get some energy shifts, for both the singly excited states and, uh, and the doubly excited state, and, and the interaction also uh, affects the debasing rate uh, from here to here and here to here. And these are the, uh, the so-called DT states. Now, of course, you can extend this picture uh, to three atoms, or for that matter, uh, to, to n atoms. Now, this is the basis for entangling uh, multiple qubits, right? So this is how you actually construct uh, the so-called GHC, uh, entanglement and W uh, entangled states based on um, the DG states. Now also, uh, in order to understand the system, you also need to understand uh, what is the interaction, what is the range of the interaction, what is the transient dynamics of the interaction, how many atoms are actually involved in the interaction. So, so it's, it's a rather uh, interesting uh, problem to look at, uh, and, uh, and we need an experimental tool to look at. Now, uh, experimentally, an ideal experiment would be if you can uh, grab two atoms or a large number of atoms and arrange them in a very deterministic way. And now you have a tool to do measurement on them to extract whatever um, body properties you would like to study from the system. That would be ideal. And that actually wasn't possible uh, until very recently. And what we have before was basically an example of thermalized atoms in a vapor cell, right? So uh, with that, um, there were spectroscopy tools to study metabody interaction and correlation in those samples. For example, in the frequency domain, you can do selective reflection, or in the time domain, you can use quantum beating or transient boy mixing uh, technique to study metabody interactions in those samples. 
Now all of these measurements, they have one limitation that is they require really high density of atomic gas. Uh, to give you a perspective, here I plot uh, the atomic number density as a function of the temperature in both rubidium and, uh, and, uh, and potassium vapor cells. Right? So the techniques I just mentioned, they have limited uh, sensitivity. They can only work when the density is higher than 10 to the 15 uh, 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 atoms per cubic centimeter. However, in comparison, a cold atom cloud is about 10 to the 10, so there are still uh, at least five orders of magnitude uh, uh, gap. So the tool we use is something known as optical multidimensional coherent spectroscopy. And the idea of this technique is basically the same idea of multidimensional uh, spectroscopy in nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, instead, Instead of using RF pulses um, interacting with um, nuclear resonance, we use optic pulses, thermosecond laser pulses, to interact with electronic transitions. Uh, um, so, but it's basically an optic version of nuclear uh, magnetic resonance. And uh, this technique has been, has been pretty well developed in the past 30 years, and it has been used to study many different systems. There are just some examples of that. Uh, if you'd like to know uh, more about this technique and the applications in the field of physics, uh, we recently published a book on the topic, and uh, it has uh, way more details in that, in, in that. OK, so the basic idea of this technique is to use a sequence of femtosecond pulses to excite the sample and generate a nonlinear signal. And then we record the signal as a function of for example, two or three time delays. And this will be the signal uh, coming from a very simple two-level homogeneous system. Now, if you do a Fourier transfer of that, the magic happens. Now you have a very nice uh, starship peak on the diagonal. But this is a very simple system. It's a two-level system. Basically, what this means is that this two-level system absorbs energy um, at this frequency and emits energy at this frequency. So basically, it's a correlation uh, uh, spectrum. OK, so the way you, we implement this, uh, we have two different ways to implement this in our lab. Uh, one of the ways is to use the so-called collinear uh, setup. I'm not going to go through the details, but the basic idea is that we take a femtosecond laser pulse and split it into four pulses by using this listed McDander in, in, in the fronters. And, and, uh, and, and then we tag each pulse uh, with with a different frequency by using AOMs. And then we can demodulate the signal at the end by using multiple amplifier. So one advantage of, of using this uh, collinear geometry is that you can actually couple your, all of your four pulses into a high NLA uh, uh, micros, uh, uh, microscope objective. So then you can actually look at single atoms or single color centers uh, of, of your sample. And then by using delay stages, then you can control the, 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 the delay between the pulses. And that's how we do the experiment. Now we start with, uh, so there, there are different types of uh, 2D spectroscopy we can do. And the specific type I'm, I, I, well, we're, I'm talking about today is the so-called double quantum excitation. So the uh, so basic idea is that if you have a three-level system, a ground state, Singly excited state and double excited state. And then what we do is we use two pulses to excite a double quantum coherence, which is a quantum coherence between uh, state zero and state two. And this quantum coherence is going to oscillate at the double frequency of the single photon excitation. That's the name uh, double quantum uh, excitation. And then the third pulse converts the signal back into a single quantum. Uh, coherence, which then emits as a signal. Therefore, by detecting this signal at a single quantum frequency, we can uh, actually detect the uh, frequency at the double quantum coherence. And that will give you a spectrum uh, uh, like, like this, uh, where you have a peak at the, well, not exactly a diagonal line, but y is equal to 2x diagonal line, because this double quantum frequency is double the single quantum uh, uh, frequency. So we do this with potassium, uh, which is a very simple um, 
three level system. Basically, you have a ground state and two uh, excited states corresponding to the D1 and D2 lines. In the absorption spectrum, you will just see two resonances. Uh, what you can think of, these are two simple chromatic oscillators. Right? Uh, so now, if we do double quantum uh, 2D spectroscopy on this system, what you will see is that you will see signals uh, not only from uh, single atoms, but also you will see contribution from two atom states. That is, if you consider two potassium atoms um, correlated uh, states, for the two atom states, now you're gonna have three different energies because you have the combination between uh, D1 and D2. And that's exactly what we saw uh, in the 2D spectrum here, y-axis is the double quantum uh, frequency which corresponds to the frequency of the coherence between here and here. And then the x-axis is the emission frequency which corresponds to D1 and D2. And we saw three resonances in the double quantum uh, frequency axis which are corresponding to these uh, three possible energy states of two correlated atoms. So by doing this measurement, what we're looking at is, is that we detect two correlated um, uh, uh, atom uh, states. And also, um, our, uh, our theory uh, pointed out that the signal here requires the interaction uh, between the two atoms. Therefore, this is also a detection of the interaction, uh, that, which is double-double interaction between the two atoms. And uh, we could also do this for, for rubidium. And the difference in rubidium is that the double excited state includes not only the two atom states, but also a single atom state, which is a 5D state. Uh, therefore, in the spectrum, we have the, we have the signal that is corresponding to two atom correlated states, but we also have signal corresponding to just a single atom 5D states, which sometimes is convenient because we understand those single atom signal pretty well. Therefore, we can use that as a reference uh, to analyze how, this, how, the, how the strengths of the uh, two atom uh, signal scales uh, with different experimental conditions. We could also go higher um, in, the, in, in, uh, in the atomic level matter uh, if we, for example, start, start not from the uh, S state but from P state, then we will be able to excite the transition between P and D, and uh, that will, in the two atom picture, that will give you uh, two atoms in the D state. And uh, we did that experiment, and uh, we, we, are, we can see the signal that's coming out from the two correlated atoms in, in the D state. Okay, so that's uh, for two atoms, so two atom correlated states. Now what about three atoms? Can you see three atom uh, correlated states? In order to see that, uh, back to uh, potassium, uh, with three atoms, then with D1 and D2 transitions, then you now have uh, four different possible um, energies uh, with three atoms. And in order to see that, what you need to do is to do a higher order excitation, which requires just more pulses. Okay? Now, fortunately, in the experiment, uh, we have a trick. Uh, that is, you can always consider one pulse as two pulses with zero time delay. If we don't need to vary the time delay between these two pulses, we can always consider one pulse as two pulses. Therefore, we can actually simplify the experiment and, and, uh, and use only four pulses to do a higher order um, um, a nonlinear um, uh, experiment. But of course, when you detect the signal, you have to demodulate the signal at the right frequency to just select out this type of uh, the, signal. Is, are those transitions overlapping with the, the, the two? When, 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 they, when they come out, when they come out? Well, the, the pulse where you were uh, considering two pulses with a, with no time delay, mm -hmm. are they exciting two transitions at the same frequency, or is there some bandwidth for the? No, they, these are uh, femtosecond lasers, so, so it's a very bad rock band. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So uh, if we do that experiment, what we saw was uh, the so-called three quantum uh, to the spectrum, where you now see 
uh, four energy states in the y-axis which are corresponding to the four uh, uh, possible energies with three atom states. And then uh, my, after my student showed me this, then the next question I would ask is, can you try four? Can you try four atoms in a higher order? So a week later, he came back with, with uh, the results from uh, four atoms. Four atoms, now you can see uh, five energy states, right? And then you can keep uh, doing higher and higher order um, than in your experiments. Then you can try five atoms, six, and then seven and eight. Okay, and then we kind of stop there and there we started running into technical issues beyond eight. It, it gets quite noisy with eight atoms. But we, what we saw here is that by doing these high um, uh, nonlinear experiments with multiple pulses, we can very specifically select inside and then detect <coughs> multi-atom coherence uh, with a specific number of atoms. Uh, in, in the process. Now, that becomes really useful. For example, one thing that I can do is to characterize the, the coherence time uh, for the two atom state all the way to uh, seven atom or eight atom state. Now, of course, this is a very simple system. When we do that, we just get a linear dependence. But, but this just shows that you can actually use this technique to benchmark your multi-qubit system without doing uh, uh, quantum state tomography, okay? Right, that was actually done in the, in the atomic paper cell. Then uh, what we would like to do next, okay, we would like to do it in the, uh, in, in, in actually in an atom array, but we don't want to jump that step too far. So, so the next thing we try is to try it uh, in a cold atom cloud. Yes. Sorry to stop yeah. here. So in the, in the, in the cold atom, in the previous experiment, it's an ensemble, and so mm -hmm. when you see these coherences, it, it's many, many sets of seven atoms or eight atoms, or is that there? Yeah, so, so the, the previous experiment, uh, experiment is, is, a, is a thermalized atomic gas is an ensemble. You actually, you have all these linear processes going on in the system. But what we did was, was that we actually post-processing the signal, only select out the signal we want to see. Uh, that, that was the trick. Of course, then there's a problem with that because you can't really use that to do any useful quantum computing because it's not deterministic, right? So, um, so, so that's why ultimately what we want to do is to do that in an atom array. Uh, but, but, but before we go that, the next thing we tried out is can we actually do this with, uh, with a cold atom cloud, uh, which is prepared in a mod, uh, and uh, and uh, which can give you a temperature about um, uh, 200, 100 microkelvins with, uh, with a density of 10 to the 10 with about 1 million atoms in, in the cloud. Now, the first question we, we asked ourselves was, is there enough sensitivity to do that? We don't just want to build a cold atom, cold atom setup and just to find out, okay, so it's not sensitive enough. We couldn't do anything. So what do we try before we um, uh, start doing, start setting up the cold atom was that, okay, so why don't we take a vapor and lower the temperature to the room temperature, okay, so this is in C, uh, and see if we can still get a signal with 2D spectroscopy. And, uh, and we did that, and we found out, even at the room temperature, uh, which corresponds to a really low atomic density, even lower than the cold atom um, uh, density, we, we can still get a fairly good signal. So, um, so now, one interesting uh, side story about this is if, if you calculate the mean atomic distance based on the density, you will find out at this density, the mean atomic <coughs> distance is about 16 micrometers or 300,000 Bohr radii, uh, which, is, which is incredible at this really long distance. Uh, we can still detect a dipole dipole interaction uh, between uh, two, two atoms. That shows how sensitive this technique is. So, with that, we were very confident uh, that we will get a signal from the cold atom. Therefore, we build a cold atom setup. We combine the uh, 2D spectroscopy setup with the cold atom, and we did some initial measurements. This is just a, 
to show you, okay, we actually got the data, uh, uh, and that was published uh, now about two years ago. Okay, so what's next? What's next, uh, what we're doing right now is that we have a cold atom cloud, okay? So that will give you a bunch of cold atoms. Now what we're gonna do is that we're gonna, uh, so we, we actually form an optical tracer, and the way you, you do this is to send a CW laser to uh, acoustical optic modulator. And then uh, ALM is gonna deflect your beam <coughs> If you, if you send in one uh, RF frequency. And now you can actually send in 10 different tones of the RF frequency, therefore you're gonna get uh, 10 beams. Or if you send in uh, 100 frequencies, then you, you're gonna get 10 beams, uh, 100 beams. Therefore you're gonna have 100 traps. And then you can put that LM in the, in, the, in the other direction, then now you can actually make a two-dimensional array of pattern. Of, uh, of atoms, right? So now we build that, and now you can couple your 2D, uh, 2D setup with that, and uh, our plan is to do 2D spectroscopy on this uh, array of atoms. Okay, so uh, I'm almost done, and uh, just to point out, uh, this technique of 2D spectroscopy uh, in studying uh, mid-body interaction and correlation can also be used for other systems. For example, we are also looking at an array of point dots, which, uh, which in this case, this is, uh, this is a two material uh, model layer uh, deposit um, nanopeters, which gives you an array of point dots. And uh, in another case, uh, we actually made a sample uh, with Sandia where, uh, where they can use ion beam to implant exactly one color center at a precise location. Uh, I think you asked that in the, in the morning, and yes, they have the capability to do that, and that can be proven uh, with its G2 measurement uh, of, of all of these dots. And uh, we, we, we fabricated a sample like that. We hope to look at the um, uh, interactions between the color centers, which is actually a very important uh, problem for, for, for color centers by, by using our spectroscopy tool. And uh, with that, just uh, uh, to conclude, uh, we have this uh, 2D spectroscopy uh, technique that is really sensitive to um, really weak dipole-dipole interaction or any other type of interaction. It also gives you uh, access to metabolic correlation and coherence in, in the system, and uh, we can use this uh, technique for cold atoms, and ultimately we hope for uh, atom arrays, and, uh, and this technique can be used for other metabolic uh, systems as well, and, uh, and this is what we plan to do in the future, and uh, with that, uh, thank you for your attention, I'm open for questions. Of, of the measurement depends on how long you can scan the delay. It's basically the inverse of the time delay. Uh, though of course, practically, if your delay stage is 15 centimeters, then you can scan for one nanoseconds. Uh, therefore, your resolution is one years. Uh, but, but there's another technique which uses uh, uh, femtosecond frequency poems. Uh, that will give you a much bigger uh, frequency if that's needed. So is the ultimate goal to go to single atoms in individual traps? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that the aim? Okay, so, so there, are, there are two things in my research, right? So there's fundamental research of understanding many body physics. Yeah. So for that goal, what we, what we would like to do is, okay, so I take one atom and measure something and take two atoms and measure something, measure the same thing. And then scale up the number of atoms and see what changes, how, how, how things actually scale with the number of atoms, but also with the distance between them, but also with the geometry. So if you, if you take three atoms and align them in a line, 
comparing the line the you know, triangle, some things are different. So that's one thing we'd like to do. Um, and, and hopefully, some of these will turn out to be useful for building a qubit system. My question, you know, I have heard a lot from the community saying that really their outcomes is perhaps the future. I have heard it, particularly because of the work of Mihail Bukin at Congress, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I have not followed very carefully. I'm not a reader of atomic physics. Mm -hmm. but from your work, it seems to be that scaling up the number of atoms gets complicated. So does it contradict with what Mihail Bukin is saying? Because it seems to be I mean, how easy is it to create tens or hundreds of atomic qubits with your optical tweezers? I guess that's my question. Okay, it's not time particular yet. In fact, in, in <coughs> Lukin's group, they have already created a large array of uh, about 10,000 atoms. Right. And, uh, and the, the role of Rindberg interaction is to introduce long range uh, interaction between the atoms. Okay, so 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 far we haven't we haven't introduced the Rinpoche interaction. So the interaction I'm looking at is a much weaker double-double interaction from S to P or or P to E uh, transition. I think so. If you simply use the Rinpoche interaction, which is quite strong, so so what are what are you going to have is that okay. So what do you really want to do is to is to is to simulate a Hamilton with a bunch of qubits, but also with, with interaction between the qubits. Now, if you want to simulate a really complicated Hamiltonian, then the inter inter interaction strength could be needs to, needs to be different. You cannot just simply use one type of interaction because then your Hamiltonian will be really simple, right? So, so, so this is where I think uh, uh, we can contribute is to, okay, so you have this really strong Rinpoche interaction, but we also have a little bit weaker uh, double type interaction. And in fact, you can actually engineer what type of interaction you could have by exciting them into different states. And uh, then with all that, then you can actually construct a fairly uh, um, uh, complicated Hamiltonian to simulate something. I guess my next question. Mm -hmm. so how far are we from really making this gold out in space qubits? It seems like the machine is very close, but mm -hmm. how the why the community is still so focused on superconducting qubits relative to this? What is the complication? Is the, is the precisely the interaction between the atoms mm -hmm. that we don't have control? Do mm -hmm. we have control of that? Mm -hmm. Well I think I think by by far the superconducting based system is the most advanced quantum computing system. It's the most mature one. But I, 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 I think uh, neutral atom based is, is only entering this field in the past really five years. Uh, but, but, but we did a lot of, uh, we had a lot of development in this field already. For example, um, there's at least five uh, startup companies working uh, on this technology. One of them is known as uh, atom computing, and they <coughs> have built a really large system with thousands of uh, atoms in there. And, uh, and they, they're not using uh, rubidium atoms, they're using um, uh, strontium, I think it's strontium, uh, which has a much longer uh, uh, coherence time up to uh, seconds. <coughs> and uh, I think we're probably catching up. Uh, um, but, 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 you know, it's, it's a very compli complicated system, and uh, and uh, I think superconducting based system is so far ahead. <laughs> we are trying to catch up. Yes. Yeah, now your question. I wonder why you guys operate this uh, this optical tweezer thing in room temperature. I mean, I, I would naively imagine the, the environment would just generate a lot of uh, you know radiation background, which can probably cause decoherence and those kind of things, and then limit your coherence time. Yeah. Why couldn't you just uh, put this in crisis? You are absolutely right. Uh, and in fact, um, Cindy Rigo Group at Jiva is trying to do that. They're putting the whole entire um, um, cold atom setup in a, in a cryogenic system. 
but it's not just simply, it's, it's actually quite hard for us to do that. Because <laughs> we don't know how to work with grand stats. So, so essentially, there are some op uh, engineering opportunities, yeah. project yeah. engineering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely a way to go. I have probably a really naive question here, but presumably the type of quantum system that you would, the kind of problems you would solve with this kind of system, is it, it's a little bit different from what you would do with superconducting qubits, or, or because, I mean, how do you control pairwise interactions in these large arrays? I mean, supposing you want to entangle this qubit here with with this one here, how, how do you do that? Okay, so, so there are there are quantum computer and quantum simulator. Right, that's what right. I'm thinking. So this okay. is a simulator, right? Yes, you can you can actually do quantum simulator with or this. Quantum annealer or something. Exactly. Yeah. But you, I think you could also realize a universal quantum computer based on this. So, so one thing you could do with all the pieces is that you can actually, for example, you can actually entangle two qubits, and then you can actually move them around with the pieces. While, while you prepare, after you prepare the, the qubits, and move them, move them to to a different location. So is this just by some very sophisticated frequency control of the acoustic optics? Yeah, you just the you just change the frequency of your um, of your ALN, mm -hmm. then you are moving them in. So so basically, all of these qubits can be reorganized in a way to form a so, sort of a like quantum circuit. And then you can use that to do uh, more complicated uh, quantum computing tasks. And the time scales for moving them around? I mean, is it a bit like the iron traps where they're going around in circles and, and, and very similar? <laughs> <laughs> so very similar? The, well, the, the, if you want to move the atoms, yeah. it's slow. Yeah. It's, it's not going to Yeah, but, but at the same time, I mean, the, what I've seen with the iron traps is even though it might be slow, the fidelity is really high because the coherence is so good. Right? Mm -hmm. So far, neutral atoms is not as good as ion traps. Okay. That's in terms of coherence? The fidelity. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The trap yeah. ions give you the, the yeah, highest. Right back. Uh, can you comment on like how you do like the quantum state tomography of, uh, of, of these uh, many body states? Okay. Eventually, if you want to figure everything out, eventually you need to do a quantum state tomography. So, so, so what I'm trying to say is that if you just want to quickly characterize some properties of your metabolic system, um, maybe it's not the best way to do uh, to do a full um, uh, quantum state tomography because that that's that's sometimes that's not even possible, right? So, so you you need to measure some ensemble properties to figure out. Okay, so do you do you have a good coherence or not? Okay, I think we're almost right on time, and uh, let's thank uh, Evan again. <laughs>